You have found yourself on the bizarre side of YouTube, where reality meets fiction, where your stories are read back to you in a dramatic fashion, where I get to pretend to be a voice actor. This is Comic Story, and we take the time to make you a comic book expert by filling you in on the big moments happening within the world of comics. We do cut out some of the B-plots, limit our panel usage, and by doing so, we prevent copyright problems. And this allows you to have something to put into your collection if you choose to by running to your local comic book store, which is what I recommend. If you love comic books, start a collection. Go out there and get yourself some manga or comics or graphic novels. Or you can use one of our sponsors, Shortbox. Click the link down below to learn how you can win a graded comic book yourself or discover the world of collectible comic books. Now, this series began in 2016 and ran for about 50-something issues. Originally, our channel had it broken up into two sagas, the Deathstroke saga and the ending. And I thought that since many of you have a hard time digging through our channel to find all of the continuation parts, you might enjoy just a three and a half, four hour video called Teen Titans Rebirth covering the full thing. This series lasted about four years and runs right up to the current Robin run, so I hope you guys enjoy. Now with the Titans Tower built, Damien looks to the future to see where this new group of teen superheroes will go. As Damien watches the sea from the Titans Tower, he listens to the news reports on the escape of over 50 prisoners who broke out of maximum security prison facilities and have yet to be found. However, in other news, shark attacks are up. Suddenly a pelican swoops in squawking, and then Engar transforms telling him that if he didn't know, that was pelican for it's time for lunch. Damien tells him that sneaking up on him could lead to deadly consequences, so he may want to rethink think before doing that again. Gar asks, what is he doing here anyway? Coming up with a master plan for toilet papering the Justice League Tower? And Damien tells him that he's just playing. Before Gar can even finish asking playing what, Goliath shoots out of the water, dropping a large stick, and he begins to lick Gar. As the two head back inside, Gar asks, why does he keep that obnoxious bat wookie thing around? To which Damien asks, where does this costume go when he transforms? Both excellent questions, Gar responds. Once inside, Gar serves up his mouth-watering platter of tofu for lunch. And Wally says that life is not worth living without double bacon cheeseburgers. Gar changes into a cow, telling him that that's like cannibalism, dude. And Raven asks Wally if he can do that thing. And in seconds, Wally runs out, and then he comes back with pizzas, shouting that Central City's finest pies are here. There's even a veggie one for Gar. And just as everyone sits down to eat, the security alarms begin to go off, and the island begins to go into full combat mode. Everyone runs outside, and just then, Damien shouts, Titans go? And that's when he sees the reporter from the news telling him that Mr. Logan said to be here for an interview at 1 o'clock. Gar shrugs, stating, Oopsie, kind of forgot to tell you guys about that one. <laughs> And while Gar goes to show the reporter around the base, over in New Mexico, Jackson Hyde plays with the water from his fish tank as his mother yells at him. She storms into his room asking how many times does she have to tell him he can't do that, not even with the door closed and the blind shut. He was already born with marks on his arms that people think are tattoos. Now he's bleaching his hair. So why does he try so hard to be different? As Jackson holds up a ball of water with fish in it, he says that he's not trying, he is different. Back over at Titan's Tower, Gar's interview is about to finish when suddenly the reporter is grabbed and pulled underwater. Later that night in New Mexico, Jackson sits out with his boyfriend telling him that he really should just tell his father the truth about them so that they can stop trying to hide like this. Kenny says that it's not really that simple. His dad is one of the good old boys. Big belt buckle and American flag bumper sticker. Jackson then wraps his arm around Kenny telling him, look, there's a video that went viral about the Teen Titans. He can't stop imagining what it must be like for them living on their own, no one telling them how to live their lives. He opens up a water bottle, saying that he wants to show him something. Just like when they first got together and he would sing a country song for him. Just stay for this. The markings on Jackson's arms begin to glow, and the water flows from the bottle and swirls around Kenny, who begins to scream. He smacks the bottle, telling him to stop. What the hell is this? And Jackson tells him that it's okay. He's just like the Teen Titans. And Kenny walks away, telling him that he's had enough of this hiding. It's time for them to go their separate ways. So with that, Jackson packed up his belongings and headed off to San Francisco to tell himself that he needs to understand who he is. He needs to stop hiding himself away. And he needs to start where there are new beginnings, where he may belong. 
Meanwhile, back with the Titans, Gar asks, how does he look in his otter form? And Damien says that he looks like bait. Gar then says that he deserves that. He was the one who brought the reporter into their base, and she disappeared on his watch. Raven reports that she's not picked up anything, and Starfire says that she circled the Bay Area twice and found nothing. Damien tells everyone to just keep an eye out, and Gar heads back into the water to look around. Just as he looks down towards the sea floor, he sees a giant thing swimming by fast. Gar changes into a fish, and he jumps out of the water, shouting, guys, I think we're gonna need a bigger boat! And that's when King Shark jumps out of the water, destroying Damien's Titan boat. While King Shark makes his way towards everyone, Damien shouts that this guy is a killing machine, but this is what they were trained for. Begin Maneuver X! Wally then asks, which one is that? The one where I run in circles making a whirlpool, or the one where I twirl my arms to make a cyclone? Raven tells him that it doesn't take a mind reader to sense that Damien is going to be so mad. King Shark punches Damien, and Starfire catches him, and he shouts that she wasn't supposed to be there, she was supposed to be over there. Didn't anyone study the playbook that he gave him? King Shark then escapes back into the waters and swims comes over to his hideout underneath Alcatraz. Once inside, he tells the escaped prisoners that he's gotten the attention of the so-called heroes. With the reporter's help, soon they will have the attention of all of the air breathers. So let the feeding frenzy begin. Back at the Titan's Tower, Damien begins to prepare for the next battle when a voice calls out, Ahem, yeah, hi. Everyone turns back to see Jackson, and Damien runs over asking how did he get past their security? He should have been shocked, missiled, trapdoored at least a dozen times. Jackson points at Goliath, stating, Actually, the big furry thing let me in. Before Damien can even yell at Goliath, Jackson tells him not to be mad at him, he just didn't know where else to go. His name is Jackson Hyde, and he was kinda hoping that they could help him figure out a few things. So he came for an audition? Damien walks past him, telling him, not a chance. And Jackson says that he can speak with water, he can move it with his mind, and, and Damien stops him asking, and what, squirt gun? You wanna come play in our clubhouse? He goes on saying that this team will be the ground version of the Watchtower team. Everyone has been recruited for a specific reason, so bottom line is, he wouldn't fit in. Jackson begins to head out, saying that if he doesn't belong here, he won't belong anywhere. While everyone says that that was a bit harsh of him, Damien tells everyone that he's pinpointed King Shark's base, so they gotta go. Suddenly the monitors change and everyone sees the reporter from before announcing that she is broadcasting from the Alcatraz Island with an exclusive interview with, but King Shark interrupts her shouting, King Shark, and I have a message for everyone. The air breathers damned these prisoners in their previous life, so it is I who has given them a second chance. My soldiers are more evolved, outfitted with gills, claws, and teeth. And within moments, Gar bursts through the prison walls. While everyone follows Gar in, he shouts, Newsflash, we're here to kick your butt. Everyone quickly begins to fight off the shark prisoners, while Starfire tells the human prisoners that she believes the human expression for this is, run for your lives. Wally begins to run with Raven on his back, and as he passes by some people, Raven touches and starts to teleport people away. King Shark begins to run back outside, and as he leaps into the water, Damien throws a battering at him and pulls him back in. King Shark grabs the wire around him, flinging Damien over to him, and he grabs him, telling him that he got himself a minnow. But before King Shark can sink his teeth into Damien, water begins to rise and knock the two of them down. And Jackson asks if he really just did that. Damien shouts for him to get away. He's just going to get himself killed. But with the wire still wrapped around King Shark, he jumps into the water, pulling Damien with him. Just as King Shark gets to the depths that would crush a normal human bone, Jackson swims down with a watery blade, thinking, yeah, I could die, but it's time to use this power for good. Jackson slashes away at King Shark's chest, and he quickly grabs Damien, swimming back up. However, there's one thing that Jackson needed. Air! He quickly gasps, but rather than drowning in water, he breathes it. As Jackson rides the water, carrying Damien out, he tells himself, yeah, this is where I belong. Later that night in the Titan's Tower, Damien calls out to Jackson, telling him that they need to talk. Jackson says, yeah, he knows, he sucks, and he should just go home, right? And Damien says that now that the shark mutants have been rounded up and sent to Star Labs for questions, they couldn't find King Shark. So he's come here to give him this, and he tosses him a box. Jackson pulls out a uniform, and Damien says that he was working on a Hydra suit for himself, so it might be a little tight. Jackson asks if this means that he can stay with the Teen Titans, and Damien tells him that it's just a costume, so don't get too comfortable. Meanwhile, back over at the Nemo outpost, Blackjack asks King Shark if he really thought it would be wise to broadcast himself like that. But as they talk, a voice interrupts them and asks King Shark to tell him more about this boy, the one who speaks to water. King Shark looks over at the voice and tells him that he thought he was dead, and Black Manta steps out telling him, I want to hear everything about him. In the center of the city, Ravager has defeated all of the Titans and has pinned Robin to the ground. 
Donna yells out that Ravager is so fast he's unstoppable, and he sneers, telling her, That's right, I've made me faster, stronger! Now nothing can stop the Ravager! I'm practically invincible! But as he's gloating, he reels back in pain, and the Titans watch him hit the ground. Omen yells out that it's his heart, his heart is failing, and as he dies, there on the streets, Deathstroke comes running out of the woodwork, calling out for Grant. He runs over to Ravager, holding him in his arms, asking, What did you do? And Ravager looks at Deathstroke. Deathstroke, did I get them? Did I kill the Titans? And as he dies, Deathstroke holds him close. Yes, you got them all. He picks up his son in his arms and he tells the Titans, My son died here because of you, and someday soon, you'll all pay for that. Which now brings us to the current day with Deathstroke waking up out of costume from a surgery in which his eyesight was restored. That's the recent storyline for Deathstroke. He was rendered blind and now that's been resolved. Wintergreen tells him that his daughter Rose is in stable condition and Jericho is in rehab. But Grant is still dead. Deathstroke looks at Wintergreen and he tells him, You kept calling out Grant in your sleep. Meanwhile, Wally and the Titans are fighting against an enemy when Wally finds himself out of place and out of time. He has no idea where he is, and someone calls out, What's your name? Wally tells him, I'm Wally West and I'm the fastest man alive. But he quickly wonders why he answered whatever that voice was. The voice tells him to keep running. And while he tries to argue, he's shocked by a device on his wrists and ankles. Wally continues to run asking, Who are you? How did you swipe me in broad daylight with the Titans around? And the voice continues, 300 miles per hour. Wally thinks about it. I know that voice. It's Deathstroke. He kidnapped me. And Deathstroke asks him, Tell me about the Titans. Wally continues, The Titans were formed in secret to prove to our mentors that STOP MAKING ME DO THAT! And Deathstroke tells him, 500 miles an hour. You vanished. Where have you been? Abracadabra threw me into the time stream, but you came back. I escaped from it. The Flash pulled me out, but I remember a different world. That's how I know you. Something or someone has changed history. Who? I don't know! I don't know! Halt treadmill. Wally West, I have a deal for you. You were there when the Ravager died. Yeah, that was years ago. The Titans killed my son. It wasn't us, Deathstroke. Hive's powers are too much for him. His heart couldn't take it. I tried to save him, I tried, but I wasn't fast enough. Slade turns his head as he remembers the scene. Wally is strapped into another machine as he asks him. Speed bends time. You and the other Flashes can time travel, right? Yes, but we won't because... But it's too late. Slade turns on the machine and Wally begins to vibrate uncontrollably. Slade, stop! Don't do it! I lost everything when I returned and I struggle with the idea that I can go back and fix it. But I don't, because you have to keep moving forward! Wally shouts as he breaks out of the machine, tackling Deathstroke. Slade ducks and dodges as Wally moves super fast trying to get him. But when he finally pins Deathstroke to a wall, Deathstroke offers him a proposal. Wally, help me bring my son back and I will stop being Deathstroke forever. No more costume. No more contracts. No more killing. Save one life, and you save thousands. Wally's eyes go wide as he considers the offer, but then he turns away. I'm sorry, Slade. I can't do that. Slade pushes a button. I figured. That's why I have a backup plan. And behind the wall is the younger Wally West that was created in this new timeline. And he yells at the original Wally. Your name's Wally West? How can you be Wally West when I'm Wally West? Now to attempt to keep things from getting confusing, we're going to refer to the original Wally West as Flash from this point on. The new Wally West will be Wally West. And for a short version of why there are two Wally Wests, well, one was introduced as a replacement during the New 52, but the original Wally West was recently brought back in the DC Rebirth. They're actually making this a plot point in DC Rebirth, as you can see. But if you're interested in his return, I will link DC Rebirth down below. Flash turns to Wally. Do not trust this man, he's Deathstroke. And Deathstroke responds by shocking Flash and knocking him out. He then removes his helmet, telling Wally that together they can fix what's broken. He just has to trust him. This is all to bring back his son and stop the villain known as Deathstroke. Let him be slayed with his son Grant. And Wally, not knowing the horror that is Deathstroke, as he is a new superhero on the scene, begins to consider it. Meanwhile, back at the Titan headquarters, their screen pops on, and Damien tells the Titans to meet the Teen Titans on the roof. Both of them are missing a speedster, and they need to figure this out. Both teams arrive to the rooftop, and Damien turns to Nightwing. You're a traitor! Since this isn't a smart way to begin a discussion, Donna grabs Damien, and both teams get ready to defend their own. But as Nightwing holds his hand up, Robin's right. I made a deal with Deathstroke. Let's not fight. I promise I'll explain it later, but first we need to figure this out. If Deathstroke has both of our speedsters, time is the key. Back with Deathstroke, he asks Wally to run with him. Allow him to show him his history. He brings Wally to the hospital bed that Rose, his daughter, is in. To the rehab center that his son Joseph is in. And to the grave of his son Grant. He explains that it started with Grant, but if they can save Grant, they can save Slade's family. And if Wally agrees to help, it'll end Deathstroke forever. But Deathstroke informs him, You already did when you ran with me, Wally. 
You've already helped me. Meanwhile, the Teen Titans and the Titans move forward because of a tracker that Damien placed onto Wally. The Teen Titans were a little weirded out to discover that Damien has trackers in all of them, but it apparently has now paid off. As they enter the hideout, they find the Flash unconscious, and they wake him up. As he wakes up, he shouts, We have no time! We have to stop Slade! And that's when Slade runs into the room with a coca goom He informs them as he stands in front of a defeated Wally that the Speed Force is now coursing through his icon suit. I have all the time in the world. Slade Wilson, a.k.a. Deathstroke now has Speed Force based powers by draining Wally West of his powers with the Icon suit when Wally ran with him. Slade runs off with a goom and Flash gives a chase. Leave me alone Flash, I mean you no harm, the deal is still in place. Deal, what are you talking about? As they get faster and faster, Slade explains that he stored the energy of Wally West to give him this speed. And as for the deal, well he made that with someone else. A long time ago, Dick Grayson rode up to where Deathstroke was and he was shot up by an onslaught of rubber bullets. Deathstroke had just learned that he had a daughter named Rose, and he knew that she would need care and training, so he made an arrangement with Dick Grayson. If Dick Grayson and the Titans could train Rose to have the morale and the values of a hero, he wouldn't kill any of them. The Titans would be off the table. Deathstroke and Flash run at increasing speeds through the snow-filled plains until Deathstroke stops with a WOOM! Your speed is your singular advantage, Flash. And when facing someone as fast as you, the playing field is leveled. Deathstroke is ready to draw his sword. Here, in bullet time, we're the same. Two men about to fight it out. I'm a trained killer, but what are you if you aren't the fastest man alive, Flash? Leave me to what I want to do. Flash thinks about it, and he runs away. As Deathstroke watches him, he comments, Yeah, I thought so. The Titans and the Teen Titans are trying to figure out what to do while Damien lays into Wally about giving his powers to a killer. Meanwhile, Flash has a plan and he runs to Jericho, the other son of Deathstroke, to ask for help. Jericho has an odd assortment of powers, from telepathy to being able to control others. But after asking him why Slade is trying to do this, Jericho explains that Slade will never accept the death of Grant. Nightwing then calls up the Flash, telling him that they have a plan and everyone needs to meet at the site of Grant's death. So Flash brings Jericho along for the ride. Elsewhere in the time stream, Grant is running, trying to get ready to fight the Titans when Deathstroke appears in front of him, and he takes his mask off, hugging his son. Finally, and at last. But once Grant realizes that Slade is his hero, Deathstroke, he freaks out. Slade was a horrible father who treated his kids like dirt to make them manly men. Slade tries to talk him out of his actions, telling him that they do not need to fight, they can become a family again. And Grant yells at him that he'll prove his worth! He has the powers now gifted to him by Hive! He'll defeat the Titans! And Slade knocks him out. Just because he wants to be a dad again doesn't mean that he suddenly gained patience. Crap, this didn't go any better than my first two attempts at correcting the timeline. I'll just go farther back into the timeline and fix this even earlier. And quack a goom He runs off again. Back in the current day, the Teen Titans and the Titans are now arriving at the location that Grant died. And with that, Flash and Jericho arrive. Jericho explains that he is Grant Wilson's brother. He is Slade Wilson's other son. And Nightwing asks Flash the status on Deathstroke, and Jericho chimes in, informing them all that Slade is currently in the time stream trying to alter things. Meanwhile, with all of the confusion going on and Damien being rather pissed off that Wally let Deathstroke gain Speed Force powers, Wally was left behind, and Jackson Hyde, Aqualad, was just forgotten about. Wally tries to call up Barry to get him involved and ask for help, but he ends up just getting his voicemail. He stands there defeated, having given up his powers and possibly doomed the entire universe to a trained assassin running through the time stream, and Jackson Hyde blocks the water from raining on him before apologizing for being chatty. This is his first universal crisis. Back with the teams, using the powers of the Flash and Jericho, they begin to link everyone together and they create a time vortex, running through time hoping to warn their younger selves of the conflict and not alter things too heavily. As the lightning of the speed force and time travel course through the sky, the Titans and the Teen Titans meet the original Teen Titans, the younger versions of the Titans. Nightwing warns their younger selves that they are friends and they are trying to stop a killer, but this original team doesn't know about Deathstroke yet, and that's when Damien steps forward. He pushes Nightwing aside, asking the original Robin where Ravager went. They need to find him first. Robin tells him that Ravager vanished and they were about to give chase. Damien tells him, we'll help. And then he slaps the original Kid Flash in the chest, stopping his heart! Flash of the current day begins to see himself fading out of existence as his younger self is dying. But Flash of the future realizes exactly what Damien is doing. He just cut off the Speed Force connection to Wally West and the new Wally West, which in turn cuts off Deathstroke's connection to the Speed Force. Damien starts to hurl flashbangs at the original Titans to get them off of the case, explaining that the Stone Palm technique will stop Wally West's heart temporarily. And at that moment, as Slade is once again trying 
trying to convince Grant to give up his powers, the time stream begins to fade before his eyes, and he slips back into the Speed Force yelling, No! NO! Back with all of the Titans and the Teen Titans, Robin of the original team runs over and starts the original Kid Flash's heart back up, which jumpstarts the time stream and the Speed Force, restoring Wally West's powers in the current day and age. He instantly suits back up and crack a goom! He runs off, which leaves Jackson Hyde wondering if Wally West is coming back for him or if he was just forgotten about again. The time vortex begins to fade and the Titans and the Teen Titans begin to fade back into the present day. And that's when they see Deathstroke with speedster powers standing on top of some cars telling them, you are dead. You took my son again. Beast Boy sees his powers and he asks Damien, I thought you said you cut the cord to the Speed Force. And Nightwing tells him he did. But somehow Slade is now tapping directly into the Speed Force. He doesn't need the Flash's powers anymore. Deathstroke looks at him. Yes, I'm tapping directly into it and I have the power to wipe you all out of existence. But first, I'm gonna go save my son. And crack a goom! He runs off again. Jericho falls in behind him. Pop, you have to stop this. This is crazy. And Slade ignores him. I can feel it. The power that the speedsters tap directly into. It's like nothing that I've ever felt before. Jericho tries to warn him. Pop, you're approaching light speed. But it's too late. Deathstroke is running faster than Jericho can keep up with as he shouts, I will save Grant! crack a -goom! Back at the current timeline, Flash tells everyone that it's over. Deathstroke has entered the speed force, and when you enter it, there's no returning. It's the afterlife for a speedster. Everyone agrees that it is technically a win, but that's when Wally West runs over asking how they can call themselves a hero if they are going to let someone die. The argument begins. Deathstroke is a killer, and with super speed, he is a threat to the entire universe. He's not dead, but he's trapped, and it's better than he deserves. But Wally asks, what do we deserve when we behave like him? He runs off into the Speed Force to save Deathstroke. Flash yells for him to stop, telling everyone that he doesn't understand. Once he goes in, he won't know how to get out of the Speed Force. Nightwing stops Flash, though. Don't chase him. We lost you before. We have to make sure that you can get out. We're gonna build you a rope. Lilith can link us all together and we can use that as a way to get you out. But Damien refuses, telling everyone, Deathstroke is a killer. I'm not about to support saving him. With him separated from the group, everyone else combines and Flash runs as fast as he can. He enters with all of his friends talking inside of his head, wondering if Wally even has an idea of where he is going. As he goes deeper, he begins to fear being lost again, entering with no exit and Deathstroke with the Speed Force. How insane is this? He's about to fight the greatest assassin in the world with his own powers. He already ran away from him once because he didn't know if he could do it. His fear then bounces back through the mental link and into the empathic member of the team, Raven. She screams out in fear, creating a shaky link with the Flash. And as the link is fading, Flash begins to panic about that. At that moment, Jackson Hyde leaps out of the water to see everyone in a telepathic trance and Damien standing there snapping his fingers in front of Raven. Hey. Raven! Jackson then asks, what's going on? And Damien informs him that Raven is the link holding everyone together, and she's losing the link. All of their mental states are with the Flash, and if he's lost forever, they will all be lost forever. Everyone shouts in Flash and said that they need to abort, they need to fix this, and the Flash informs them, it's too late, we're going in! Jackson tries to help Raven, but she doesn't know him, but she does know Damien. He walks forward as stubborn as ever, and he pats her on the head. There, there. Jackson is shocked. Seriously, dude? Raven, Rachel, it's me, Damien. You're safe. No one will hurt you. Not on my watch. Come on, Raven. Your friends are waiting for you. And once again, crack a goom! Wally, Flash, and Deathstroke all fall out of the Speed Force and back onto the ground from which they left. Damien draws his weapons. This leaves us where we started. Deathstroke! And he looks at him, ready to fight. But Deathstroke draws his sword. Everything. You damn kids cost me everything. But there, inside of the Speed Force, I saw things that no man should ever see. Awareness on multiple planes all at once. And now it's all gone. My link to the Speed Force, my past being fixed. Everything. But Deathstroke should die here as well. So I'm done. Deathstroke is finished. I quit. And with that, Slade walks away, ending the fight. The epilogue for this tale goes in three directions. Due to allowing Deathstroke to gain powers and almost ending the entire universe, Damien fired Wally from the Teen Titans. For the Titans, Flash now has a pacemaker from his heart being stopped at a young age, and he should never run again. And Slade? Slade feels that it's time to do his own thing. To be a hero, lead a team. Maybe a team like the Titans. In the Hyde residence in New Mexico, Jackson's mother, Lucia, frantically calls Jackson's phone over and over, hoping that he would just pick up. As she hangs up the phone from her last attempt, she watches the news and sees a report of how the Teen Titans stopped King Shark. And up there, standing with Robin and the others, is Jackson, her son. 
Elsewhere, Jackson makes his way down through the street and kicks the top of a fire hydrant off, creating a pillar of water. Just as he puts his hand into it, Ra's al Ghul leaps at him, asking if he really thinks that he can stand a chance against him. No one has. Jackson throws out his arm, causing the water to cover Raz, telling him, Maybe I was a no one, but now I'm a little determined to make a splash. With water filling up Raz's lungs, Damien shouts out, No, no, no! Don't kill him! Detain him! Then the surrounding area begins to fade away, and Damien walks into the training simulator, stating, We don't kill! This just shows how vulnerable you really are. Damien goes on telling him that Kid Flash was vulnerable too, and Deathstroke took advantage of that. Because of it, it put the team in danger, which is something that won't happen again. Damien then places his hand over a pack, stating that hydrokinesis is sloppy at best. This bladder unit should help. Jackson picks up the backpack, telling him that can they not call it a bladder unit? As Jackson pulls the two hilts from his back, he creates two swords made out of water. And Damien tells him, you can get creative, but ideally you won't ever have to use it. It could become just a crutch. Jackson then says, like Dumbo's feather? And Damien tells him, I wouldn't know. I don't speak Disney. Meanwhile, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, Black Manta sits on his ship watching the news on the Teen Titans and he sees Jackson. He looks at the screen, stating out loud, She thought I wouldn't find out. That she could keep him a secret. This boy changes everything. Over at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, some of the city dwellers stop by the waters to see the seals when a little girl notices Jackson walking on water. He mutters to himself that he doesn't want to see his mother, and now she's seen him on the news. Maybe he can actually get some of his questions answered. The little girl calls out to Jackson, shouting, Hi! Hi, hero! Jackson looks over at the girl and he waves, thinking that he'll finally find out who he really is. And as soon as Jackson walks into the restaurant, Lucia runs over hugging him, and Jackson tells her he's fine, she doesn't need to be worried. She says that he doesn't know the first thing about worry, she has a garbage truck of worry that she can unload. The two take a seat and Jackson says, all right, tell me, am I Atlantean? Who's my father? Lucia says that he doesn't want anything to do with him. Nope, never, not gonna happen. She's not going to tell him who his father is. Jackson stops her telling her, you promised. But Lucia tells him, your father's a bad man. And that's not being dramatic. He would kill both of us if he knew about you. Lucia holds out a glass of water telling him that he's been so focused that his father is the reason that he can talk to water. But really, don't underestimate dear old mom. As the water pours out, the liquid begins to flow and change into a figure. As she finishes telling him, we have a lot more in common than you think. Jackson stares at the water asking, why? You made me feel like such a freak. Lucia continues telling him that it's the same reason they moved to the driest corner of the country, and that necklace, no matter how well she hid it, it would always seem to find its way back. While Lucia talks, Starfire radios to Jackson, telling him that there's a bank robbery in progress, and they need his help. He gets up and he runs out of the restaurant, and as she chases after him, he yells back that he has to go. Over at the Mission District, a pair of robbers flee from the bank when a giant green tail slams down on the front of their car. Gar begins to chew on the car, asking, Do you get it? And while Starfire holds up a cell phone recording the action, she says that it's difficult to understand what he's saying with a car in his mouth. Gar spits out the car, telling her, Puh! Sorry, I was asking, did you get that? But as Starfire and Beast Boy begin to clean up, a sewer lid shoots out of nowhere, and Jackson jumps up, shouting, I'm here! Gar points at the bad guys, stating, As you can see, Squirt Gun, everything's under control. And Jackson shouts, You should have called me sooner! I'm no kid, Flash! He then takes one of the Hydro Swords and cuts into the lamppost, and Starfire asks him what's wrong. He tells her that sometimes you wish so hard for something, and when you get it, you realize that it's not what you wanted at all. Along the San Francisco Bay, Lucia looks at the Titans Tower sign, telling Jackson that if he just knew how lucky they were to be alive right now. And that's when she hears a splash and a voice telling her, It's been a long time. There's so much to catch up on. She forms an axe of water, swinging back, shouting, Monster! And as Manta leaps out of the water, she yells, Stay away from my son! As the two of them fight, Manta tells Lucia that she betrayed him, and then he cuts into her shoulder, telling him, Tell me where the boy is. And then Jackson's voice calls out to Manta, telling him, Don't you touch her again! Don't you dare touch her again! Manta looks at Jackson and says, That's no way to speak to your father. And Jackson then suddenly stops. Lucia tells him that she's so sorry. She wanted to protect him from this, from him. Jackson lunges at Manta, and as he does, Manta takes the side of his harpoon and cracks it on the back of Jackson's head. Manta then takes the spear, holding it to Lucia's face, and Jackson shouts, Wait! If it's me you want, then I'll go. Just let her go. Inside of the tower, Damien speaks with his father, Batman, and as Batman tells him that he would like them to have weekly briefings about what's going on, Damien tells him, Actually, I wanted to talk about something else. Just like the Justice League delegates responsibilities and holds its members accountable, Batman tells him, 
We'll talk about it this weekend, but for now, I have to go. Before Damien can tell him to wait, Batman ends the call, and then a cough can be heard. Damien spins around shouting to Raven, asking her, How long have you been there? And she tells him, actually, she's here to talk about Wally. Damien tells her, He's off the team. There's nothing to talk about. When he entered the time stream to rescue Deathstroke, he could have destroyed the multiverse. All for murder. If you're wondering about that storyline, I will link it down below, but it's the Lazarus contract. As Damien storms off, Raven tells him that he can justify his actions all he wants, but she knows that he regrets it, which is why he's so hard on Jackson. Damien turns to snap back, but then Lucia pulls herself in, bleeding on the floor, telling them that they need to help Jackson. Somewhere out in the Pacific on Manta's ship, Jackson tells him to take his helmet off and look at him. His whole life has been him blaming his mother for keeping him hidden, and now he gets it. She was afraid. But for him, he's not afraid, he's ashamed. Manta walks over with a knife telling him that his feelings are irrelevant. The only thing that matters is this, and then he snips off the seashell necklace. Jackson asks what he's even talking about, and Manta holds out the shell telling him, this is no mere necklace, it's a map. The image of a location in the ocean then appears, and Manta explains that this was a map from the pirate captain, Madame Longrock. The surface world and Atlantis worked together to bring a war to her, and when she knew her time was coming, she hid the ring. The hidden location was in Zebel, the interdimensional aquatic prison that many know as the Bermuda Triangle. Getting into Zebel took everything he had, and once he got inside, he needed a guide. Jackson's mother. Over at Titan's Tower, Lucia is telling the same story to the others, explaining how she longed for a life outside of Zebel, and that's when she met him. Black Manta was a man on a mission, and he promised a life together once he was finished there. At the time, she knew his intentions were not for her, and she ended up trading out the shell map with a fake. Though he left not knowing that she had the real necklace, he also didn't know that he left her with an unborn child. Back with Jackson, he stands with Manta at their destination, asking, What is it with old maps saying things about uncharted territories? And he says, Beyond the reaches of any map I've ever known, here be the dragons. Manta then cuts Jackson's rope, telling him that he can try to escape, but he won't last long. The two of them then jump into the water, and Manta says, My father and I used to hunt for treasure. It was my lifelong dream to find the Black Pearl. However, while my father wanted it for fortune and glory, I always wanted it for different purposes. Jackson then asks what happened to his father, and after a moment of silence, Manta tells him, Don't bother trying to get close to me. I have nothing to give you. Jackson tells him, Fine. I'll talk. I play soccer. My favorite subject is math. My favorite band is a tribe called Quest. And I'm gay. The two continue to swim, and Manta says that he thought he was asking a question. Do you really think I care? You're all just meat. And while the two of them swim, a large eye opens up looking at him. Before the two of them is a glowing chest, and Jackson asks him, Is that it? Do we just swim in and swim out? Shouldn't this have just been harder? And just then, a giant octopus arm reaches out, grabbing Jackson and bringing him to its mouth. As Jackson is pulled away, the skull mouth containing the black pearl shuts, and Manta looks back. Before the giant sea creature can eat Jackson, he fires a beam into its arm, holding him, and he shouts, Fight with me, son! Manta then throws his spear into the creature's eye, and Jackson cuts himself free. Jackson says that he actually came back for him, and while Manta is grabbed, he shouts, Don't talk, just fight! Blind to the other eye! Jackson cuts the arm off that grabbed his father, and he asks, How exactly am I supposed to get close enough to do that? And Manta tells him, You're thinking too small. Understand your gift. The whole ocean is a weapon. Jackson begins to focus his strength, and as his eyes begin to light up with lightning, a giant electrical spear shoots out, piercing the creature's other eye. The creature starts to sink down below, and Jackson tells him, can't believe it. This never happened before. Manta tells Jackson, you have much to learn about the depths of the ocean and the potential of your powers. I can teach you about power. He then points to the skull and he tells him, open it. And Jackson tells him, how? Isn't there some kind of cursed booby trap thing? Manta kicks Jackson across the face and he begins to beat on him, telling him, you would have died back there if it wasn't for me. Now do as I say. With that, Manta throws Jackson back into the mouth of the skull, slamming him into it. And the mouth slowly starts to open. Manta swims over, pushing Jackson away, telling him, only a child of Zebel can unlock the seal. Jackson then tells him, The only reason you saved me is so you can use me. Amanda asks if he really knows what it feels like to find something you've hunted for your entire life. He holds the ring up and Manta shouts, It's empowering! The two swim towards the surface, and Jackson grabs his swords, telling him, I thought I needed my father to know who I was, but I didn't. Jackson swings down, and Manta drains the water from the swords and knocks him down onto the rocks. As Jackson struggles to get back up, he says, If there's one thing that I've learned, I can now see what I would have become if I was someone poisoned by hate. Manta tells him, You will learn to keep that mouth shut. And then a voice shouts, But I won't. Gar jumps out of the water as a shark, telling him, I'm kind of known for my big mouth. And he chomps down on Manta. The other titans start to make their way down, and Jackson says that they shouldn't have come, and Damien tells him, It's nice to see you too, squirt gun. 
Jackson goes on telling him, you all don't understand, he'll kill you all. And just then, Gar's body floats to the surface. Damien looks at the body and he says, there's no way that he could have drowned. He wasn't down there long enough. And Jackson pulls Gar out and begins to pull the water out of his lungs, telling them that Manta weighed him down on the water, and now he has the Black Pearl. The whole ocean is his weapon. Just then, Manta leaps out of the water, washing everyone away, telling Jackson, you don't belong with your weakling friends or your coward mother. You belong to me! While Manta focuses back onto Jackson, Starfire blasts into the wave, shouting, Jackson is not yours to claim. Manta creates a wall of water, stopping Starfire's attacks, and then he forms a whirlpool, sucking her down, asking, Where could this girl possibly lead you but down? As Raven fights back, Jackson tells her, You need to teleport us away. And Raven says, No, turn that fear into rage and fight. Manta releases another barrage of attacks, telling Jackson that this is his last chance. Join me or die with them. Damien pulls himself up, holding onto his arm, telling Jackson, Since you joined the tower, you've been ready. Now it's time to prove it. Join the club of kids who have world-class psychos for fathers, and just keep fighting. It's what the Titans do. Jackson looks at his hands, and he asks, how can he? Manta has the pearl, and he's lost his swords. And Damien says, Think back to what you said about Dumbo's magic feather. Manta might need the pearl, but you don't. As Damien's words ring through Jackson's head, he jumps forward at Manta, and just as Manta catches him, he electrifies the water all around them. The shock runs through Manta's body, and then he falls into the water. Jackson quickly jumps in after him, and he swims towards Manta, holding out his hand. Manta reaches up, and Jackson grabs his wrist, and then he pulls the ring off, telling Manta, I have family now, and I never want to see you again. Later back at the Titan's Tower, Tempest stops by, asking Jackson, what does he think about the title Aqualad? Jackson says, honestly, it feels like someone else's name, and it's kind of lame. Tempest tells him that he's been called it for years. Even if it sounds a little goofy, you've earned it. Jackson tells him, yeah, it's a lot goofy. And Tempest tells him it's a rough translation from Atlantia. It means son of the seven seas. I've come to love it, and I trust you will too, Jackson. As the two walk back towards the tower, Tempest goes on telling him that he's sorry that he couldn't have come sooner, but it looks like they really didn't need his help anyway. Jackson looks back at the Black Pearl and he asks what's going to happen to that, and Tempest tells him it's going to be hidden somewhere where there won't be a map. As the two turn the corner, Jackson sees the rest of the Titans standing there with a cake, and a sign that says, Welcome to the Teen Titans, Aqualad. While everyone enjoys the party, Gar puts his videos up on YouTube, and a voice looking at the screen asks him, Really? You're a fool! And the second man looks closer at Gar and says, Yes, that's what makes him perfect. When we last left off with the Teen Titans, DC Metal had happened, and Damien realized that his team had been transformed into monsters and he was forced to fight them. Now as Damien stands around his fallen comrades, he holds out his sword, telling them, It wasn't supposed to end this way. I want it to start over! And once Damien stabs himself, the room lights back up and he tells the computer to reset the program. Just before the computer can run the training program again, the rest of the Teen Titans walk in and Starfire asks if he knows what this looks like. Jackson Hyde tells him, yeah, after everything we've been through and getting turned into the dark versions of ourselves by the other you, the evil you that worked for the evil Batman, Damien turns back to the computer telling them that it's not what they think. I designed a virtual team so that we can still train even when we're not together, but the program keeps glitching and turning the avatars against me. Beast Boy laughs. Haha, <laughs> that sounds about right. Starfire then says that they came here so they can talk about Kid Flash. The rest of us have discussed it. We want Wally back. We know you think that he may have failed us, but that shouldn't be a reason to not give him a second chance. Damien stops her and says, He allied himself with one of the greatest villains, and he almost destroyed the universe. And Starfire tells him that they need to be able to fail. Then they learn from those failures. They need to feel accepted and respected and safe. And Damien asks, Safe space? There's no such thing. Remember, with him, this team wouldn't exist. I'm the one who makes all the hard decisions, including firing Kid Flash. If you think you can lead the team, then I will appoint Starfire as the leader. If you want Kid Flash so badly, go get him. A short while later, over at Star City, Damien flies out on Goliath in search of someone to replace Wally. Green Arrow talked about him having a half-sister as a potential recruit, so it's time to see what Amiko Queen is capable of. Down below, Emmy rides a jet ski closer to the transport ferry, and Green Arrow tells her, You gotta be careful. Onomatopoeia is way smarter than he looks. Do you need help? Emmy grabs her bow, telling him that this is his daily reminder that her code name is Red Arrow, and she does not need any help. Emmy then fires an arrow and pulls herself on board, landing just behind a large moving truck. Inside of that truck, Onomatopoeia starts yelling, Boom! 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 And suddenly his window is broken open. Emmy pulls Onomatopoeia out and throws him into a wall, firing three arrows into his jacket to hold him in place. She then says that she's not sure if 
thack is a part of his vocabulary. But if he wants to hear it again, she's got plenty more arrows. Onomatopoeia just sits there and he begins to say, tick, 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 tick. Realizing that he's referring to a bomb, Emmy jumps inside of the moving truck and hits the gas, driving it over the other parked cars and falling into the river below. But from the sudden stop of hitting the water, Emmy hits her head against the steering wheel and ends up knocking herself out. Goliath then flies down and starts to pull her out. And Emmy asks, who? And Damien tells her, just an admirer. Meanwhile, back at Central City, an armored truck blows its horn at a homeless man so that he would hurry up crossing the street. The homeless man looks back, pulling out a gun, and asks if he has any spare change. But before he can fire, there's a yellow and red flash blur. And Wally grabs the gun, telling him, If you need a fare for a ride to Iron Heights, I can get you there for free. But from the cart the man was pushing, another man jumps out, telling Wally that he's pretty sure faster than a speeding bullet is the other guy, and he gets ready to pull the trigger. Just then there's a loud coom as an energy blast knocks both men away and Beast Boy flies down as a pterodactyl, saying, Yo, I feel like I haven't seen you since the Triassic Age. Wally looks back to see everyone and asks what they're doing here. Raven flows down and tells him, It's what I've been telling you all along. You need the Teen Titans just as much as the Teen Titans need you. Back with Damien and Emmy, Emmy struggles to get free, shouting, Let me go! And Damien tells her, You know, you should show more gratitude. I was going to offer you an opportunity of a lifetime. She grabs an arrow and stabs it into Goliath's arm, asking, Is this your weird, creepy way of hitting on me? Because I can hit back. Goliath roars as he lets go of Emmy, and she lands on a building. And Damien says that neither of them have powers. They are far more powerful than most metahumans, though. She was raised by a ninja mother and a supervillain father where he was raised by a ninja mother and a supervillain grandfather. Emmy lets go of the arrow and Damien catches it, and he finishes by stating, we've also chosen to do good with our abilities. Goliath then sets Damien down and Emmy says that that's a nice trick, but how well can you do it with three arrows? Damien tosses the arrow that he caught, telling her that he knows virtually everything about her, her IQ, blood type, the weight of her bow's pull. The numbers can only tell him so much though. I'm here to see if you're worthy for a place on my Teen Titans. She pauses for a moment and then says, you've got to be kidding me. If you're not, then it's gonna be a hard pass. She pets Goliath, telling him, the dog seems nice, but you seem like an absolute nightmare. Damien shouts asking, do you realize who you're insulting? I'm the one leading tomorrow's Justice League and someday we're gonna be better. Emmy then asks, if that's the case, where's the team? All I see is you talking about this great team, but you're totally alone. I already fight with Green Arrow, Black Canary, and Arsenal. So why would I downgrade and play Junior Varsity? Meanwhile, over in Central City, Wally takes Raven's hand and says that he doesn't think it's a great idea. He's done some things that he regrets, and it's clear that he's got more of his father in him than he'd like to admit, but he's better on his own. Jackson Hyde tells him that things are different now. Starfire is in charge, and things are a lot more chill. Raven then teleports herself and Wally to a building to talk alone. She says that there's an Azathenian saying, If you travel back in time, you become as dead as history. In other words, if you think too much about the past, you will lose your grip on the future. I can feel your regrets. They are pouring off of you. But know that you are in danger of becoming your father if you keep living your life in reverse. Wally thinks on it for a moment and then he says that maybe he will consider coming back, but on one condition. Damien apologizes to his face. Back with Damien and Emmy. Green Arrow radios in that they've got some bad news. Onomatopoeia escaped before the Port Authority could get him. But before he left, he wrote a message out in blood, and it said, What does the sound of a tidal wave make? Emmy then jumps on the back of Goliath, stating that she needs to borrow his dog. She screwed up, so hop on if he wants to help her fix it. As Goliath flies up, Emmy goes on stating, Onomatopoeia didn't want to blow up the ferry. He wanted to drown the city. And at that moment, a truck underwater explodes, causing a massive tidal wave to head straight for Star City. But also at that time, Damien and Emmy's scanner picks up another alert. And someone broke into the Queen Industries weapons program and made out with some unimaginable things. As Goliath begins to head towards the water, Emmy says that she screwed up. She was too impulsive. So go ahead and revoke my invitation to your stupid little team. And Damien yells, you're insulting the greatest superhero team outside of the Justice League. And Emmy yells back asking, yeah? Then where are they? After flying back and forth, grabbing the civilians out of the boats, Emmy says that these so-called friends of yours, they're not going to make it, are they? Damien tells her to look up, and just as she does, Raven teleports in with the rest of the team, and Starfire shouts, Titans, together! Starfire, Jackson, and Beast Boy all dive into the water, and Starfire lifts up the boat and radios to Beast Boy, asking if he's familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale. Beast Boy yells, Roger that, time to get biblical, and then he turns into a giant whale, safely scooping up people in his mouth. Jackson and Raven then try to contain the tidal wave, by dispersing its force and shielding the city. But even with their combined strengths, Damien calls out to the people below to run. They won't be able to fully stop the wave. As the wave begins to get closer and it lands, there's a yellow and red blur. And Wally West stops by stating, running's my department. By the way, who's the girlfriend? 
Emmy yells back, I am not his girlfriend. And Raven then asks, why did you come? Wally starts running to create a barrier around the shore, stating that they helped him in Central City. How could he not return the favor? Everyone starts to get themselves into positions to hold back as much of the wave as they can. And Damien yells for everyone to brace for impact in three, two, one. And the wave then hits Damien. And it's just saliva from Goliath licking him. Damien shouts, stupid bat. And Emmy says that it looks like his friends don't hate him after all. Starfire and the others all head over to the pier. And Starfire says that she believes that this is what Beast Boy calls a punch butt. And Beast Boy tells her, actually, it's kick-ass. Green Arrow radios to Emmy, asking what happened down there, and she tells him that they've got it under control. Onomatopoeia set off a fusion bomb, and it tried to bring a tidal wave downtown. They managed to stomp it. Green Arrow then says that they're still not finished yet. Onomatopoeia is a serial killer who targets non-powered superheroes, just like me and just like you. He must have wanted to draw you out in the open. He's planning to, but then from a nearby building, Onomatopoeia starts firing a minigun, yelling, butta, 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 butta. Everyone jumps for cover, but as Emmy starts to fire off an arrow, she's hit in the shoulder by one of the passing bullets. She groans, falling to her knees, and seeing Emmy in pain, Damien pops the claws out of his gun, shouting, I'm gonna kill you! Wally sees Damien running up towards the building where Onomatopoeia is, and he says, oh no, Damien's girlfriend got shot. Now he's going full on Tasmanian devil. As Onomatopoeia continues raining bullets down, Wally runs up grabbing each bullet that would have hit Damien, asking, How long would you have survived without me? Come on, little psycho. I'll see him up and take this one down. Wally grabs Damien and he runs up the building, and as Onomatopoeia looks back, Wally says that the sound effect you're looking for is gulp. A short while later, once Onomatopoeia is arrested, Wally tells Damien, I'd be chopped liver if it wasn't for you, Kid Flash. I'm so glad you showed up, Kid Flash. Badass team up, Kid Flash. Damien turns his back, stating, if you're looking for an apology, don't bother. And after a few moments of silence, Wally pulls his mask down and says, The guys told me what happened in Gotham, with the city and how they all faced a dark version of you. Becoming my father is one thing that keeps me up at night, but being back with everyone, I know now that I don't have to do this alone, and neither do you. Wally then holds out a flash drive, stating, I've been keeping a close record on Deathstroke. All of the information is stored here, and if he ever comes back, we'll be ready. Damien takes the flash drive, and Wally starts to walk away, and Damien says, I fired you because you made a terrible decision that almost got everyone killed. You need to be better. We need to be better, all of us. Wally holds out his hand and says, together? And Damien shakes on it, stating, together. Just then, Emmy jumps down, stating that she's out of here. Green Arrow needs her. Damien asks, what about his invitation? She gives him a kiss on the cheek, stating, see you around. And as it turns out, your Teen Titans are pretty cool, but I'm still way too cool to join. As she jumps off, Damien blushes. And as everyone begins to tease Damien, over in the Batcave, Alfred is watching the Teen Titan success, and he asks, Are you ready to tell them that you're back, Master Tim? Tim looks at the monitor, telling him, Soon, Alfred. Soon. It was a quiet night at Wayne Manor as Bruce Wayne sits in his study reading a book. Not long ago, the Bat family had to fight off a future version of Tim Drake, one who had taken the Batman mantle and claimed the destruction of the world by a select few had come to pass. He had traveled back in time to prevent it from happening, and together, the Bat family managed to hold the future Tim back until Hyper Time ultimately pulled him back to his own timeline. However, as Bruce reads his book, he begins to sense something, and he looks out his window to see a large bat-shaped figure coming his way. Before he even has a chance to react, future Tim breaks through the window, telling Bruce, Hello. Tim kicks Bruce back, and he asks, Didn't expect me back so soon, did ya? That hyper time just swallowed me up. Tim then kicks Bruce in the face and picks him up, throwing him into a wall. Bruce groans in pain as he gets up, wiping the blood from his nose, and he says, I'm gonna take a guess that there's another mission about the timeline needing to be saved. And the only way for your plan to succeed is for someone to die. You should know that I can't let that happen. Seconds later, Tim is thrown through the wall into the bathroom, where Tim grabs a sink, bashing it over Bruce's head. The two go back and forth, hitting and kicking each other, grabbing onto anything that isn't bolted to the ground, giving them an upper hand. As the fight continues to make its way to the kitchen, Bruce flips Tim over the counter, and Tim rolls off, telling him, I'm not going anywhere until I get what I came for. Bruce tells him that he's gonna have to get through him if that's the case. And Tim says, I know, and he throws a knife into Bruce's leg. Tim charges and tackling him to the ground, and the two go back and forth, grabbing onto whatever they can get their hands on, hitting each other over and over again. As Tim falls down the stairs, Bruce takes out a knife, throwing it, cutting the wire to the chandelier. The weight of the chandelier causes it to fall fast down onto Tim, and as Tim pulls his arm back out, he's holding a gun. Bruce looks at the gun and says, even if you're from another timeline, shame on you for. But before Bruce could finish, there's a loud 
blam! And Bruce falls to the ground. Once Tim pulls himself out from under the chandelier, he takes Bruce's body and he drags it to the Batcave, telling him, you have to learn a great deal skipping through time. Tim opens up a chest filled with several boxes, each with the symbols of the Justice League members. Tim says, one thing that I learned is that Batman's paranoia will be his biggest advantage. Next stop, Arctic. A short while later, Clark looks over his Fortress of Solitude, picking up pieces of the statues that Mr. Oz had recently destroyed. He tells Kellex that thankfully the pieces are large enough that they can be put back together. And Kellex tells him that he'll assist him in doing so. As Superman gets to work fusing the statues back together, Kellex gets a reading that they have an intruder. A homo sapien has breached their fortress. As Kellex goes to handle the intruder, Tim begins shooting at him. However, before Tim could do any damage, there's a red blur. And Superman grabs Tim, throwing him into the wall. Superman spits out a bullet that Tim fired and Tim tells him, ha, those bullets were specifically made to put at least a little pause in your step. And Superman says that guns are a dead giveaway, that you're not my Batman. That and your suit specs are different. Tim gets back up telling him that there have been some modifications. Physiology dampener and vocal disruptor. But before he could finish, Superman smacks the vocal disruptor off telling him, you're Tim Drake, but older. Another timeline? Tim tells him, I could tell you where I'm from and when, but then I would have to kill you. All I came here to do is to make sure that you won't prevent me from completing my appointed mission. Superman asks, who appointed you? And Tim fires two missiles, stating, that's none of your business! Superman easily blasts the missiles with his heat vision, and as the smoke clears, he sees Tim operating one of the Kryptonian battle armor suits. Superman asks, how could you control it? And Tim punches Superman, telling him, Superman from my world taught me how to read and speak Kryptonian. Tim then starts to step down onto Superman, and he grabs him, throwing him outside, stating, Connor worshiped the ground that you walked on. If only he could see you now. Tim begins to climb out of the hole that he threw Superman out of, and Superman's eyes begin to glow red and he flies over, ripping apart the battle suit, throwing Tim to the ground. Superman begins to walk over asking, what are you here for now? I read Batman's reports on your last little visit. Tim pushes a button on his glove, telling him, something much bigger than you. Before Superman realizes it though, a red cage starts to wrap itself around him and contain him. Superman tries to beat against the glass, but Tim tells him, it's no use. That cage is lined with red kryptonite. Superman yells, this isn't over. Batman will, and Tim stops him telling him, no, he won't, and neither will Superman. I'm sorry to say this because there's no more time. To save our world, I have to kill Superboy. Later that night in Metropolis, Tim looks over his point of entry in the apartment building of Jonathan Kent. He fires an anchor into the wall, but before he can launch a hook into it, his arm begins to become distorted. He shouts as he tries to regain control of his body, stating that hyper time is trying to pull him back again, but he can't leave yet. He's gotta keep it together. He focuses, flexing his arm until the distortion goes away and quickly fires the hook into the connecting anchor. Once he crosses the gap, he opens the window to Jonathan's room, jumping and firing two trank darts into the bed. Tim then grabs the blanket so that he can secure Jonathan, but as he pulls back, he sees that Jonathan is already gone. Lois hears the noise opening the door, asking if everything's all right, but that's when she sees Batman standing there. Tim shoots another trank dart into her neck, telling her, shush. Meanwhile, over in New York City, Damien and his team Titans battle against the villains known as the Hangman. Damien calls out that they don't have to hold back on these assassins, and just as he says that, each Titan begins to get taken down. Just before the villains can finish the Teen Titans off, there's a red-blue blur that shoots by, bouncing into each of the five Hangmen. Only a minute later, Gar tells Wally that that was a good job he did taking out Breathtaker. Gar says that he wasn't the one on Provoke, he was busy with Shocky. Little Jiu-Jitsu mixed in with his secret tactics. Starfire says, wait. If Kid Flash and Beast Boy didn't stop them, then who did? Damien pulls out a small flare and he fires it into the air, telling Starfire to do him a favor. The flare goes off in the sky and someone begins to cough, and Damien finishes, stating, Catch Superboy! A second later, Jonathan comes crashing down onto Starfire, and as she catches him, she tells him not to worry, she has him. Later at Titans Tower in San Francisco, Damien tells Jonathan that they've been over this before. He's not a Teen Titan! That is, unless a majority vote is passed. Jonathan says that after the Cracklow stuff, he promised he'd take him on a mission once a month. That was three months ago, Damien! Starfire asks him if that's true, and Damien says that, I never officially said that. I only said that I would keep you focused. And Jonathan yells, so you lied! You never had any intention of bringing me! But just then a voice comes in over the intercoms, telling them that he has full control over Titan Tower. There's no escape from this room. Gar looks back and sees Tim on the screen asking, 
Is that Batman? And Damien tells him, it is most definitely not. That's Tim Drake, only older from a different timeline. Raven asks, why didn't you mention this as the leader of the Teen Titans? And Damien tells her, because it was a bad family problem. Tim gained control of the system since they were his original design. That being said, he's here for one thing, and that's to prevent a future that he knows is gonna come. Tim tells Raven, go ahead, project my memory so that they can all see that I'm telling the truth. That way they know it to be genuine. Images begin to appear, and what they see is an older version of Tim, Damien, and Jonathan. Lines were crossed, actions were taken. Jonathan flew into the sky, unleashing an uncontrollable blast. There was destruction, suffering, and millions dead. Jackson Hyde asks, what did we just see? And Raven explains that it was a vision of Atropolis destroyed, millions died, all because of Superboy. From another room in the tower, Tim shouts, This is the definitive future! And that's the one I'm here to fight and stop! Suddenly, a black liquid shoots at hitting John, and as Wally runs to the door, he's electrocuted, knocked away. Starfire quickly begins to blast the liquid off, but the more that John fights against it, the more it begins to cover him. As panic begins to set in, John shouts, asking for someone to help him! And his eyes begin to flare, and Tim says, No! It's too soon! And John shoots an uncontrolled controllable heat blast from his eyes. Damien shouts, we have to get out of here. Fly with everything you've got or it's gonna kill us. Jonathan rockets through the building, telling Damien, tell my mom and dad I'm sorry. And John climbs higher into the sky with his powers beginning to erupt, releasing a powerful explosion. Raven quickly creates a barrier, telling Wally to strengthen it with a speed force. But as the energy begins to come back, it blows up the entire tower roof. Meanwhile, in a different time and place, three people watch on a monitor. And as it pings, the woman says, Tim's cloaking device has been disrupted by something massive. And one of the men asks, Cassie, is he dead? And she responds, stating, she can't get a read on his vitals. And the man then says, what should we do, Connor? And Connor says, what Titans do, Bart. We find him and we bring him home, together. As Titan Tower begins to burn to the ground, the blast knocked all of the Titans out except for Damien and Tim. Tim gets up looking around, telling him, my cloaking device has been damaged in the blast, but this is the prototype Titan uniforms. Maybe I can use them to forge a new identity and become untraceable again. Damien, though, begins to back up, checking the computer to see the vital signs of the other members. The computer tells him that there are life signs for all of the Teen Titan members. Though unconscious, they are strong and accounted for. Damien then asks to give him the location of Superboy now, and moments later, Damien takes his submarine and goes into the water to pull Jonathan out. All the while, Tim is working on his new costume, stitching together many of the prototype suits. He says, from the rising sun came a bat out of hell, but I am now savior. Back with Damien, he begins to head out, and he asks Jonathan if he's all right. Jonathan sulks, telling him, no, what if I had hurt someone? And Damien says, just relax, I checked the vitals, everyone's fine. Unconscious, but you didn't kill anyone. What happened to you wasn't your fault, you were pushed to the edge. But the Titans aren't the problem right now, it's Tim Drake. He had every intention of killing Batwoman if he hadn't been pulled out of our timeline. He'll do the same thing to you. Damien then starts working on the computer, and Jonathan asks, who are you trying to reach with the comm link? And Damien tells him, our fathers. Even though I said I would never call them, they should know that Drake is back. But I can't reach them either. Jonathan begins to look around himself, asking, What was that anyway? That power? Where did it come from? And Damien says, I'll look into Batman's files. I know the Superman has a solar flare. A solar flare is something that Superman can control and use for good, but you, given the mixed DNA, you might not be able to control it like your father. Jonathan then says that he won't be responsible for killing innocent people in this time or any other. And Damien tells him, I won't let that happen. I'm going to keep you safe, John. John tells him, Thanks. And Damien asks, Friends are supposed to help each other. Right? And Jonathan says, I thought we were just partners. And Damien tells him, shut up. Later at Titan's Tower, Wally runs through the entire building looking for Damien and John, but he only finds a note stating, give me time, signed R. Raven tells him that she could have told him they weren't there. That and Tim Drake is also standing directly behind them. As everyone looks back, they see Tim as savior, with his guns pointed right at them, telling him, I'm willing to talk. Raven tells him if he says so, he could holster his weapons. Even though they're from different timelines, they still share an emotional connection. Tim tells everyone, we don't have much time. There isn't much left of my suit after Superboy went all Kira on us. So from here on out, call me savior. But as you can see, I'm not the bad guy here. The scariest thing that you all witnessed was just a small representation of what Jonathan Kent is capable of when pushed. And Jackson tells him, yeah, from the looks of it, it was you doing the pushing. Tim says, that's right, and he barely knows me. Imagine what would happen if someone close pushed him. I've seen it. Thanks to Raven, so have you. Even Robin did, and he chooses to keep Superboy away from us. And Starfire corrects him, stating, no, from you. Tim tells her, no, I mean them. If we don't do something, there's going to be a future generation unborn due to what Superboy does. Wally then asks, what does he mean by do something? And Tim calmly tells everyone, we have to terminate him. Starfire tells him to say the word. She wants him to say it out loud so that everyone knows what he's implying. And Tim says, we have to kill Superboy. 
And if Damien gets in the way, we have to kill him too. Jonathan asks, what if we get in your way? And Tim tells him, I'll do what I must. The Starfire then says, we will too. Gar separates the two of them, stating, let's dial it down the drama here for a second. First, no one's going to kill anyone. However, I am inclined to believe Tim's motivation given Superboy's little fireworks show. Raven then says that they'll depower him so that they can contain and help him. Those are the options for someone who hasn't unleashed his powers to commit a crime. If Tim can agree to these terms, they'll help him. After a few moments of silence, Tim says, I agree. But if we're going to do something, we have to leave now. And Starfire tells him, Robin said to give him time, so we're going to give him time. However, at that exact moment, the hyper time begins to pull away at Tim's arm, and as his hand disappears, it starts to appear somewhere else. Over in Titans of Tomorrow headquarters, a blue light shines over the room, and Cassie shouts that the time phase is activating. Just then, Tim's hand begins to appear, and Bart quickly grabs a hold of it, trying to pull Tim back. However, as Bart pulls, he tells everyone that it's pulling them in, and in the current time, Tim shouts in pain, telling everyone that the people from his time are coming for him. Starfire wants to give Damien time, but we don't have it! We have to do something now, Raven. Gar yells that they need to help Tim. They have seen his cards. Once they get Superboy, they'll sort this all out. Starfire sees Raven focusing her power and fires a blast, telling her not to do it, but as Raven opens up her eyes, she says she has to. In a flash of light, Raven disappears with both Gar and Tim, and Wally says that they did it. They're gone. And Jackson tells them not to worry. Superboy gives off a distinct energy signature, and they're surrounded by water. And when he looks into the water, he can find exactly where Damien and Jonathan are. After searching in the water, Jackson follows the trail left by Jonathan's energy and finds an underwater structure. Jackson radios back that he's at the location where Damien took Jonathan. So when they're ready, hit it. Up above, Starfire and Wally hover in the Titan's jet, telling them that they're coming in hard and fast. Meanwhile, over in Damien's makeshift hideout, the computer warns that there's an incoming attack. He yells at the computer to arm itself with non-lethal weapons. Take out whoever's out there! And seconds later, Starfire aims the jet down, flying it into the water, crashing into Damien's hideout. Once the jet is lodged in without leaking water, Starfire and Wally jump out and they begin to make their way through the facility. Just as the Titans start to move in, both Jonathan and Damien spring out of the vents ready to attack, with Starfire telling Damien to wait, but Damien fires his grappling hook and wraps it around Jackson Hyde. Jonathan then shoots by, grabbing Wally's legs out from underneath him and says, I'm really sorry I have to do this, and then Starfire fires a blast into Jonathan, allowing Wally to free himself to take on Damien. Damien shouts to Jonathan not to hold Hold back his punches! We need to stop them from taking you! And then Wally runs circles around Damien, and just as he stops, he grabs Damien from behind, telling him that he made a mistake letting him get close. And Damien says, No, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. This gas is something special that I've been working on in case we have to fight evil speedsters. I call it slow-mo. Jackson continues to struggle with the grappling hook, but as he flexes his muscles, he breaks free, shouting, I've had enough of this! He creates two water spouts that shoot out of the ground, crashing into Damien and Jonathan, ultimately stopping them from attacking. As the two boys sit down, Starfire asks, Now can we please talk? And Damien tells her, We're not handing Jonathan over. Wally tells him, Yeah, neither are we. And Jackson then adds that Raven and Beast Boy chose a side. It just didn't happen to be theirs. After a few minutes of explaining their plan, Damien shouts, asking, Is that the best you could think of? Knocking them out? And Starfire tells him, yes. It's the only way that Raven could not track you guys. Wouldn't you agree, Superboy? Damien continues to yell, but Superboy punches and knocks them out. And says, actually, I don't agree, but before you knock me out, here's the coordinates of the fortress. It's the safest place that I can think of. Jonathan then holds up his fist and says, I'm not exactly excited about this. Just make sure to add some speed to this, Kid Flash. Wally grabs Jonathan's fist and tells him, sure, no problem. And then crack! A short while later at the Fortress of Solitude, Jackson and Wally move Damien and Jonathan inside, and after grabbing a piece of ice, Jackson changes it to water to wake them up. Damien wakes up shouting, What the heck? No smelling salts, Andy? And as the two of them get up, everyone looks around at the destruction. The Starfire says that she hates to say it, but it doesn't appear that this is the bastion of safety that he had hoped for. Damien says that he knew they should have come here, but while Jonathan flies around, he notices something outside. He rushes out there to find his father, Superman, still trapped in the cage that Tim had set up for him. He touches it, asking what happened, and Superman tells him to get back. His powers will be weakened if he gets any closer. Jonathan hits it with his heat vision, trying to free his father, but as everyone gets closer, Superman tells them to get Jonathan away. He then tells Jackson to push this chamber under the ice. It's the only way. As everyone begins to pull Jonathan away from his father, he screams, let me go! Once I'm a safe distance away! And once he's a safe distance away, Superman tells Jackson to do it. Jackson places both of his hands on the ground and the ice begins to splinter. As Superman tells him, you have to be brave. As Jonathan watches the cave fall beneath the surface, he screams, releasing a wave of energy. Below the surface, the pressure pushed against the cage is enough to break it, allowing Superman to free himself. He flies back out from under the ground and he yells to Jonathan, but through Jonathan's anger, he can't hear him. He thinks 
thinks his father is gone. He thinks that Tim did this, and he thinks he's about to kill millions. Superman tells everyone that Jonathan is in some sort of trance. He's creating some kind of emotional superstorm. Just then, Raven appears with Gar and Tim once she's got a lock on Jonathan's emotional level. But before they can even fully appear, Superman charges at Tim, asking him, what have you done? Superman squeezes on his head, and Tim tells him, same solar flare power that you do, but because he's half human, he can't control it. You have to let this happen. If Superboy dies here today, millions can be saved. But just then, there's another flash of light, and inside it is Connor, Cassie, and Bart, the titans of tomorrow. Wally asks who's that, and Cassie tells them that they're here to bring back their teammate. While Bart tries to control Tim's hand, he says that this thing's got a mind of its own, and it led us to some kids that are about to go boom. As Jonathan's solar flare starts to gain power, Cassie uses her lasso to try to keep it from expanding and tells everyone that they shouldn't be standing around. Titans together! Gar turns into a giant octopus and he positions himself on the top of the orb while Cassie tells Raven to try and contain the blast. Superman calls out to the flashes to start running counterclockwise so that they can try and reverse the polarity. But while everyone works together to try and stop Jonathan from going out of control, Superman looks at Tim telling him, I don't have time to deal with you. I'm going inside of the flare and I'm gonna get him out. But before he goes, Connor stops him, telling him, wait, who's inside of there? And Superman tells him, my 10 year old son, Jonathan, I have to save him. Both Superman and Connor look at the ever expanding orb and Connor says that they, are going to save him. He failed them once. He's not going to let this happen again. They both race to the center of the flare and Tim feels himself being pulled back again by hyper time. And he says that they are willing to sacrifice themselves to save him. Damien then jumps in the back of Tim's head shouting, this is all your fault. You screwed up the timeline and they're all going to be killed because of you. Tim throws Damien off, telling him that he knows what to do now. He'll save them all and take the power with them. Just then, as Tim's body is sucked into hypertime, he begins to absorb the blast, telling everyone to stop. He'll handle this. As the portal to hypertime opens, Tim is pulled inside along with the solar flare. And as the blast begins to fade, Superman picks Jonathan up and Jonathan asks what happened. Superman tells him that he has made things right by giving all he had to save him. As the portal begins to close, everyone sees Tim inside and many events happening throughout time, but then in one last flash, that portal disappears. Everyone begins to get back up and Gar asks, what did they just see? And Raven tells him that they saw a version of Tim sacrificing himself for them. Wally then asks all of those images, were they the past, present, or future? As Superman says, that that's another question that needs answers. In all of this action, we've never been properly introduced. Who are you all and why are you wearing my S? Connor tells him that he doesn't know him yet. But once he told him that when it comes to time travel and alternate realities, the less they say and do, the better. Superman tells him, that sounds like good advice. We're very sorry for the loss of. But Cassie stops him, telling him, Tim Drake isn't dead. He's now everywhere and everywhere. Damien then says that he has so many questions. This way they can learn about... But Cassie stops him, telling him, that's exactly why we can't stay. Whatever is coming your way, you need to figure it out on your own. Jackson then asks, how are they going to get back? And Bart says that the residual reverse. Wally says that they can use the same speed force that they came in on, like a time tether and slingshot back, right? And Bart laughs, telling him, ha ha, not bad. Both Superman and Connor shake hands, and... Bart starts to race around until he creates a portal for them to return home in. Once the three disappear, Gar says that he thinks he knows the blonde. Wish they had gotten names. And Wally smiles, telling him, I got something better than names. And he pulls out his phone, showing that he got a selfie. Pretty cool, right? Right before they phased out. Little souvenir. Raven grabs the phone, blowing it up, asking, do you want to compromise the timeline and more lives? And Wally laughs, stating, you know, I can just re-download that from the cloud. And Raven snaps. This is not a time to be joking. A version of Tim Drake, someone that all of us are close to, just sacrificed himself in front of all of us less than a minute ago. And you want to smile and take selfies? Wally sighs, telling her, I'm sorry. I really wasn't thinking. I just got caught up seeing another flash. Superman then directs Jonathan and Damien away, stating that it seems that they've got some things to clear up. Excuse us. And a short while later, back at Wayne Manor, Bruce begins to open up his eyes and he sees Alfred waiting with breakfast. He asks, how long have I been unconscious? Alfred pours him a glass of orange juice, telling him that he must have had a dream. Bruce says, dream, huh? Back at the Fortress of Solitude, Jonathan and Damien look at Clark, who's standing there for five minutes without saying a word. Damien whispers, what is he thinking about? This is all done. Can we go home now? As Superman tells him that he's not so sure that he agrees with everything being wrapped up. Jonathan points to his ear, stating, Superhearing, remember? And Damien scoffs, Stupid powers. Clark then says that he may have to reassess this partnership of theirs. Damien seems to be a catalyst for some far-flung future maelstrom that ends up engulfing my son. So Damien should understand my concern about you guys going out and doing your crime fighting. Damien says that they're talking about a possible future, not one set in stone. A Superman tells him, yes, but if he can do something to make sure that it doesn't happen as a father, he will stop 
But Damien stops him and says, Look, Jonathan's possible future is already altered the minute that Tim absorbed the solar flare. So I can swear that I will never put Jonathan in harm's way. And Jonathan says, That's right. Just like I'm going to protect Damien and whatever the world has in store for his possible future. So there's nothing to worry about, Pop. Staying close to Damien, being a friend in good times and bad is the answer. Not pushing him away. We're only going to learn by making our own choices. Superman smiles, asking, When did you get so smart? And Jonathan tells him, Maybe it's because I listen to what you and Mom have to say all the time. As Damien and Jonathan head back outside, he asks, Ask Starfire what's going on and she says they need to have a meeting and talk about what just happened. Savior fractured them easily. It's important to speak about their feelings. And Gar says that it will be hard since the tower is kind of blown up. And Jonathan tells him that he's really sorry about that. Superman says, don't worry. You can have a temporary headquarters until you get things back up. Initiate Justice League headquarters transport code for eight on my mark. Seconds later, everyone is teleported away and Superman welcomes everyone to the Justice League headquarters. Their meeting table is theirs to use and he'll be in the monitor room if they need him. All of the Titans walk over to the meeting table and as Jonathan walks away, Damian slams his fist down stating, meetings called to order. I move that we put Superboy up for vote to be a half member of the Teen Titans, later to be recognized as a full member when he turns 13 years of age. Before everyone can vote, though, Jonathan runs back, stating, I'm sorry, I overheard, but is there anything I can do to convince you? And Damien gives him a thumbs up and says, That won't be necessary. Jonathan smiles, stating, Okay, I'll let you get on with it then. Just then, Bruce walks up telling Damien that he would like a full report on everything that just happened. And what are you voting on? Damien says, Whether or not Superboy can join the Teen Titans. Bruce tells him, Everyone go ahead and give me a show of hands. Damien puts his hand up, but no one else does. And Bruce says, The nays have it. Sorry, Superboy. Starfire tells Jonathan that it's not about him. It's about how much they have to figure out about themselves. And Jackson adds that they really need to work on them as a team more than anything else. With Jonathan sighing, stating, Right, I'll see you later then. As Jonathan walks away, Damien runs over, stating that he's sorry about that. And Jonathan tells him, It's okay. Thanks for having my back, though. And Damien says, Hey, what are partners for? And Jonathan asks, Friends, right? And Damien asks, Friends? You just had to ruin it, didn't you? And Jonathan says, Sorry. But Damien pats Jonathan on the shoulder, telling him, Don't be. After the fight against the future Tim Drake, the Teen Titans found themselves picking up the pieces of a broken Titans tower. But among the destroyed wreckage, Gar, Beast Boy, finds himself the one thing connecting him back to his family, an old half-burned photo. He looks at the photo and he thinks to himself that there was once a time when he was going by the name Changeling. But if there's one thing that holds true to that name, it's that nothing ever lasts in life. Starfire begins to move some of the debris out of the way, stating that it's going to take some time and heart, but they can come back from this. Gar tells her that he knows that she's a sun worshiper and all, but there's really no bright side to them losing their home. Even if they rebuilt, why even bother? Starfire points over to one of her Zorka plants that survived the attack and says that something like a plant can still remain alive, then there is life, and with life, there is hope. Wally tells her, yeah, things have fallen apart before. Like how Damien fired me, and then I came back? We always come back. Gar looks at the picture again and he tells everyone that he's sorry, but right now he's feeling like flying solo for a bit. Then he changes into a hawk and flies off. Meanwhile, over at the Golden Gate Bridge, a school bus full of people make their way to the school when one of the kids inside starts getting picked on. The young kid sits alone tinkering with his own devices when the school bully starts hitting him with spitballs across his glasses. As everyone starts to laugh at the kid, he pulls down his glasses and reveals lines of computer code running over his eyes. The kids get up and they walk to the front of the bus, and within a few seconds, the bus driver is thrown out the door and he swerves the bus over the edge. That bus begins to hit the barrier and it drives off, with the kid hitting his head on the steering wheel, and then he's thrown out of the bus. Back with the Teen Titans, an alarm goes off at Damien's computer and he tells everyone that they got trouble. They gotta move out. Jackson jumps into the water and he starts to create a hard water construct ramp, giving Wally a straight shot at the bus to help slow it down. Raven teleports inside of the bus, trying to steer it down the ramp that Jackson and Wally are creating. And Wally tells her, don't worry, she's got this. Raven grips the steering wheel, telling him that she's not so sure she doesn't even have a driver's license yet. And while the bus makes its way down to land, Starfire shoots by grabbing the child that had been thrown out, making sure that he's safe. Land. But while the Teen Titans save the children, Gar heads over to Hibernaclium Park to throw the first pitch of the Sacramento River Bats game. The coach tells Gar to make sure not to choke out there with all 50 people watching him. Gar tosses him his phone telling him, just keep the camera steady. Need to make sure all of my fans get a good view of this. He steps out and the game announcer asks everyone to please welcome Yeast Boy! Gar sighs telling them it's Beast Boy. And the catcher calls to him that no one really cares, loser. Just throw the ball already. Gar changes into a bull, telling him that he was going to go easy, but he's got a better costume in his trunk. He then changes into an elephant and launches the ball, knocking the catcher into the wall, and then everyone begins to boo him. 
While the catcher is having his hand looked at, Gar begins to walk back to the locker room, telling him clearly he's not too much of a team player these days. As he sits down and looks at his picture, Gar hears a girl calling out to him when he quickly tells them to just leave him alone. The girl asks if he can't spare a minute for a fan, and Gar turns back telling her, Fan? What? <laughs> Diggity dog! As Gar turns into a puppy, he jumps at the green-haired girl and then phases through her. And before he can ask, she tells him that she should explain. First, her name is Joran. Second, he isn't the only one who likes to play make-believe, so she has a proposal for him, one that she hopes would be mutually beneficial. A short while later, on a pirate ship in the middle of the Moara Woods, outside of San Francisco, Gar looks around asking what is this place. Joran tells him, welcome to Neverland. Other than living here, she works here with her lost boys. Joran leads Gar down the stairs, and Gar sees a room full of techies. Joran then goes on to explain that Wade here is living on a beach selling motorized surfboards that he designed. Kimmy over there was kicked out of school for developing an anti-bully repellent made out of skunk glands. Gar high-fives everyone, asking, What are you all, like a weirdo version of Silicon Valley? Joran laughs, telling him that they're just square pegs trying to live in a round hole world. They're misfits and outsiders just like him. She herself started out making remote-controlled puppets. Gar looks around and asks, where does he come in? And Joran says, well, she's been working on something special, and she holds out a small tube with an implant floating inside of it. Joran goes on stating that this is a device that she labeled Pixie, named after Tinkerbell's magic dust. It's the next step in Bioware technology. It's a VR implant that allows the user to live in many worlds at once. Joran then reaches out, touching Gar's hand, and as she does, she starts to change form into her original punky blonde self, stating that the Teen Titans don't support or understand him. Like him, her parents died when she was young. So what does he say? Wanna be weirdos together? Meanwhile, over at the UCSF Medical Center, the Teen Titans wait in the hospital nearby to hear the results on the kids. When Starfire asks what about him, the doctor says he'll be fine. However, they had to remove a small implant from the boy's dural matter between his frontal lobe and nasal cavity, the same implant that Joran just gave Beast Boy. Damien takes the tube, stating that it appears that he was outfitted with some sort of bleeding edge brain implant. Starfire says, wouldn't that be cutting edge? Damien tells her no. The difference between cutting edge and bleeding edge is that the bleeding edge will kill you. Back at Neverland, Joran asks, well, she wants them to build something together. Gar looks at the implant thinking, change might be a good thing. His powers are awesome and all, but they can't help what he's struggling with on the inside. He then says, let's do it. Second star to the right and straight on till morning, right? She loads up the injector and hands it to Gar, telling him not to worry, it's perfectly safe. He places the injector over his nose and then he pulls the trigger. As Gar falls over, Joran asks if he's alright and he snaps back up with his eyes changing from green to purple, telling her that he feels good. Who needs the Teen Titans when he has her? Soon a world of possibilities begin to flash before Gar's eyes, and Joran begins yelling at Gar to snap out of it. When he blinks, he comes back to reality and she says that sometimes it's hard to return, isn't it? Gar takes out his phone, telling her that it was incredible. If only there was a way to share that experience with his fans, and Joran says that he can. Soon they'll be releasing Pixie to a limited market, and she wants him to be there at the launch. Invitations will be sent out to a very select few, and with them, they're going to make their dreams come true. Meanwhile, back at Titan's Tower, Wally tells Raven to try it now, and activates the controls, and the T-Jet fires up. Raven turns the jet off, stating that if only people could be fixed so easily, maybe things would be different between them. And Wally laughs, telling her, yeah, if only. She holds Wally's hand and a symbol appears, and then Wally asks what was that, and she tells him it's the Azerathian symbol for hope and patience. Be patient with her and maybe. Before the two could go on, Damien walks through breaking the two up, asking if it's ready yet, and Wally says, other than a car wash, the T-Jet is operational. Damien scoffs, telling him that it's not ideal, but he needs to use the portable lab since the tower's facilities were destroyed. The device that was in the skull of that boy appears to be coming from a startup company called Neverland. The boy was a straight-A student with no behavioral problems in the past. One would go as far as to call him a model student. He was bullied terribly, so it's possible that he may have just snapped and that device was a synaptic connection to his frontal lobe. So it could be possible that he was being puppied. No one has heard much about the company, and the only thing on the web is just rumors. After some digging, he was able to find out about an exclusive invitation from Neverland. It's time for the Teen Titans to go undercover. Later that night at the Neverland launch event, Gar looks out at the theater and says they've really packed this place, huh? Joran tells him it's because those people are sick of feeling alone, but there is something else. She's really hoping that he doesn't get mad that she went through his things. Joran pulls up the photo that Gar kept of his family, but rather than seeing it all burned and destroyed, he sees it fully restored. She says that she could see how much this meant to him, so she restored it using some image processing. Gar takes the photo, telling her, Whoa! And Joran leans in, asking, Do you miss them? He stares at the photo, stating, Honestly, I don't remember them that well. It's more about what they represent. A better life than the one I have now. Which is why I'm always changing my teams in appearance. Joran sighs, stating that she can relate to dissatisfaction. But as for her parents, she doesn't miss them at all. When her father was drunk, he would go after her with whatever he could in arm's reach. His fist, belt, lit, cigarette, anything. 
The only way that she was able to survive was to escape, and her puppets were the way out. She loved them because it made her feel like she was in control. Just then, one of the other boys knocks on the door stating that everything is ready, and Joran changes back into her green-haired form, telling him, all right. Gar tells her to hang on a sec. She can't go out there pretending to be someone that she's not. They need to love her for who she is. Take her from the guy whose DNA is type zoo. Joran pauses for a moment and then changes back, kissing Gar, telling him, okay then, let's go be weird and vulnerable together. Gar gallops out in the form of a stallion as Joran rides him the crowd cheers and claps. Joran hops off quietly stating, see what they do? And then it turns to everyone telling them thank you for coming and supporting their company. As they know, they are not one of the cool rich kids from Silicon Valley. They are the punky upstart. To demonstrate, she tied Beast Boy's implant into her holographic projector. This way, they'll be able to get a sense of what is possible with Pixie. Gar's eyes begin to light up and the stage changes to a scene where Gar is fighting a fire-breathing dragon. Seconds later, it changes to Gar having a shootout with a bad guy and then him battling aliens as a Green Lantern. Joran tells everyone whether they want to raid a dragon's horde, bring justice to the frontier, or know what it's like to be a hero, they can do so with Pixie. Everyone here tonight will receive a free Pixie and with it, a syringe gun that will allow them to safely put the implant into themselves. All they have to do is put the nozzle into their nostril and pull the trigger. When Joran continues her speech though, a battering then shoots out from the back, grabbing Gar by the leg and pulling him back off stage. Damien says first he ditches the team and now the next day you hook up with the enemy? Explain yourself. Gar changes into a crab, cutting the wires, asking, What are you talking about? Joran's my friend. And unlike you, she understands and respects me instead of treating me like a joke. Damien asks, Would you rather be a joke or a pawn? That implant is a backdoor to mind control. Even if this company has good intentions, which I'm guessing they don't, they are still biohacking their users. Joran pulls back the curtain, asking if everything's okay back there. And both Damien and Gar shout, No! Gar begins to walk away, telling Damien that he's just jealous of people like him. He has to bully people because he has no friends. Starfire flies in, stating that that is not true. They are Damien's friends. And Jackson also says that they are Beast Boy's friends, too. Joran pulls Gar away, stating that it's time for them all to leave. And Damien asks, where do you think you're going, freak? Just then, Gar's body begins to grow, and he changes into a giant gargoyle, letting out a bellowing growl. Gar starts wildly swinging at everyone, and Wally tells him not to do it. But Damien says it's no use. He's under her spell. Joran tells Damien... He's not alone. Everyone here is now my puppets. Seconds later, Gar bursts out of the theater with Jordan on his back, but before he can get too far, Damien throws another battering, grabbing his leg. He is then pulled out of the theater as he shouts, Give him back, Joran! Gar swipes at his leg, cutting the wire, but before anyone can come to save him, the other Teen Titans have to deal with Joran's mind-controlled mob. As Damien falls, he lets out a loud whistle, and a moment later, Goliath swoops in, biting down and grabbing Damien by his cape. Damien asks, what took you so long? And Goliath grunts. And Damien says, stupid bat. Goliath grunts again and Damien says, yes, let's go kick some ass. As Goliath flies over towards Gar, Damien shouts asking Jordan, what are you doing? And Jordan yells back, it's because of people like you. I've seen Gar's vlogs. You're nothing but a bully. Gar's a victim, just like Kid Flash, Raven, and Starfire. Damien tells her, I don't need your judgment. I've made mistakes, but we've moved past them. Joran shouts, the very existence of the Teen Titans is an ongoing hostage scenario. Gar's only stuck with you because he has Stockholm Syndrome. But that doesn't matter, Gar is done with the Teen Titans. He's now one of the lost boys. Gar swings his claws, tearing through a part of Goliath's wing. And just as Goliath starts to fly down, Damien throws a fistful of powder into Gar's face. Damien then calls out that he doesn't need to listen to her. He is still one of them, whether he likes it or not. Back down on the street, the mob starts to surround everyone, and Starfire asks Wally, can't he jiggle those devices out of their heads like he jiggles through walls? Wally says, uh, what? Are you talking about vibrating? Walls is one thing, a brain's another. I'm still kind of a junior varsity when it comes to the speed force thing. Raven asks, what happens if we leave them like this? The last few months, they talked a lot about fear and doubt. Remember that Azarethian symbol? Wally asks, the one for hope and patience? And Raven tells him that he needs to keep it in his heart, just as she will keep it in hers. Raven then kisses Wally and says that he keeps telling her that she should take a risk. So there, she took a risk. Now it's his turn. In a flash, Wally runs back, dropping all the implants on the ground. And he asks, like that? And Raven laughs, telling him, like that. Starfire then says that they help each other and then they can accomplish anything. And Jackson yells, I will never get tired of Space Mom's inspirational sayings. Just then, Goliath comes crashing down as Damien calls out to him and Raven grabs him out of the air, slowly setting him down. Damien then runs over to Goliath, telling him, you stupid bat, you better be okay. And Starfire asks what happened. Damien tells her that Jorn gave Gar something that he couldn't. And when Starfire asks what, Raven tells him, love. Back up in the sky, Damien's powder begins to short out Joran's implant, and as he sneezes, Gar rapidly begins to change forms. Soon him and Joran begin to fall to the river below, and as Gar coughs, he asks what happened. Gar then starts to rub his head, stating that he was in some sort of World War II flight simulation, and now his head's all messed up. 
Joran tells him it's because Robin tried to kill him, and then Gar asks why would he do that? And Joran says that there are two kinds of people in this world, Captain Hooks and Peter Pans. Is there any doubt which one Robin is? Gar then says, why is she so angry? And Joran tells him that she'll show him. She hits a button on the projector, and then a younger version of Joran appears in a barn. She tells him that when she started building her puppets, it was at first a way for her to escape, and then she realized with puppets she could permanently escape. As the image fades, Gar says, look, he likes her a lot, but she's hurting other people. She has become like Captain hook of her own story. Joran looks up and the pirate ship base flies down and she says that that's their ride. Time to sail the Neverland. The ship lands and she takes Gar's hand and Gar can hear Damien scoff. He looks over and says that he hacked her VR program, didn't he? And Damien tells him her firewall was easily defeated. Just then, a projection of the pirate ship fades and in its place is the T-Jet. Joran looks out the window and says, Seca start to the right and straight till morning. The next day, Gar visits Joran in the Fresh Start Juvenile Detention Center, but Joran's reaction to his visit is less than desired. She was tricked. She was forced to see an image that didn't exist to get picked up. She stares for a moment and then smiles, reaching back and touching the window. As the day goes on, the Teen Titans have a picnic down at the beach and Gar thinks to himself that even though they may have their differences, these are his friends. And with these friends, they're in it together, no matter what comes their way, including Brainiac. With the events that happened during No Justice, many of Earth's heroes confided in themselves to try and piece together what had happened. For Damian Wayne, that meant going to the Lebanese restaurant Tarbushes to have some ox blood soup. As Urza sets the bowl down, she tells Damian that they have not seen him in a while, and Damian says that he was out of town. Urza rubs his shoulder, telling him that they missed him, but nevertheless, welcome back home. Damien looks down into the bowl of soup and thinks back to when his mother Talia used to make this often for him growing up. Tarbushas makes it just like she did. This is really the only place that he can somewhat feel at home. Just before Damien begins to eat, he notices a group of shady thugs walk in, and a panicked look comes over Cook Ismal's face. Ismal tries to grab what money he has in the register, but that's not enough. The men take him into the back. Damien watches, thinking that with no one to protect them as immigrants, they would have no choice but to pay that protection money, but today, that's going to change. In the kitchen, one of the thugs grabs Ismal, and Ismal yells, business has been slow, they can barely stay open. The thug holding Ismal tells him that that's not really their problem, and Damien jumps down behind him, telling him, spoken like a true dirtbag. Before the thugs have a chance to react, Damien grabs one of the pots off the burners and throws the scalding hot soup onto them. Damien whips back, throwing the pot into another man, telling him, don't worry, I have some left for you too. As Damien looks back, he notices smoke, and the remaining thug runs off off shooting at him. Damien charges forward, kicking the gunman, and that's when he notices that the smoke is coming from a fire that has been set on a pile of cans containing grease. Seconds later, the restaurant explodes, and even though Urzu managed to get the kids out, Ismal himself wasn't as fortunate. Ismal's sacrifice will not be in vain. Someone will pay for this. A few moments later, the thug who has the hot soup thrown on him wakes up hanging upside down on the side of a building. Damien tells the man that he's not sure how much longer he can hold on to him. And the man shouts, I'll tell you everything, I'm working for Black Mask. Damien tells him, that's impossible. Black Mask is doing time in Arkham. The man shouts back, no! His lawyers got him out on a technicality. Black Mask is bigger than the law. In that moment, something snapped in Damien. He let go of the wire. Maybe it was him still reeling from watching an entire planet be destroyed. Or maybe he just realized his true purpose in life. The man screams to please help him, but just before the man hits the ground, he's stopped. Later over at the Gotham bathhouse, Black Mask relaxes in a sauna and then he hears a voice call out to him. He looks back and sees Damien asking him, What is this? The bat sending in the junior squad now? Damien tells him, This has nothing to do with Batman and everything to do with the Lebanese family just trying to live an American life. Black Mask laughs, telling him, It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Unless you got a suicide wish, you better leave before my boys come in and mess you up. Damien tells him, I'm not sure about them. I already gave them the night off. Black Mask reaches for his gun, telling him, It's your lucky day then! It's been a while since I got my hands dirty. As Black Mask leans over, he grabs nothing, and then there's a ch -ch Black Mask looks back to see Damien holding the gun, and he tells him, Batman doesn't use guns! Damien stares at Black Mask right in the eyes, and he tells him, I'm not Batman! And a single shot is fired. But over with another member of the new Teen Titans and the Chinchuli Garden and Glass Museum in Seattle, Amiko. The self-proclaimed Red Arrow is kicked out a window and onto the ground. She rolls to avoid being hit with a set of arrows and she thinks to herself, she's got some real mommy issues. The problem is when they fight, people die. She pulls back on her bow, aimed at her mother Shadow and tells her to just walk away. Shadow says that she knows that she can't do that and Amiko tells her that she will have to take her down then. Shadow holds her arrows pointed at Amiko and says, that worked so well for you in the past. Green arrows made you soft. 
Amiko releases the arrow and Shadow easily dodges out of the way. She grabs another two arrows and shoots all three down into the lower levels of the building. The arrows break through the glass and Amiko jumps down into the lower floor, shooting the rope holding a banner allowing it to fall. The falling glass is caught by the banner and Amiko knows that the next time she faces her mother, someone is going to get hurt badly. The next night, Amiko dresses up to attend the Seattle Global Exchange Conference on a lead that Shadow's next target will be there. A few days prior, a Chinese diplomat and Australian banker suffered fatal heart attacks. Both were politically well-connected, and two seemingly random people having heart attacks when they were in perfect health? Well, it seemed rather odd. It's later discovered that both of them had small cuts caused by an arrow containing a toxin. There's only one person who could use that kind of poison. Shadow. Tonight will be the night to stop Shadow, but not with arrows. Words. Amiko steps out onto the balcony where Shadow is, and Shadow asks if she's ever told her the story of her great-grandmother. Amiko says that she told her very little of their family. What does that have to do with anything? Shadow says that Kazumi Adachi was considered the most beautiful woman in all of Japan. Though she was already married and a mother, she caught the eye of the Emperor and became his mistress. The Emperor loved her so much that when the time for war came, he sent her far away to save her. As Adachi longs to be reunited with her husband and child, she returned to a port city called Hiroshima. On that day, the most beautiful woman in all of Japan was wiped from this earth. This story is not told to be sentimental. It says how being sentimental will get you killed. Amiko says that she already knows who the next target is. The woman is a mother of three. She's innocent. And Shadow sighs, telling her that she's heard nothing of what she just said. All she has done is brought death into this world until she had her. She loved her daughter like nothing ever before. Shadow hugs Amiko, and after a few moments, Amiko hugs back. Shadow leans back and says that she'll have to make a choice, and she has chosen herself. Goodbye, Amiko. Amiko feels something in her neck, and Shadow holds out an arrowhead with the same poison that killed the two officials. She tosses the arrow back, telling Amiko to make sure that she sends her love to Adachi. Amiko grabs the arrowhead, and she starts to run to the back, but the poison begins to set in faster than expected. She collapses, trying to catch her breath, and she tells herself that she refuses to die like this. She takes the arrowhead, jamming it into a power outlet, shocking her system to stop it from shutting down. She slowly picks herself up and says that she already knows before looking at the outcome. Her mother finished her job and broke her heart. No more second chances ever again. Over with yet another of the new Teen Titans. Kid Flash Wallace West walks down the Santa Monica beach thinking to himself that he's always dreamed of coming to Cali to walk along the shore. It looks so cool in the movies. So here he is. If you can run faster than the speed of light, why not go places that he's always wanted to go? As Wallace skips a rock across the water, he hears an explosion going off in the distance. But before the sound can even fade, Wallace runs over to the pier to find out where it came from. However, what he finds is the people that he was least expecting. The Suicide Squad with Harley Quinn and El Diablo. Harley is also dragging a woman bound in chains. Harley says, Oh, would you look at that, the itty bitty flash! And Wallace shouts, asking, What are you doing to that woman? The woman screams for help, telling him that these people are crazy. And Harley tells her, Oh, no, 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 no! I'm crazy, El Diablo's just dangerous. Wallace quickly runs in, grabbing the woman and freeing her. And Harley asks, Why would you go and do something like that? El Diablo yells, El Stupido and he begins throwing fireballs at Wallace. As Wallace dodges the first, he's hit by the second, and Harley asks El Diablo if he could be a deer and go fetch their prisoner. El Diablo picks up the chain, asking, why am I always the one who has to chase him down? Harley tells him it's because she's wearing platform boots and is carrying around a really inefficient but super badass 30 pound mallet. Harley then looks at Wallace and says, listen up politically correct Flash, I've got a job to do. Leave Miss Harley to her business. Wallace gets up before Harley can hit him telling him, you know all about the Suicide Squad, Amanda Waller's our boss. And Harley shouts, fake news, no such thing. She then pulls out her knife and swings telling Wallace that he needs to stand still for a second while I stab you. Wallace stops and grabs Harley by the wrist and then using her free hand, Harley pulls out a gun, putting it to his neck. Before she can pull the trigger, El Diablo calls out that they have a problem. As both Wallace and Harley look back, they see the woman from before is now glowing. Harley says, well, that doesn't look good. And a second later, the woman explodes. Wallace quickly runs and moves all of the people back far enough to avoid being caught in the explosion. On the other side, Wally West, the red-headed one, runs in telling everyone that he would greatly appreciate it if they all moved back for now. Harley hands Wally her phone, stating that there's papers from the boss lady. He knows the deal. You want to tell the kid how it works? Wallace tells her, yeah, right. You must be dreaming if you think that we're going to. But Wally, the Flash, stops him as he scrolls to the phone, telling Wallace to stand down. Things aren't always so black and white. Harley swipes her phone back, telling him, right, well, we need to be going. And she slaps Wally on the butt, telling him, not a lot of men can pull off spandex. Way to keep it tight. If you ever want to get crazy, just give me a ring-a-ding. Wallace stares and asks what just happened, and Wally tells him that they'll talk. Just not here. 
Later that night, Wally takes Wallace out to eat and he tells him, look, I don't like the idea of the squad any more than you do, but for now, Barry says they get a pass. What the League says goes. Wallace says, heaven forbid anyone disagree with the almighty Justice League. Maybe you forgot, but the squad killed my father and my uncle? So why aren't you more upset about a bunch of renegade criminals running around with the government immunity? Wally tells him it's because he's old enough to understand that he doesn't know everything. And there's a lot of gray in what they do. Trust him on this. Barry would do the same. Wallace throws his napkin on the table and Wally calls the waitress over to order dessert, stating that his cousin here will have a serving of humble pie. <laughs> Wallace stands up telling him that that was corny as hell and Wally tells him that he's a kid. He needs to accept that there's room for improvement and he's got a lot to learn. Wallace snaps telling him, it's not what I gotta learn that I'm questioning, it's the people who are trying to teach me. As the two leave the restaurant, Wally asks, what the hell is that supposed to mean? And Wallace tells him, Barry, the Justice League, they're all high and mighty and so full of it, compromising their own values to let people like the Suicide Squad walk around. Wally says, whoa, how about a little respect? And Wallace tells him, sure, when he's earned it. Wally stops and tells him, look, one day you're gonna be an adult and you'll get to make the rules, but for now you're gonna have to trust and follow our leads. Wallace takes off telling him that that's where he's wrong. He's done compromising and he's not asking for permission. As Wallace heads back to the pier, he thinks working with Damien did have some benefits, like knowing when to place a tracker on El Diablo before leaving. Now all he has to do is follow that signal and get the girl away so that she can have a chance at rehabilitation. As he steps onto a boat where the signal's coming from, he quickly realizes that Harley and El Diablo weren't trying to recruit the girl, it was a hint. Wallace looks at all the blood on the ground and he sees a note left in the fridge stating, You dropped this! XOXO Harley! And below it, Wallace's tracker. He grabs the piece of paper telling himself that he's done listening to the grown-ups. From here on out, he's doing his own thing. And if anyone gets in his way, they're gonna be sorry. But meanwhile, back with our Robin, the guy who's going to be putting this together. In Gotham, Damien looks down at Urza and her family thinking that starting over was never easy. But it's a necessity to survive. It's not about getting another chance, it's what you do with it. Damien reaches back, grabbing his grappling hook, and he fires a stating that he's seen a way to do this whole hero thing better than his father and his friends. And he can't do it alone. He needs his own team. Not Grayson's hand-me-downs, powerhouses. Ones that are moldable and not so hung up on the rules. It's said that the children are the future. And the future is right now. Once these new Teen Titans are put together, there's gonna be hell to pay. Chanting fills the halls of the Church of Blood as they prepare their offerings for the night. Brother Blood raises his knife, telling the woman that he would like to thank her for her sacrifice. But before the knife could come down, he feels something hit his hand. He turns around and sees Robin call out to his new Teen Titans, Seek and Destroy! The Teen Titans get to work taking out the Church of Blood followers, but Kid Flash notices something. Most of the Church's members are just kids. Kid Flash says that maybe they should focus on Brother Blood and the adult, because they could be taking some sweet pics in the process. But just as Kid Flash goes in for a selfie, his phone is shot with an arrow and he yells, You got a problem with that, Hunger Games? Red Arrow pulls back her bow, telling him, You're unfocused and a distraction to the rest of the team. We are here to do a job. Robin calls out over the radio that Brother Blood is making an escape, but Red Arrow readies a shock arrow, stating that she's on it. Red Arrow jumps into the air as she fires, but Brother Blood begins to catch the arrow, telling her, Nice try. Just then, he crushes the arrow, and the electrical shock goes off stunning him. Down on the floor, Roundhouse bounces up the walls, jumping in to crush his arms, and she asks him, What the hell are you doing? Roundhouse tells her, Well, I just thought with your powers and my good looks, we could make one hell of a team. Crush laughs. Haha, <laughs> you like bowling? Because I'm gonna need you to shut up and roll. She grabs Roundhouse by the nostrils and throws him like a bowling ball into a group of followers. As most of the group is knocked away, Crush follows up, jumping and yelling, Make sure to stay some of the mouth breathers for me! As she lands, one of the followers then runs up from behind with a crowbar hitting her, and it just bends. She tells him, Man, my foster mother always told me that boys have a funny way of showing they like a girl. So if that was a love tap, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm not your type! A few moments later, after finishing up in the main hall, Robin, Kid Flash, and Arrow find Crush beating on a magical barrier, and Red Arrow asks, Did Lobo really have to breed? Bad enough there's already one of him. Crush punches away, asking, What is this? And Robin says, It's gotta be Jin. She must have trapped herself in with Brother Blood. Inside of the barrier, Jin is using her powers, telling Brother Blood that she can sense him. His thirst for power leads him astray. Brother Blood grabs her from behind, stating that he can smell the old world magic on her. And even a genie can become a slave like so many others have. As Brother Blood sinks his teeth into Jin, she tells him that he is a creature of habit. Just as she had hoped, this is what the humans call playing possum. And she can promise him that she will never be a slave again. Jin twists her head around using her powers to pull Brother Blood away, stating, 
You might be strong, but my power is something even you cannot dream of. Just as Jin begins to exert her power, she hesitates, stating, No, using too much power. Can't let him see. Can't let him find her. Brother Blood grabs her, asking, What is it that would scare something as powerful as you? Just then, Brother Blood hears a voice call out to him, and Roundhouse yells, You're gonna have to unhand her! Roundhouse rockets himself into Brother Blood, freeing Jin. And then Brother Blood looks up, with Robin kicking him in the face. Everyone gathers around, and Crush tells them, All right, let's bag this jerk and get out of here. Jin then tells her, Before we go, there's something I saw that Robin might be interested in. Jin points to the three bleeding claw mark carved into the stone. And Roundhouse asks, what's that? Robin tells everyone that that is the other. Every raid that they've conducted over the last month, this symbol has been present. All they know about this person is that they are dangerous and everywhere. Once everyone is taken into the church, Robin flips open a button stating that there is one last thing that they need to do. An epic walk away explosion. Later, at Mercy Hall in Brooklyn, the team winds down for the evening, but Robin is nowhere to be found. It's because he's deep below Mercy Hall in a chamber that the rest of the team doesn't know about. This place was used as Batman's safe house, but after some manufactured reports by Robin himself, Batman abandoned it. Mercy Hall serves two purposes. First, it's completely off the grid. And second, it used to be a juvenile delinquent facility. Robin grabs Brother Blood in a room and he asks, What are you doing? Why am I chained up? You're crazy! As Robin closes the vault door to his own personal Black Ops prison, a broken black mask tells him, You have no idea, man. Brother Blood looks around at the other criminals chained to the wall. Black Mass tells him, Welcome to hell! Now after having the raid on the church end so well, it was time for the Teen Titans to move on to their next target, Gizmo. Gizmo wants everyone to know that he's reformed and he opened up a toy store in Times Square, but the company is a front for his illegal weapons operations. When a shipment comes back as return to the warehouse, everyone wonders why. It's time for everyone to break out and get to work. Crush immediately jumps out of the box and tries to knock Gizmo out of the air, but before she can land a hit, Gizmo blasts her, sending her flying into a stack of boxes. Next up is Kid Flash and Roundhouse, but the second that they get close, Gizmo puts up a barrier blocking them out. Robin and Red Hood watch as the three try to get back up, and Red Arrow says that this is what they get for recruiting YouTube stars and egomaniacs. Robin takes out a small smoke bomb, tossing it, asking, How do you know it wasn't all a part of the plan? As the smoke surrounds Gizmo, Gizmo asks, who the hell are you kids? And Jin phases through telling him, It's not us that you should fear. She reaches out touching Gizmo and as she does, a swarm of bugs begin to crawl all over him and he screams for them to get off. Gizmo begins to swat at the imaginary bugs and Robin throws a battering knocking Gizmo out of his flyer. Everyone begins to gather around and Robin says, See? It all worked out. Kid Flash picks up Gizmo's body and as he does, the computer announces that the self-destruct protocol has been initiated. Roundhouse looks around at the flashing red lights and he says that he's pretty new to the superhero thing, but this isn't good, right? Robin tells them, picking up Gizmo's body must have triggered the self-destruct. Kid Flash. So Kid Flash throws Gizmo's body down with a thud. Robin then asks, what are you doing? Kid Flash tells him, I thought it might make it stop. Why would Gizmo want to blow up his whole operation anyway? He would die in the process. Robin then tells Crush and Jin to begin clearing out the toy store while he, Kid Flash, and Red Arrow deactivate the bomb. Roundhouse then clears his throat, stating, Well, you've forgotten about me. I'll just go roll with the ladies. He hurries into the store and yells to everyone that they have an emergency and everyone needs to leave, except it doesn't work and the kids continue to play with their toys. Crush then says that there's only one thing people understand. And Jin says, Fear. A giant magical dragon claws its way through the store, roaring, sending everyone into a panic. And back in the warehouse, Kid Flash runs through the place looking for the bomb, but he doesn't find anything. Robin kneels down and tells Kid Flash that he couldn't find Gizmo's bomb because Gizmo himself is the bomb. And Kid Flash says, okay, what's our next move? Red Arrow says, perfect. And Kid Flash says, how is it perfect? Gizmo's gonna die. So Red Arrow says, maybe Gizmo should have thought of that before he made himself into a bomb. And Kid Flash tells them, no, there's gotta be another way. So Robin says, well, the other plan is to have Crush throw Gizmo into the sun. Kid Flash shouts, can we think of a plan that doesn't involve Gizmo dying? And just then, Jin returns, stating, I may have an idea. I might be able to help, but it's a little complicated. To use my power in excess wood, Red Arrow says, You can't or you won't. Do something or get the hell out of the way. So Jin tells her, You do not speak to me in that manner. As I was saying, I could possess Gizmo and find out how to stop the bomb. However, for deep magic like that, it can only be performed if commanded. Robin asks, How? And Jin holds up her ring, stating, by a master, one who controls my soul with an object. Some Jin have bottles or pendants, mine is a ring. A ring that was my prison for thousands of years. I swore that I would never let anyone 
use it or me again. Robin tells her, we are out of options. Either you allow me to use that ring and I don't give it back or Red Arrow's going to shoot him. And Red Arrow says that she would gladly do that. Jin looks at her ring for a moment and then slides it off stating, I trust you with it, Robin. So Robin takes the ring, putting it on his finger. Okay, Jin, possess Gizmo. Jin grabs a hold of Gizmo's head and begins sifting through his memories on the construction of the bomb. And she says that the bomb is nuclear in nature and it's in his jetpack. But if they just try to remove it, it'll trigger the detonation. Robin tells them, we are running out of time. Dig deeper and find a way that doesn't have Gizmo dying. So Jin goes deeper and says that she could see Gizmo wanted his death to be the result of this altercation. With his death, he would lose his physical body and his mind would be uploaded to a digital space that he could live on forever. A few moments later, Jin comes out stating, we can't turn it off. The canister with the bomb in the pack pops out. So Robin tells Kid Flash, I need you, Atlantic Ocean, now! So Kid Flash picks it up and says, I can't. I'm too dehydrated to make that kind of a run, but I got an idea. He rushes outside, tossing Crush the bomb, telling her to throw it. And when she gets ready, Roundhouse stops her. He tells her that with the inert wind and weight of it, it won't clear the distance. It's too light. So throw Roundhouse. Crush asks, can you even breathe in space? Roundhouse says, well, we're about to find out, aren't we? So Crush throws Roundhouse into the air, and as the time counts down to one, the bomb explodes. Everyone else begins to come out, and Red Arrow asks, where is Roundhouse? So Kid Flash looks back and points up at the explosion. A week has passed, and the team gets ready for the day when Robin sits down, telling them that he wasn't ready. He should have known he wasn't ready. Crush, the individual that looks like she could be Lobo's daughter, tells him, well, she was the one who kind of threw the guy into space. She kind of liked him, though, in an annoying little brother kind of way. Kid Flash says, that guy is gone. Show some respect. Crush finishes pouring her bowl of cereal, telling him, Roundhouse knew the deal. He wanted to be a hero, and for a second he got to be one. Time to move on. Kid Flash knocks the bowl out of Crush's hand, shouting, Move on? It's barely been a week. How could you be so freaking cold? As the two look at each other, Red Arrow throws a knife between them, stating, It was unfortunate what happened, but inevitable. If we're going to work as a team, we need to train as a team to lower the chances of that ever happening again, starting now. So after breakfast, everyone heads out into the courtyard to undergo training from Red Arrow. But as each try, Red Arrow finds everyone's weaknesses exploiting it. The one without any power wins. Crush relies too much on brute force. Jin can be blinded and snared. Kid Flash's feelings can be manipulated into thinking that he actually hurt someone. Red Arrow helps everyone up, telling them that each of them is technically more powerful than her, but they are all undisciplined. They each attacked her one at a time, instead of working together because they assumed their powers would be enough. Crush dusts herself off, asking, if we're supposed to trade as a team, shouldn't Robin be here? And Red Arrow tells her, you can trust that when ready, Robin will be here. Until then, we're going to work together. Deep down in his underground prison though, Robin has been capturing the villains that they defeat, deciding that Batman's plan doesn't work. He needs his own black site prison. And he drops a plate of food for Black Mask, telling him, you're a businessman. How about we make a deal? The trust fund that you have set up for your illegitimate son? What would happen if it suddenly runs dry for him? What happens if his around the clock caregivers stop getting paid? Black Mask struggles against his chain, shouting, Leave my son out of this! And Robin says, The other. I know he's real. Black Mask yells, All there are is stories. Some say he's a man, others say he's a god. Some even say he's the devil himself. Robin walks off eating Black Mask's apple, telling him, I'm not interested in stories. And Black Mask tells him, This one isn't a story. I did hear about a job before getting locked up. Later, at Roosevelt Children's Hospital, the team begins to position themselves as Robin and Jin head inside of the security room. Once the guards are put to sleep, Jin says that she would like to thank him for returning her ring. Sometimes the lingering effects of being able to control someone is intoxicating. But as he puts up a wall to protect himself, she can understand the necessity to do so. So if he ever needs to talk, she's there for him. Robin asks, what exactly would I need to talk about? And Jin says, anything you wish. Red Arrow radios in that they know their comms are open, right? And Crush says, GROSS! Red Arrow then says that team romances never end well. And Crush says, especially ones that involve tiny tyrants. Red Arrow then goes on stating that it doesn't matter who or why, work and personal lives should remain separate. Crush then asks, what if you don't have a personal life? And Red Arrow tells her, abstain. Crush laughs, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm a hero, not a nun. 
And just then, the alert goes off that someone with camouflage just went in. Robin tells Kid Flash to get some recon, but do not engage. Kid Flash zips around the hospital, locating the target, and overhears a girl stating, The deal was nobody gets hurt. We can't do this if... Kid Flash grabs the girl by the arm, stating, From the sounds of it, you don't really want to do this, huh? There's still some time to walk away. But as he says, that golden glider jumps through the wall with a bag full of stolen medical supplies, and Kid Flash asks, Shouldn't you be in Iron Heights? Golden Glider wraps him up, stating, yeah, she should be. But they can't really deal with any heat right now, so take him out, Swerve. Swerve points her gun, stating, he's just a kid, though. But before she could pull the trigger, she's hit with a battering. What part of recon only did you not understand? Golden Glider sighs, stating, we should have taken him out when we had a chance. I'm not going back to prison. See ya, kiddos. As she goes to escape, Swerve grabs a nurse and runs to the top to escape. Everyone rushes out onto the roof with Swerve stating, It wasn't supposed to happen like this. I got shot in my third tour and had to get a blood transfusion. The blood that they used must have been meta blood because I got these camouflage powers. After I got back home from risking my life for this country over and over, I had no job or support. I can't sleep. I barely eat. I only agreed to do this so I can pay my damn rent. I don't want to hurt anyone. Red Arrow pulls back on her bow, stating, Bull! And Kid Flash asks, Didn't you hear her? She's a victim in this too! Red Arrow tells him, We all have a choice. Like how she almost killed you before Robin saved your butt. Life is rough for us all. If we let her go and she kills, that's on us. And after what happened to Roundhouse, do you really want more blood on our hands? Red Arrow releases the arrow, pulling the gun from Swerve's hand and knocking her off balance and over the ledge. She then tells Crush and Jin to show them what they got. Crush jumps over the ledge, grabbing onto Swerve, and just before they can hit the ground, Jin creates a pile of flowers to fall onto. Crush asks, Flowers? Really? I hate flowers! Now Jello would have been super cool, Jin. As everyone gets ready to leave, Kid Flash thinks to himself that Red Arrow is right. He does have blood on his hands. That is why, since he was the one who brought Roundhouse to the team, he will be the one to step up and tell Roundhouse's parents. So after the mission completes, he takes a break from all the hero stuff to go there. He knocks on the door to Roundhouse's parents' house in Long Island. The door opens. Kid Flash sees something he didn't expect to see. Roundhouse. What the? Roundhouse? Roundhouse steps out of the door, eating a chicken wing, telling him, Oh, hey, what's up, man? Gotham City has seen its fair share of crime, and the media is starting to get restless on what the GCPD are planning to do to fight it. The news and the press gather outside the GCPD to ask Commissioner Gordon what he plans to do to fight this never-ending battle. Just before he can give them an answer, though, there's a gunshot and Jim Gordon falls to the ground. Meanwhile, over at the Wu residence in Long Island, Kid Flash is staring at Roundhouse going, You're alive? Roundhouse bites down on the chicken wing, telling him, Barely. My mom nearly killed me when I went off the grid. She's scarier than that brother blood guy. Kid Flash shouts, How did you survive the nuclear blast? And Roundhouse tells him, Oh, that? It ain't nothing a little igneous theory can't handle. Anyways, come on in before the pop starts tripping that I'm letting all the AC out. We have some kombucha on tap if you... Kid Flash grabs Roundhouse yelling, What the hell, man? We all thought you were dead. This whole time you've been sitting here eating chicken wings and playing video games? Roundhouse presses the button on his suit, turns into a ball to free himself, shouting, Hey, I landed on the other side of the planet and my phone melted. There was no way I was going to be able to contact anyone since half the team hasn't even followed me back on Insta. It's not like anyone would even care. Kid Flash begins to get up, stating, Well... I did. It really messed me up, man. Roundhouse helps him up and tells him, Well, I didn't know. My bad. Kid Flash tells him, Yeah, I'm sorry too. Kid Flash begins to pick up some of the furniture that was knocked over by Roundhouse when he finds a picture of Roundhouse and another girl about his age. He asks him, Is this your sister? And Roundhouse says, Was. Long story. Just before Kid Flash could ask more, though, he gets a distress call from Robin telling him to get to Gotham. Roundhouse asks, Is that Robin? Tell him hi for me. So Kid Flash grabs Roundhouse and tells him, You can tell Robin yourself. Within seconds, Kid Flash and Roundhouse make their way into Gotham where they find the police surrounding Gordon's body. The officer tells them to stay back. They have medical on the way, but Kid Flash pushes himself through, stating, There's no time. It'll be faster if... But before Kid Flash could leave, Gordon says, Psst. Roundhouse asks, did the guy with the mortal face injury just hiss at us? Gordon smiles, and as his voice changes, Jin says, Ah, Roundhouse, you're not dead. How lovely. Kid flashes, wait, Jin, you're in Commissioner Gordon's body? And she tells him, of course not. That would be powerful magic. I merely conjured the illusion of his form. Commissioner Gordon was being targeted for an assassination, and Robin thought to make the attempt appear successful. The real Gordon is at home in a deep slumber with the help of a minor spell. Roundhouse then says, maybe we should, like, not be here anymore. There's a lot of reporters, and they might question why we're speaking to the dead guy. 
Kid Flash runs back into the alleyway so that Jin can change back and asks where the rest of the team is. Jin conjures up a map stating that they're currently tracking the assassin. They are to meet back and rendezvous with the team at this location. So a short while later, across town, Crush looks down from a building stating, This lady, Vic, seems real casual for someone who thinks that they just killed a guy. Red Arrow tells her that some assassins have rituals for when they complete their jobs. Her mother would go get a manicure. Kid Flash and Jin arrive, and just behind them, Roundhouse bounces in shouting, What's up, players? Everyone runs over with Crush yelling, Hey, you're not dead! Badass! But while everyone is welcoming back Roundhouse, Robin tells them all to be quiet. They're still on a mission, and Roundhouse, Where the hell have you been? Kid Flash says, well, you see, his mom grounded him. And Red Arrow says, grounded? Are we in kindergarten? Roundhouse tells her, hey, I'm not sure about your parents, but mine don't play around. As everyone celebrates Roundhouse's return, Lady Vic overhears and makes a break for it. Crush jumps off the building onto a car, and Red Arrow follows, stating, that's not very subtle. Crush tells her, you ain't seen nothing yet. And she picks up the smashed car and throws it down the street. As the car comes crashing down, Lady Vic spins her gun back and asks, do I know you? And Red Arrow kicks the gun from her hand, telling her, I doubt it. Lady Vic pulls out a second gun, stating, you may have some skills, but you're not exactly Superman. She begins to fire, but Crush jumps in the way, telling her, Superman can bite me. I'm Crush. Just then a battering is thrown, disarming Lady Vic's second gun, and Crush grabs her, stating, see, nothing to worry about. Lady Vic reaches down to the gun on her ankle and fires a shot into the gas that spilled onto the ground from the car that crushed through, setting off a massive explosion. Roundhouse turns himself into a ball, throwing himself into the air to catch Crush, but as Lady Vic gets back up, she takes out another set of guns. While everyone is trying to get to cover, there's a plink sound as a grenade is thrown behind her. Robin yells for her to watch out and throws himself onto the grenade. As he braces for the explosion, it doesn't come. He opens his eyes to look down and see a flower. And Jin tells him that she appreciates the attempt at protection, but she has methods of dealing with these kinds of things. Crush points over at the building, stating that Lady Vic went in there if anyone's interested. We can go in there and... So Robin jumps in front of her, telling her that she isn't the one calling the shots. Her car stunt almost got a lot of people seriously hurt. It doesn't matter how strong she is, if she can't figure out how to be a team player, that she could find a new team. Is that understood? The Teen Titans clear out the building and corner Lady Vic in a room. But as Robin kicks in the door, everyone freezes. Inside, Lady Vic's body hangs from a set of knives that she was stabbed with, and the word boom written across her in the wall. Robin looks closer and sees claw marks on the wall and asks if this is the work of the other. Roundhouse reads boom, asking what that could mean, and it's that very second. The entire building explodes. The blast knocks everyone outside, with Robin beginning to cough as he slowly begins to wake up. He turns on his flashlight with Crush yelling, hey, unless you want the rest of the building to fall on us, get that flashlight out of my eyes, bat kid. Kid Flash starts to get up, but as he moves his leg, he sees a piece of scrap metal lodged in it. Kid Flash says that he should be able to vibrate this thing out, but Robin yells at him not to. The smallest disruption could bring the whole building down. A few moments later, Roundhouse thrusts his arm up, yelling, I'm here. Oh, good. Well, maybe not good. Robin begins to call out for Jin, but after a few minutes, Jin pulls herself out of the debris, stating that she's there, but she regrets that she was unable to protect them all. Robin lets out a sigh of relief, stating, all that matters is that you're all okay. And Crush begins to struggle, stating, yep, doing great over here. You uh, wanna do something now? Red Arrow tells Jin that maybe they should teleport them out or something, but she tells him she can't. There's limits to her abilities. Red Arrow pauses. What are you talking about? You literally dove into a man's brain the other day. What do you mean you have limits? Jin says that it's complicated. So Red Arrow yells, either you do it or we die. What's complicated about that? Kid Flash says, actually, I'm with Arrow on this one. So Robin asks, it's the ring, isn't it? Give it to me. I promise I'll give it back, just like last time. Jin tells him it's not about her ring. It's something else. They don't understand. If she uses so much magic so soon, Robin tries to egg her on. Come on, Jin. I thought we... But she screams, no! And the entire building begins to shake. Crush falls down onto her knee, stating, All right, everyone, listen up. I don't really like people, and truth be told, I barely like any of you. But if I drop this building right now, I can tell you for sure who's going to live through it and grab themselves a slice. This girl. Jin's got a secret. So what? She can get mine. Each of us have our secrets. Each of us have our family problems. We're all messed up. Come to the territory. Enough of this BS. Robin got us into this mess. You are sure as hell going to get us out. Silence fills the air, and after a few minutes of thinking, Robin says, Okay, we already did a full sweep of the building. We know no one's inside. Gotham's finest are undoubtedly already on the scene, so we're gonna need to find a way to get out without exposing ourselves. There are rats heading somewhere beneath us, likely towards water, which means Gotham's sewers should be right beneath us. If Roundhouse could... And Roundhouse asks, what, get dense? With the best of them, see ya, shorty. 
Kid Flash says, okay, sounds like we're gonna need some super speed. How the hell am I supposed to run with this piece of metal stuck in me? Red Arrow leans in smiling, stating, hey. Kid Flash pauses for a second and says, wait, you never smile, especially at me, what are you? Just then she grabs the metal, ripping it out of his leg with him screaming, ah, you're crazy. And she tells him, you're welcome. Robin tosses Roundhouse a few explosive charges and tells him to set them at his feet. They aren't gonna have much time when they go off. So he sets the charges under a layer of rocks, putting his weight down on them as Red Arrow fires and the arrow sets them off. The explosion begins to go off around them with Roundhouse focusing his weight onto the weaker parts of the floor and the team begins to fall through. A hole is blown open in the ceiling of the sewers with everyone coming crashing down into the water. After pulling themselves out of the sewer and taking some much needed showers, everyone begins to relax, except Red Arrow. Inside Jin's room, Red Era lets herself in, telling Jin that she's not sure what the hell is so complicated about her magic, but it endangered everyone. She chose to keep a secret instead of helping the team when they needed her most. She grabs Jin by the arm, telling her, you are going to tell us what the hell is going on right now or you're leaving this team and never coming back. Jin looks back and states, I asked you not to address me in such a manner. Before Red Arrow realizes that she is floating and she feels a pressure at her throat, and in a different kind of voice, Jin tells her, There is something that you don't seem to understand. I have made kings and queens, puppeteered great wars, eradicated empires older than words could record. I do not respond well to threats. If you knew the things that I was truly capable of, we wouldn't be here right now. It is well within my power to make your life worse than nightmares that could haunt a cold heart like yours, Emiko Queen. Red Arrow struggles to gasp for air, and Jin tells her, That's right. I have no secrets from you. So leave. As Red Arrow is thrown into a wall, she finally inhales air that she was gasping for and wakes up in her bed. She looks around asking, Did that really happen? And with no one to answer her, Red Arrow quietly lays back down to bed, unable to get to sleep. Deep below Mercy Hall, the current headquarters of the Teen Titans, there's a smile that comes across Robin's face. This prison that he built, it's dark, it's cold, it smells. Everything a real prison could ever hope to be. But it must remain a secret. Not many could even stomach what it takes to succeed, except for the one person that has learned his secret. Prior to this, Robin led the team on a covert mission to obtain something within the Batcave itself. Roundhouse steps into the giant halls asking if this is really the Batcave. Also, the Batcave is real? Kid Flash tells him, hold up, why are we here? And Robin tells him because they're gonna steal from Batman. My source has been compromised. It's clear the others reach in the criminal underworld may be wider than anticipated. If we're going to fight this, we're gonna have to level the playing field and take Batman's most powerful tool, information. Robin then tells Roundhouse that they're going to need full backdoor access to Batman's computers. While they work on that, he has something else to deal with. Roundhouse begins to get to work, but while everyone crowds around the computer, Crush looks around, noticing Jin is missing. Just then, an alarm goes off, and Red Arrow asks, what did he do? Roundhouse asks, would you believe me if I told you nothing? Meanwhile, upstairs, Robin passes a portrait of Thomas and Martha Wayne, with Alfred stating that he remembers the day that they set for that painting. Welcome home, Master Damien. You should know, Master Bruce spends many a sleepless night thinking of you and your well-being. Robin pulls up his hood, stating, that man barely sleeps anyway. But as he walks away, Alfred stops him, stating, you shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. Robin starts to state, I didn't. And Alfred stops him, telling him, I also don't appreciate someone going through my things. I cannot allow you to leave with what you took. Robin asks, why are you protecting him? And Alfred tells him, because Jason is your brother. I'm going to do for him what I would do for any of you. Just then the alarms reach the main floor and Robin says, it sounds like you're needed down in the Batcave. Alfred sighs, telling him, Oh, Master Damien, it's being handled. Down in the cave, Roundhouse says, I got good news. I stopped the alarm. Should be smooth sailing from here on out. But that's when from above them, Batman leaps out of the shadows. Back upstairs, Robin tells Alfred to move. Red Hood betrayed me. I'm just doing what father should have done a long time ago. Alfred tells him, Jason's methods may be unorthodox, but he is a part of this family and on the side of good. Do not presume malice in what is perhaps a miscommunication. Talk to him. Do not make rash decisions that you may regret later. Robin leaves walking down the halls of the Batcave, passing all of the portraits of everyone. When he looks up at the painting of Bruce and all the others, he scoffs, continuing on his way. But behind him, Jin is watching from afar. Down below, Kid Flash runs through the cave, yelling to Batman, You know us! Stop this! Something's not right here! Over by the giant penny, Roundhouse is hiding, praying to God that if he survives, he will limit himself to only playing two, maybe three hours of Fortnite a night if they make it out of here. 
Batman starts to walk closer when Robin jumps through, cutting off Batman's head. Roundhouse screams as Batman's head bounces on the floor, but then everyone notices the circuitry hanging from the neck. Roundhouse shouts, asking what just happened, and Robin tells him, it's a rare case where Batman wasn't here. There are security measures in place. But when everyone gets ready to leave, Red Arrow asks Jin where she's been the whole time. She thinks about it for a moment and says that she must be mistaken. I was here the whole time, Red Arrow. Back in the current time, our current day, Robin hears his name being called out. And in that moment of not paying attention, Black Mask reaches towards Robin with a makeshift ship. A Red Arrow shoots past him and into Black Mask's hand, and Red Arrow says that she thought they were in this together. That mission they went on, that was a distraction, wasn't it? What were you really doing there? Why keep me in the dark? Robin picks up the shiv, telling her, It was, a uh, family business. Red Arrow then says that she knew working with Red Hood was a bad idea. He was the one who tipped them off about Gordon, but the other knew they were coming when they went for Lady Vic. So Robin tells her, I know. Trusting Red Hood was an error in my judgment. Red Hood is in league with the other. And Red Arrow says that, or he is the other. As the two head back up to the loft, Robin takes out a small box stating that their mission was to retrieve this. And with it, Red Hood will no longer be a problem. Later that night, Robin follows a stumbling Jason Ton out of a bar. He didn't want to confront him like this, but things need to be taken care of. He sits on a stool next to Red Hood and he tells him, You look like crap. And Red Hood asks, Are you even old enough to be in here, Damien? Robin laughs, stating that the law states that minors can be in businesses that serve alcohol as long as they are accompanied by an adult. So that's you! And we need to talk. Red Hood grabs his beer, telling him, No, we don't. Besides, you're already too late. The old man already found me. Told me what happened to Sanctuary. Red Hood then pulls out a dart and lines up his throw, stating, You better find out who killed Roy, or I will. The dart is thrown, and Red Hood says, I was very clear how this works, Damien. You come to me, not the other way around. And Robin tells him, We have a situation. Lady Vic is dead. The other killed Vic before my team could get her. They blew up the whole building with us inside. We barely got it alive. Red Hood asks, Is everyone okay? And Robin tells him, Yeah, but perhaps you were expecting otherwise? Hoped maybe we would all die? Red Hood then asks, what are you talking about? And Robin tells him, someone knew we were coming, and I know who. It was you. Robin whips his arm back with the dart stabbing into Red Hood's leg. And Red Hood shouts, asking, are you crazy or something? A second later, Robin is thrown out of the bar, and as he gets up, he quickly changes into his costume with Red Hood storming out, yelling, what the hell do you think you're doing? Robin jumps up, throwing batarang, telling him, I know it was a setup. Nobody knew we were trying to stop Lady Vic other than you. You're the one who gave us the mission. Robin starts swinging, but Red Hood catches his arm, stating, Don't do this. Robin then jumps onto Red Hood's back, ripping off his mask, stating, I am going to take you down for good. After an electrically charged hit to the face, Red Hood falls. Robin tells him, Say it. Say you're working with the other. You've got enough of your own sins. You're not going to get me to confess to something I didn't do. Robin then asks, You want to keep playing games? Okay, let's play. He then takes out the small box that he got from the mansion. Red Hood looks up at it, stating, What's in there is my business. It's bigger than this whole crusade. Even Batman wouldn't stoop this low. Robin tells him, Say the truth, now! Red Hood tells him, You want the truth? Now I'm pissed! He smacks the box out of Robin's hand, and as Robin tries to run for it, Red Hood grabs him by the cape, flinging him into a truck. He takes out both his fists, cracking Robin in the back, telling him, I would ditch the cape if I were you. Robin laughs, stating that he's done taking lessons from him. And Red Hood picks him up by the hair, punching him, telling him, Next time, you need to check your facts. You always think you're the smartest one in the room. And there's some truth to that, but you're still just a kid with a lot to learn. Red Hood then finishes with a knee to the face, and as Robin falls, he tells him, Consider this one final lesson. Don't start a fight you can't finish. Robin leans up, opening his vest, showing a bomb, shouting, Even if I lose, I'm gonna win! Red Hood stares up for a moment, and then he smiles. <laughs> nice bluff. We've both been dead once before, but you lost the minute you showed up. I'm not working for the other. In time, you'll understand that. But from here on out, if you and your team come looking, I will put you all into the ground. As Red Hood picks up the box, he leaves. And elsewhere, the other watches. Even later that night at Mercy Hall, Robin tosses in his bed groaning with Jin asking what's wrong. He tells her nothing, and Jin says that she's here to help him. He needs to be honest with himself. So he gets up stating that he just misjudged something, that's all. And Jin tells him, ah... I can see it now. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Robin spins back shouting, I am not! But in doing so, it causes him enough pain to fall to his knees. She kneels beside him, telling him that she can heal his physical wounds, but he needs to let her in. The body and the soul are more connected than he might realize. 
This requires trust. He swats her hand away, stating, Trust is a commodity I can't afford. I would expect you to understand that more than anyone on this team. She places her hand on his shoulder, telling him that he withholds from the team for the greater good. But his wounds are severe enough that they require attention, either from her magic or a physician's hand. So what are his barriers worth to him? Will he maintain them at the cost of his life? He shuffles in the bed, stating that he'll be fine. He just needs rest. As he sits on the bed, Jin says that he had absolute power with her ring and he chose to return it to her. She trusts him. If she heals him, he will need to trust her. That is why she will share with him one of her own secrets, her greatest shame. 4,000 years ago, there was a tale that angels were created from light and Jin was created from smokeless fire. Her brothers existed before man walked this earth, but she was born in a time of humanity. She is Scylla, a female Jin, rare amongst her kind. Shrines were built to her, sacrifices made in her name. It wouldn't be long before she drew the attention of the eldest of them, the most powerful Jin there is and ever was. His name was Elias, and he was the most beautiful thing that she had ever seen. He opened her eyes to the truth of all things, but the Creator made them to be subjugated to the will of humanity, to a life of servitude, not gods, but slaves. Elias taught them that they could fight back, and they did. They fought against those wishing to control them. Eventually, their mission took them to Maka, the mother of all cities. They were there to retrieve the infamous Stone of Souls. It was a stone that was said to have descended from heaven itself. As they prepared for the fight of their lives, they found the stone's protectors were mere children. She refused to kill them, and Elias grew angry. He questioned her loyalty to him and their kind. So she turned and used her magic to stop him, and her other brothers fled with the stone. She cast a protective spell upon the children, but for betraying Elias, she would be punished. Instead of killing her, he did something far worse. He took her ring and made it into a prison. He then commanded her to kill every one of the last children she tried to protect. But her punishment had only begun. He never stopped looking for the stone, and over the thousands of years, he lended her ring to other masters who might help him achieve his goal. But a year ago, the unexpected happened. A young boy stole the ring from his master and gave her back her freedom. Since then, she's had to hide her powers in fear that Elias would come back. Jin looks at Robin and asks, Do you hate me for knowing my secret? He tells her that he's not really in a position to judge. She isn't the only one who's done things that will follow them forever. He's hurt people too, taken lives. But he's always had a choice. She can't blame herself. He then takes off his mask, telling her that she isn't alone. My name is Damien Wayne. And Jin says that it's nice to meet him. As the two begin to get closer to kiss, there's a beep coming from Robin's mask. He looks at the visor, and an image of Deathstroke comes on the lens. Jin asks what's the matter, and the words, Deathstroke escapes Arkham, begin to flash. So he puts on the visor, stating, Everything. Robin can see it in his dreams. He can see his face, Deathstroke, and he's killed everyone. He screams as he wakes up from his nightmare and he tries to wash his face, but he can see Deathstroke's face in the mirror too, and he lashes out, punching the glass. Just then, Jin comes in asking what's wrong. She heard the screaming. She kneels down behind him, asking if it's that man again. Is he sure that he must do this now? Robin looks at the blood dripping from his knuckles. He knows what he must do. He must take down Deathstroke. The next morning, Robin gathers the team together to go over their next target, Slade Wilson, or commonly known as Deathstroke. He is an agent for the other, and this is their chance to finally stop him. Kid Flash says that this just isn't some street level criminal like Gizmo or Black Mask and Red Arrow adds, yeah, but for once Kid Flash is thinking and he's right. We're not ready to handle someone on that level, Robin, not yet. We need more time. But Robin tells them that they don't have more time. Every day can mean another body on the ground. Everyone has gone up against him at one point or another. He nearly killed the original Teen Titans years ago. But it's the same thing every time. Deathstroke somehow walks away. Even when he threw himself into another dimension to try and bring his son back from the dead. The image then changes on the screen to a woman and her daughter. And Robin goes on stating, This is Sophia Evans, eight years old. Her mother was Deathstroke's therapist at Arkham Asylum. She's dead now. This is what Deathstroke does, and I intend on stomping it. But to succeed where the Justice League and the old Teen Titans failed, we must work together. So, later that day in Covington, Georgia, Deathstroke goes to his usual barber shop to get a shave and a cut. The barber Len tells me he's right on time. Getting the usual again? Well, have a seat to relax. We'll get you cleaned up. So Deathstroke gets ready to sit, and he tells him, Yeah, relaxing can be deadly in my line of work. Makes you miss things. Like when I walked in, I was told right on time, except it wasn't. Early is on time, and on time is late, Colonel. That's what Len always used to say. 
Deathstroke then breaks the leg of the man sitting down with the newspaper and he grabs a lens arm, throwing him into the mirror. He begins to systematically take down each of the people in the shop, turning all of the gadgets they had prepared against him. As Jin's spell fades, Deathstroke looks at the Teen Titans telling Robin, Just give it up, but I will say you got a set on you, boy. Robin calls out to Crush that she's up, and a second later she bursts through the wall swinging. Deathstroke easily dodges the attack, telling her that even with all of that strength, everyone has pressure points, just like this. So he pinches a specific spot on Crush's neck. She falls to the ground, asking, What the hell did you do? Roundhouse charges in, shouting for him to get away, but Deathstroke uses a small taser, shorting out the semiconductors in Roundhouse's suit. Kid Flash then runs in, punching Deathstroke to the ground, telling him, STOP HURTING MY FRIENDS! And Deathstroke laughs, You are so predictable. You know that the Icon suit stores energy, right? As the charge is released, there's a loud KABOOM! And the shock shorts out the conductors in Roundhouse's suit, completely knocking him out. Deathstroke starts to get back up holding a knife, but before he can fully stand, he suddenly falls to the ground. Behind him is Robin, holding a small knife covered in blood, stating that they got him. Red Arrow tells everyone that the cops are on their way, they gotta move out. But Kid Flash says, No, not until I see Deathstroke taken away. And Jin then calls out that there's something wrong with Roundhouse. He can't keep the shape of his body together. Kid Flash runs over shouting that they have to get him into his other suit. as a backup in his room. Are you sure you got this? Robin tells him. Oh yeah, trust me. Deathstroke will make it to his final destination. A short while later. Deathstroke wakes up when he hears the sounds of chains and quiet murmur. He opens his eye to see Robin, and then he lunges, feeling the chains holding him in place. Robin stands over him, smiling, telling him, Welcome to my prison. Today I did what Batman never could. No more cheating the system or getting out of good behavior. The revolving door is closed. Forever. Deathstroke sits back, getting comfortable, asking, Is that so? How is the old man anyway? Have you really thought about this? How this is going to end? Of course you haven't. This is a plan only a child would come up with. The only reason I'm still here is because I want to be here. Robin turns back shouting, If you're so good, then escape! And Deathstroke tells him, Nah, I'm gonna stay away. Robin then asks, Why would you do that? And Deathstroke looks him right in the eyes and states, So that I can fix you. Just then the sound of someone coming can be heard. Robin calls out to Red Arrow, but it isn't Red Arrow. Kid Flash runs through the prison shouting to Robin, What is this place? The next day, Deathstroke is strung up, forced to watch the news of the people that he's murdered. He watches, telling himself, This kid, he's gone too far. He struggles to free himself, and his son, Joseph, contacts him, asking how he's doing. Deathstroke tells him that he's fine. Robin may have taken his suit, but this isn't something where I couldn't just break my own arm and create enough slack in the cable so that I could get out. As he begins to short out the cell door, Joseph asks, You're not gonna hurt the kids, are you? And Deathstroke says, the only way that they would have gotten this kind of information would be for my own son. So you sold out your father and you're worried about them? Joseph tells him, actually, yeah, pretty much. You need a pickup? Deathstroke gently pushes open the door, asking, says, when did I need your help? Meanwhile, in Bronx, Bradley Glenn, the villain known as Black Rock, sits in a hospital with his dying mother in priest. He prays with his mother one last time, kissing her forehead, telling her that he will make him pay for this. Outside, Robin and the team are getting ready to move in to capture Black Rock when suddenly Robin hears a familiar voice over the comms. Red Arrow radios in that they should grab him now, and Robin tells her to wait. Also switch to channel B. The voice says, that's not gonna work. Only you can hear this. Black Rock walks out of the hospital with a bag and his head hung low, and Red Arrow watches, stating, he's not heading to his car? The voice returns, telling Robin, you should have listened to Red Arrow. Your concept is sound, but the system is broken. It's like trying to take out the trash with clean hands. Red Arrow can take the shot right now and put it through his skull. Robin radios to Kid Flash, telling him that he's up. Disarm him now! Kid Flash runs in, grabbing the bag off of Black Rock so he can't activate his suit. But as the bag is removed, it pulls a pin, detonating it. The voice comes back, but this time in Kid Flash's ear. The bag was a decoy. That's why he was carrying it. You have about one second, a lifetime for a speedster. That wasn't a security cable, it was a suicide rig. Too late to save everyone now, but you can outrun it before it's ripped apart. The explosion goes off and Kid Flash shouts to the other, It's him! It's Deathstroke! The blast goes off and Black Rock turns on the suit to protect himself, shouting, You stupid kids! You stupid, stupid, stupid kids! You ruined everything! Robin tells the others that they need to quickly subdue Black Rock while tending to those affected by the blast. Deathstroke tells Robin that he should have taken Black Rock while he was inside. And Robin says, This means that you escaped? Deathstroke brushes his teeth, telling him, Nope. Just tapped into your satellite feed, watching the circus. 
Crush charges in, but Blackrock punches her in the face, launching her across the garage. Roundhouse screams for Crush, but Deathstroke says that it sounds like it's all falling apart now. Roundhouse is acting emotionally. Even though he knows Lobo's daughter can take the hit, he's not even stopping to wonder why Blackrock is running into the garage. Maybe he left something in his car, but those people trapped, they're gonna have to leave them. Let them die so you can protect the secret. That's discipline. For the greater good, let them die. Deathstroke then heads back to his cell with Black Mask telling him, At last, Deathstroke, our leader, has finally come to bust us out. Together we will destroy those damned kids. Deathstroke pauses for a moment and then says, Okay, sure. Back at the hospital, Jin starts to lift the rubble trapping the car and Blackrock shouts to everyone to just get out of the way. Robin tells him to just give up. He's not escaping and he asks, Escape? You idiot! We've got to save those people, you snot-nosed kids! I was trying to turn myself in! My mother is dying in there, and there's only one man responsible for that. Me! The priest talked me out of suicide, convinced me to go to the cops, and then you punks came along. Once Jin gets everyone to safety, Robin gives the call for everyone to retreat. And later, as Robin heads to Deathstroke's cell, he finds Deathstroke sitting there eating a burger while watching the news. He tells him that he should actually go after the people that he's pissed at. Batman and Ra's al Ghul. Wait, they don't know what you've been up to, do they? Fascinating. Especially after how you handled Blackrock. Sparks from the trapped car ignite the gas line that Jin ruptured when she lifted all of the debris. The only one who could hear that deafening roar was his former protege in slow motion. He had what? 10 milliseconds to save Blackrock? He only needed to extend his speed force aura around Blackrock. Was he following orders or defying them? Maybe you should have let Blackrock die, or maybe not. Either way, you flinched, Robin. Robin asks, What did you mean by you were gonna fix me? How? And Deathstroke tells him, It's simple. You're going to kill. However, the day prior, we return to the moment that Kid Flash learned of Robin's secret prison, the place he's been bringing all of the prisoners that they've been capturing. As the two head up the elevator, Robin says that he shouldn't have seen that. It's not for you. And Kid Flash says that he's sorry for having some questions, like why is every criminal that we've taken down locked up beneath our headquarters? Robin tells him that it's complicated, but Kid Flash tells him, No! It's insane! I put a tracer on Deathstroke to make sure that he went to jail. Turns out, I shouldn't have trusted you! The elevator door dings, and Red Arrow looks in, stating, Great! Kid Flash knows. Spectacular! Kid Flash scoffs, stating, Of course she's a part of this! We're teammates in all of this, and I'm voting that we tell the others about it. Robin tells him, No! There is no prison out there that can hold Deathstroke. Until we figure out what we're gonna do with him, we can't risk telling the others. So a short while later, Robin and Red Arrow train, but all Robin can think about is what Deathstroke said. I'm gonna fix you. Robin throws a battering, cutting the string on Red Arrow's bow and grabs her from behind. He begins to choke her out just as he tried with Deathstroke, but Red Arrow headbutts him asking, what the hell is the matter with you? I know Deathstroke's in your head. I watched the security footage. Are you tempted by his offer? Robin tells her, we were both raised to kill. We both have blood on our hands. And Red Arrow says, of course, but we've broken those patterns, haven't we? Meanwhile, up at the pigeon coop, Crush tends to the birds when Roundhouse comes in asking what's up. She looks over and asks, does he think that Robin and Jin are off somewhere together? And Roundhouse eats his popcorn, stating, who knows? Worst team dating secret ever, right? Crush blushes and looks away, but Roundhouse says, oh, I get it now. You got a thing for Robin. But she laughs, ha <laughs> no, not Robin, Jin. Roundhouse then asks, wait, you like girls or something? And Crush tells him, yeah, she does. Roundhouse sighs, oh, you never told us. And then Crush takes the popcorn, stating, you never asked. I thought that Jin might know how I felt, but what if she doesn't feel the same? Roundhouse tells her, you'll just have to deal with it. Trust me, I can reject it all the time. It's no biggie. But you gotta tell her how you feel, because if you don't, well, that's on you. Later, Crush knocks on Jin's door, and Jin answers, stating, it's delightful to see you. Crush shyly looks away, stating, uh, there's something I gotta tell you, and it's, I, I like you. Jin smiles. Well, I like you too. And Crush tells her, it's not like that. I, I like you like... She then just leans in and kisses Jin, but rather than pulling away, Jin accepts it, kissing back. Crush leans back, stating, yeah, so think on that for a minute. As she walks away, Robin returns to see Jin floating there, and he says that he's sorry for being late. But, uh, Jin, are we doing this healing session? He walks in, and Jin snaps out of her daze, and he takes off his mask, stating that he's got a question. In her experience, is killing another human ever justified? She tells him in a particular or dire circumstance, sometimes it's the only way. But her experience has led her to view death differently. Robin looks at himself in the mirror, stating that he died once, and Jin tells him that she knows. It's marked upon his soul. 
Often death is not the end, but a new beginning. Trust her when she says that there are far worse fates than death. Later in the prison armory, Kid Flash walks in while Red Arrow goes through the pulleys asking how does she do it. All of this, the secrets, the lies they've told. How is she so cold? Red Arrow says, does he really think that it's that easy? That she wants to do this? He had a normal life before he got his powers. He had choices. Her mother taught her to be one thing. The least that she can do is use what she gave her to stop people like her. They all eventually become their parents at some point, right? Kid Flash tells her, no, we always have choices. I'm not sure I'll ever be like that. Maybe I don't belong here. But as he turns to leave, Red Arrow grabs him stating, wait, your powers alone make you part of the top three on this team. You're also annoying and impulsive. However, you have this exhausting, unfailing moral compass. And even if we don't always follow it, we do need it. The team needs you. Kid Flash looks at her asking, team? And Red Arrow pauses and states, yes, the team. Kid Flash, what are you going to do? But down below in the prison, Deathstroke is hanging and he notices someone there. He asks if they're just going to sit in the shadows all night, and that's when there's a beep. And that beep was the lock being released on all of the inmates. Back up top, Robin wakes up from another nightmare to clear his head. He decides to go check on his prisoners. But when he opens up the elevator door, all the prisoners lunge out at him. Everyone begins to surround Robin, but as they get close, Robin activates the lockdown, releasing an electrical charge that stuns everyone while hiding under his cape. Blood... Brother Blood gets back up, reaching for the cape, but as he lifts it, Robin has escaped through the hidden hatch beneath the floor. Underneath, Deathstroke grabs him as everyone begins shooting below and gets away. Deathstroke then throws Robin out the other end, telling him, Looks like you got a little shrapnel in your eye during the electric slide. Better get that looked at. Also, while you were gone, I implemented your secret Terminus protocol from your encrypted server. You're welcome. Just tell everyone to stand down. Robin asks, Terminus? No, and he lunges swinging at Deathstroke. He aimlessly swings with Deathstroke catching the knife asking, what's wrong? I just solved your problem for you, stop. Deathstroke grabs Robin, pinning him back, holding a knife to his face with Robin shouting, do it, you know you want to. Deathstroke tells him, no, what I want to do is know why you hate me so much. Why is this so personal? So personal you're willing to get the other five kids killed. Robin tells him, you could go straight to hell. And Deathstroke tells him, fine, sounds like a plan. Good luck out there with Paw Patrol. You're gonna need it. Outside, Kid Flash talks on the phone, and when he turns back, he sees all of the prisoners about to walk right out the front door. Swerve runs for the exit, but before she can make it, the doors are locked, trapping them inside. Kid Flash runs up the walls and into Red Arrow's room, telling her that they got a problem. Robin's lockdown still isn't a drill. Seconds later, Crush is blown out of her room by Atomic Skull, but she charges back, punching him through the wall and into Brother Blood. While that is going on, Robin makes his way to an opening and sees Kid Flash standing there, waiting for him. He grabbed all of the collars like he asked in the text. So Robin gets up telling him to get those over to Red Arrow. She'll know what to do. He'll deal with Deathstroke alone. And Kid Flood then asks, What did he do to you? Robin looks away. Nothing. Everything. His arrogance, his impurity, just rubbing our faces with his evil. His smug, arrogant, and Kid Flash says, whoa, 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 whoa. You took on the world's deadliest assassin, dragged us into this because some guy ruffled your hair? Robin climbs the ladder telling him, that's ridiculous. And Kid Flash tells him, no, you're fixated on it. Like, like it's a trigger. Kid Flash then jumps in his way asking, who are you really mad at here? Who is Deathstroke standing in for? You can't take out the real guy, so your world is about Deathstroke. This prison, where you kidnap people, it's like we're the criminals here. We just lock people up and forget about them. Robin tells him, you have to hurry. If people die, it'll get even worse. So I suggest you get on with it. Kid Flash races over to put the power dampeners on all of the prisoners, with Red Arrow telling him that they need to bring him downstairs. Crush shouts asking what the hell is going on? How did the losers get here? And what did she hear about a prison? What the hell is her and Bird Boy not telling them? Robin hurries over to the jet where Swerve's last known location was, and she points her guns telling Robin, please leave, please let her go. Robin begins going through the jet's cabin as telling her that he can't do that. But that's when Jin phases in asking, what is she talking about? Robin tells her, there's no time. Get these injectors below, fast. If we let them go, if they leave, they're going to die. Swerve asks, what did you do to us? Infect us with some kind of a virus, a failsafe, in case the prisoners escaped? Robin says, There's an enzyme in the prison oxygen that inhibits the toxin. 
outside the prison, the air is poison. That's right. Robin then rushes to the outside where Deathstroke waits for him, telling him that the Terminus Protocol was brilliant. But he kept it a secret because he was too weak to implement it. So he did. Robin tells him, That's right! I infected the prisoners! Release them! Let them walk out the door and die! It's that simple. Deathstroke asks, Release them? I wouldn't cross the hall to spit on them! Letting them go as if they were my kids. You risked your life to save people who were actively trying to kill you. I turned on the Terminus to fix you. But it's too late. Robin asks, Is it? Would you bet your life on it? And Deathstroke takes off his mask telling him, Yeah, I would. I couldn't understand the obsession. Figured it was bats. But that's not it. There's something else. Deep. And Robin tells him, You don't know anything! And Deathstroke hands out a gun telling him, I know this. I said I was going to fix you. It's only one way. So do it. You know you want to. Robin takes the gun. He takes aim at Deathstroke. He holds it steady. And he doesn't pull the trigger. Deathstroke tells him, That's what I thought. Bats ruined you. Yeah. Then there's a quiet thunk. As a red arrow shoots into Deathstroke's false eye. He stands there for a moment. And then he falls to the ground. The next morning, Red Arrow washes the blood off the roof. And Robin along with Kid Flash says that they need to talk. Red Arrow tells them that they know that if he'd escaped, he'd have killed again. It would have been on their shoulders. But just then, Roundhouse shouts, Hey, jerks! You lied to us! I expected this kind of crap from the Psycho Twins. But KF? We're supposed to be friends, man! You met my mother for dinner! Everyone begins to argue, and through it all, Jin quietly says that they must release the prisoner. Kid Flash then says that she's right. They do have to release them. They should have the moment they found out. Red Arrow tells them that it might be hard for them to understand, but those prisoners are the key to taking down the other. Those criminals are his agents. Kid Flash then asks, where has that gotten us? Face it, that prison is nothing more than a ticking time bomb that's already almost gotten us killed. Red Arrow pulls back on her bow, aiming it at Kid Flash, stating, she can't let him go. And Kid Flash asks, what are you gonna do? Put an arrow in me like Deathstroke? So Red Arrow shouts that Deathstroke was a monster. She just did what he didn't have the guts to do. If he's so righteous, why didn't he stop the arrow? He's faster than it, right? Maybe deep down he wanted Deathstroke dead as well. So you're welcome. Robin steps in telling her at Arrow that she crossed a line that never should have been crossed. Now you have to live with it. Kid Flash says no. She made a choice that we all have to live with. Just like you and your damn prison. But not anymore. Kid Flash reaches for the door, but Robin throws a battering into it, telling him, Just listen. Deathstroke activated Terminus. I never intended on... But Kid Flash stops him. Yeah. You weren't going to kill them, but you weren't going to free them either. You've done something that Flash, Green Arrow, and even Batman would never do. They were building a better system. Theirs was systematically built. If you can't see that, then we're a part of the problem. Jin says that she understands. He thinks that she is part of the problem. Robin tries to tell her no, but she says, You let me in. I shared my history with you. My greatest shames. I believed you understood me. But it is clear now that you are not who I thought you were. What you are doing is disgusting, inhumane. It is one thing to take someone's life, but to take their freedom, that is evil. Robin tells her that he's going to do this for the greater good, but Jin stops him, stating, That is exactly what Elias said before he took my ring and imprisoned me within it. Robin shouts, They're criminals! They chose to be cold-blooded murderers! You just saw it! They tried to kill us the second they were free! I'm the leader of this team, and sometimes the leader has to make hard decisions. Jin sighs, stating that she is more lost now than she was the day he found her. Roundhouse then asks if they're going to do this or what. And Jin says, yeah, they are. So she begins to fly away. Robin reaches out for her, but she pulls away, stating, do not touch her. Robin tells her to stop, but when he goes again, Crush grabs and lifts him up, asking, are you deaf? She said don't touch her. Crush then throws Robin's body up against a billboard, and when Kid Flash tells her not to, she elbows him, launching him across the roof. Crush then turns to Red Arrow, but before she can do anything, Kid Flash runs around Crush with enough speed to pick her up and throw her down the roof. Roundhouse charges up, bouncing into Kid Flash, shouting that he needs to quit being such an ass! And Red Arrow sighs, stating that this is ridiculous. Jin agrees. They should be releasing the prisoners. So she pulls back on her bow, stating that they are not going to do that. Jin waves her hand, disarming her, stating that all the arrows in the world cannot stop her. Red Arrow then tackles into her, telling her that she's probably right. But then again, there's no need for them. The six continue to fight amongst themselves, but Jin stops everyone with her magic, stating that they will stop the senseless fighting immediately. Or she will. Robin gets back up, stating, The prison was my idea. It's my burden to deal with. And Kid Flash tells him that that's the problem. He's always been making decisions for the rest of them. But that ends with, 
before he could finish his loud explosion, knocking everyone to the ground. Crush pulls herself up, asking, Who the? But before she could finish, a hand reaches down, picking her up by her neck, and she says, You! Lobo laughs. laughs. That's right, sweetheart. Daddy's home. Late night at the corner store in the Bronx, the bell rings as a customer walks in. A man calls out asking where the lime chili pork rinds are, and the cashier continues playing on his phone, telling the man that they are beneath the baked beans right next to the ho-hos. The man then asks, what about the strawberry milk? And the cashier tells him that they're all out. Won't have any until next Tuesday. The man then asks, how is that supposed to help him now though? And the cashier looks up asking, I'm sorry? And Lobo leans down telling him, no, you ain't, Andar 2. The cashier steps back, telling him that his name is Andy, and he doesn't know what, but Lobo stops him. So you do. I'm what you call a bounty hunter. Kenja Rowe sends his regards. Andy takes out his gun, asking, are you on drugs or something? And he pulls the trigger. Andy shoots through the pork rinds with Lobo sighing, you dumb bastard. Lucky for you, the contract said I could bring you in dead or alive. Lobo takes out his gun and then he fires and the entire store explodes, throwing Andy out of it. As he gets up, the alien beneath the skin pulls out the rest of his damaged mask, shouting, Door! You're destroying everything! And Lobo throws his chain, wrapping it around Andar 2, telling him, It sucks that all you Dorians gotta be part of that hive mind, huh? As Lobo pulls Andar 2 back, he calls Lobo a real jackass and Lobo lights his cigar, telling him, I'm gonna take that as a compliment. And when he finishes, he stomps down with a loud sklurch, and he laughs. As he loads up his bounty, a voice comes over the comms telling him that there is a job for him. They call themselves the Teen Titans. Lobo secures Andar 2, telling the voice, Yeah, I really don't do boy bands. And the voice shows a picture of Crush telling him there's someone on the team that he might be interested in. She claims that she is his daughter. Lobo tells the voice, I ain't got no kids, at least none that I haven't killed already. And the voice says, please check your account. You can see that your normal fee has been tripled. Lobo sits down on his bike and he tells him, well, hot damn, you just found the key to my aching heart. Who's calling anyway? The voice tells Lobo that he can address him as the other. Now, we go to the current time at Mercy Hall where we last left off our storyline with Lobo squeezing Crush's neck, stating, and that's how we got to this happy little family reunion. But see, you can't really be my daughter because... He sniffs the arrow around Crush and then says, well, I'll be damned, you are one of mine. Roundhouse breaks a chair over Lobo and then turns to Crush. Yeah, I'm gonna need a minute. And he throws her into a pile of rubble. Lobo turns back, knocking Roundhouse away, asking, who's next? Come to Papa, you bastards. Roundhouse bounces back, shouting, Here comes the thunder! Lobo sighs, grabbing Roundhouse out of the air, telling him, I forgot how much I hate kids. He begins to beat on all of the Teen Titans, using Roundhouse as a weapon. And when no one can stand, he begins to laugh. But Kid Flash runs in, hitting Lobo a dozen times in the chest, yelling, I really hate bullies with big mouths! Lobo punches through the hits, knocking Kid Flash down, telling him, You gotta get back up. That was only a love tap. He then goes in to finish off Kid Flash, but as he swings, his body is teleported into Crush's room. He looks up at all of the pictures of himself on the wall, telling her, Yeah, you know, someone's a little obsessed. The box with O bless her chain rattles, and Lobo then asks, Oh, what the hell is that? Just then, Jin appears, telling him, You must be punished for what you've done to Crush! Prepare to! But as she casts her magic, Lobo breaks off a piece of the mirror, reflecting it back, causing Jin to hit herself with her own spell. He laughs. Oh, I ain't killed one of you in a long time. This is the gig that just keeps on giving and giving. But before he could finish her off, Crush charges in, knocking Lobo out of the building, shouting, Don't you touch her! Lobo gets up asking, Oh, you wanna play? All right, three points for the main man. He knocks Crush into a basketball hoop, ripping the pole out and then batting her across the city over into the train station. She begins to get back up, but Lobo comes crashing down, telling her, Oh, this is more fun than I expected. She jumps up and over Lobo, getting ready to kick, telling him that she's got some questions for him. But as she kicks, Lobo grabs her by the ankle, twisting it, telling her, Oh, I got some questions too. 
And as Crush's leg breaks, Lobo asks, I need to know if you got a healing factor, seeing as you're only half the Caesarean that I am, which also means that you're way out of your league. Lobo picks Crush up by her hair, slamming her into the train car, and then overthrows it on her. Jin radios in, stating that they're going to have to release Obles for her, but Crush yells, Don't! Obles came from Lobo! The chain might not listen to me. But then a shadow forms over Crush, and Lobo asks, Oh, where did you go? Daddy misses you. Just then, he slams the train cart down on Crush, telling her, You know, you really should be thanking me! All those years I wasn't around to mess you up! That's about to change! Lobo digs Crush out of the debris, and then Crush spits into Lobo's face, telling him, Bite me! As Lobo tosses her out of the cart, telling her, You're starting to cut into my me time now. So how about we wrap this one up? Oh, and when you get to hell, make sure you say hi to all my other little mistakes. As Lobo stomps, Kid Flash runs in, grabbing Crush, telling everyone that they need to get out of here, somewhere safe, now! Lobo begins to laugh. <laughs> you can hide, but the main man's got your scent. You're as good as dead. Later at Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Kid Flash sets Crush down in a barn, and Roundhouse says that he doesn't look so good. Kid Flash tells him that if he got the beating from Lobo that she did, he wouldn't be looking so great either. A few moments later, Crush jolts up, stating, what the hell just happened? What is this place? And Jin tells her that she's safe, but Crush gets up telling everyone, Get out of my way! Jin holds up the rattling box of the chain of Oblast, stating that it would not be wise for her to leave so suddenly. Her stubbornness will bring about her end. That would not only be a great loss, but an unnecessary one. So please, let them and Oblast help. Crush wipes some blood off of her chin, telling them, that she needs some air. And as she walks through the farm, Red Arrow says that she knows that Lobo is on his way to finish her off, right? Red Arrow then says, this place belongs to my mother Shadow. It's the place where I come to rest. So Crush tells her that she ain't about to let Lobo come here and destroy it. But Red Arrow says, don't act like you're doing this for us. You have trust issues. We all have trust issues, but we don't have a lot of options and we're not going anywhere. So cut the crap and get ready for a fight, Crush. Back at the barn, Damien tightens up the last bit of his tramp, and Jin says that it's strange. She doesn't sense Lobo's presence anywhere. Robin tells her that they're going to get ready for whenever he shows up. And about the prison, the one that he didn't tell anyone about where he kept supervillains and even captured Deathstroke, just know that he wasn't trying to hurt the team. Jin stops him. I have nothing to say to you that doesn't involve protecting Crush from her murderous father. And Robin says, fine, but what about Lobo? We succeed in capturing him. What do you propose we do, kill him? Jin hesitates for a moment and then says that if they must. Robin tells her that there was a time that he might have agreed with her, but that's not who he is anymore. And he doesn't think that she is either. Later that night, with Lobo still having not shown up, Roundhouse looks around stating, maybe he forgot, which would be like, cool, like he never showed up. Just then, the barn doors slam shut and Roundhouse yells, okay, that was not the wind. With a loud thunk, a scarecrow hits the window and Roundhouse begins to scream, Code Red! Code Red! As he's finishing though, there's a rumbling on the ground as Lobo's arm shoots up and he begins to shout, Come to Papa! Lobo begins pulling them underground and Kid Flash throws a batarang, stabbing it into Lobo's eye. Everyone begins to run out and Lobo pulls the batarang out, telling him, All right, punks, who wants to die first? Red Arrow then asks if someone could shut him up already and Lobo responds to her, Try it. Robin pushes a button and a giant steel ceiling with spikes slams down on top of Lobo. Crush asks if they did it. And Roundhouse asks, do you mean if we dropped a five ton roof laced with enough tranquilizers to put down a hundred elephants on Lobo? Yeah, yeah, we did that. But just then a rumbling begins to come out of the giant metal plate and Lobo lifts it up stating, baby girl, we gotta talk about your friends. Crush calls out to Jin, but before she can even move, Lobo kicks her in the chest, knocking her into a tractor. The team then begins to unload on Lobo, but Lobo walks through it, grabbing Red Arrow by the neck and beginning to squeeze. Jin picks herself up, stating that they have to release Obles. If they don't do something, Lobo's going to kill them all. So Crush tells her that she already lost Obles once. Obles is the closest thing she has to family. Jin takes her hand, stating that the Teen Titans are her family. As Crush gets up, she calls out to Lobo, stating, I have something for you. Obles, take out the trash. Crush throws her pet chain out, the sentient chain that protects her. Lobo asks, What's that? You think some magic chain is going to stop the main man? Wait, what the frag is this thing? Crush punches him, stating that he should know he's the one who gave it to her. 
And Lobo gets up. I didn't even know you existed until yesterday, so I sure as hell didn't give you anything. Crush charges, grabbing Lobo, telling him that if it wasn't him, it must have been from her mother. Who is my mother? Lobo coughs up blood. <laughs> Are you joking? The main man has spread his tournament of love throughout the galaxy for eons. Crush punches him, telling him, oh, that's just gross. And Lobo laughs, oh, you're cute. I've been toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superman. There's nothing you can. Crush kicks Lobo between the legs, and as he falls over, right in the freaking beans. Crush steps on Lobo's head, asking, who was she? Who was she? But Lobo laughs. I ain't joking. I ain't got no fragging clue who your mother is. But I got some more bad news for you. I can't die. So you and your little amigos can do whatever you want to me. But I took out a contract on you. And there's nothing that's going to stop the main man from finishing that job. If I can't find you, I'll find your families. Anyone you've ever met. And we're going to keep doing this again and again and again. And then you'll... But before he could finish, Jin uses her magic and Lobo falls face first into the ground. Crush asks if she, and Jin tells her no. She changed him, but there will be a cost. Red Arrow then says that they just can't leave him here. And Roundhouse tells Crush that he's got an idea. Some time passes, and on the moon, a small drone follows a trail to something that recently crash landed. Lex Luthor appears before the chained up Lobo, stating that if it isn't the infamous bounty hunter bested by mere children, not a good look for the last Cesarean. Although, that's not really true anymore, is it? Lobo coughs. Go away, stupid ghost. Lex says, Don't let my appearance fool you. I'm here to make you an offer. You're going to destroy the Teen Titans, and your daughter will help you do it, Lobo. Now with the Teen Titans finally catching a break from fighting crime, it's time for Crush to do a little investigative work herself. As Jin follows Crush into the warehouse, she says that she doesn't understand what they're doing here. Why would he have anything to hide? We're a team now. Crush tells her, You don't spend that much time with a guy who dresses like a bat and lives in a cave and not have something to hide. She pushes a large box aside, revealing a metal door, and she tells Jin, See? Jin tells her, Maybe we should ask Robin to. But before she can finish, Crush asks, Where's the fun in that? and she kicks in the door. The two look in and Crush tells her, see, all of these cool toys for us to play with. Come on, let's take a ride out on town. Jin asks, shouldn't we ask for permission? And Crush laughs, <laughs> never. Jin sits in the back of the motorcycle as Crush revs the engine as she slams through a wall shouting, let's roll. As the two go out onto the city, Jin asks where they're going and Crush tells her upstate. She lost something a long time ago and it's time for her to get it back. Jin holds on tight and Crush thinks to herself that all she has to do is go to the coordinates that Robin gave her. The one thing that she didn't mention to Jin though, is that when they get there, someone's going to die. The two make a stop at a rest station and Crush says that they need to beef up before going any further. They head into the diner and the waitress asks if there's anything that she can get for them. Jin says that she would like a bola lala. And the waitress asks, a what? It's one part to golem saliva mixed with the Crush speaks over her, telling her, Yeah, she'll just have a water. As the waitress leaves, Crush looks around, stating, A genie and an alien walk into a diner, and nobody even bats an eye. She looks out the window to notice that her reflection has changed, and Jin says that she thought it would be best to cast a spell to make them fit in. Crush shouts, What the hell is this? We look like prostitutes! Jin tells her that she drew inspiration from the girls on the show that Red Arrow watches when she thinks no one is around. Keeping up with the Kardashians? Crush yells in frustration, telling her to turn them back, and Jin asks what about the people around them. So Crush yells, Who cares? Neither of us should care! We are what we are. The world can deal with it, or get out of our way. Jin says that she's trying to help, and Crush tells her, It's okay. I stopped giving a crap what people think a long time ago. It all started 15 years ago when I crash landed on Earth in the middle of a group of weirdos trying to figure out the truth of the universe. But these weirdos, they accepted each other for who they were and danced around a giant burning figure. David and Lisa Rojos, her Earth parents. They were taking a spiritual journey together when she literally fell out of the sky. They didn't have much, but they were enlightened. They really understood the world for what it was. Instead of worrying about themselves, they came to her rescue. A chain was surrounding her, but Lisa didn't care and picked her up. But back in our real world, not in our story, there's a crash as the waitress returns and drops their drinks on the floor. She backs up stating that they aren't looking for any trouble and Jin tries to explain, but Crush gets up stating, they won't understand. All they see are a couple of freaks. 
So she takes Jin by the hand, knocking the door off its hinges. Then Jin quickly repairs it, stating that they can't just break everything. A short ways down the street, Crush beats on an apple tree for the two of them to eat, and Jin asks what happened next in her story. So Crush takes a bite, telling her, Well, my Earth parents weren't perfect, but I always felt loved. David and Lisa weren't just her parents, though. They were her best friends. Aside from her chain, oh bless. David would always let her play princess, but one day after she saw her reflection in the mirror, she asked why she didn't look like them. David told her it's because she was special, and that her birth parents were superheroes. She asked, like Superman? And they told her, exactly like Superman. And your parents must be off saving the universe. It was at that moment that she wanted to stop being a princess and be a superhero. But because of David and Lisa's addictions, they really couldn't stay in one place long. They had a hard time keeping jobs and paying bills, and, and they even made enemies out of most people. Their habits were something that they could never really lick, but it didn't matter. They were family, and she loved them. After laying low in Nevada, she went out to get some food when she saw someone on the TV that looked just like her. The problem was the man that she saw, well, he was fighting Superman. The people watching the display talked about how Superman wouldn't lose, and that he would finally get rid of Lobo, who was the last of his kind. So Crush ran home and she shouted to David and Lisa that they lied to her, that her father was actually an intergalactic villain. David told her that just because Lobo was bad doesn't mean that she has to be, and that she could choose to be the kind of person that she wanted to be. Crush tried to say something, but instead of listening, she told David and Lisa and even Obless to leave her alone before storming out. What was she supposed to think? She just found out that she wasn't the daughter of a superhero, but instead her dad was a real dirtbag murderer. When she left, she didn't even bother to cover up or try to hide herself. And that's when the truckers spotted her. They called her names and threw rocks at her. David and Lisa always protected her, so she didn't even know how to respond. Instead of walking away, nature kicked in big time. She took out the truckers and then returned home, but it was too late. Somebody had already gotten to their trailer and killed them. Killed David and Lisa. And oh bless, well, her chain was gone. So before the cops came, she ran. And here they are today. Jin says that she's sorry to hear about her great tragedy, but it doesn't mean the world is all bad. Yeah, there are things in the world that can hurt you, but if you focus on the bad, you won't see the good. Crush laughs. Okay, fine. What's your story? Change my mind. Jin pauses for a moment and tells her, perhaps one day she will share it. Crush puts her arm on Jin's shoulder, telling her, sure, no rush. Now, let's go get Obless. Later in upstate New York, Crush bursts open a door of a mansion, yelling, Knock, knock! Anybody home? A man in the shadows begins to laugh, stating, Well, looky here. I know who you are. Kind of hard to forget a face like that. Crush asks if she's supposed to know who he is, and the man with dreadlocks leans forward over his pile of drugs, stating, I go by many names, but you can call me Ezekiel. Back in the day, I used to deal to your parents, but one day, they stole some product from me, which caused some problems for my uh, associates. I began hunting them down, but they always seemed to be one step ahead like they had a sixth sense. But it wasn't a sixth sense, it was that chain! It warned them. So I just watched from afar, waiting for the moment to get even. The plan was to steal you and sell you off in the dark web. But after you left that day, I found something better. I shot your parents and I took that chain! Crush shouts to Obless and Ezekiel stands up as Obless swirls around him asking, Oh, so that's its name! I've been calling it it! Did you get this thing from your old man, Lobo? Crush yells, Lobo is not my father! And Ezekiel laughs, <laughs> of course he is. She charges and screaming, no! You killed my parents and now you're going to pay. Obless whips around, launching Crush into the ceiling and then flings back, knocking Jin out. Crush pulls herself out of the ceiling and lunges back at Ezekiel and he just continues laughing. <laughs> it, go get her! Obless begins to wrap himself around Crush and she yells, your name is not it! You're Obless and I'm Samara! We came to this planet together! She tries to hold Obless back, but the spike gets closer to her face. She tells Obless, You're my best friend, and I love you. Crush lets go, and Obless stops. The chain begins to playfully wrap itself around Crush, and she realizes, <laughs> There you are. Let's finish off this dirt bag. Obless shoots forward, wrapping around Ezekiel and squeezing, but Jin gets back up, stating that this will not bring back her family. Crush tells her no, but it will feel good. And she can't let this guy walk away. Jin lowers her hand, stating that she must forgive herself. Her father David once said that she can choose the kind of person that she wants to be. Lobo does not have to define her, not if she doesn't want him to. So a few seconds later, Ezekiel is released. Jin says that she is proud of the choice that was made. Crush wipes her face, stating, Just don't tell that roundhouse kid that I cried. He'll never let me live it down. Jin then looks at the chain, stating, So this is Obless. 
Where did you get its name? Crush says that she's not sure. She just always knew somehow. Jin takes Crush's hands, stating that this is exactly what she was talking about earlier. Humans are complicated and flawed, but goodness still exists within them if you let the right ones in. Crush asks, and give up being a stone cold badass? <laughs> give me a break. Jin asks her, what's next? Crush tells her, Lobo. Jin then asks, does she really think that he's her father? Crush tells her that she's not sure, but it's time she got answers of her origins. So Jin holds her hand out and tells Crush that it's okay. She won't be there alone. So a month goes by, and along the Brooklyn Bridge, brother and sister villain duo Mammoth and Shimmer go make a drop-off as Shimmer says that their shipment goes out in an hour, and they're short. Mammoth throws another bag into the shipping container, telling her that they have time. They'll just have to get more. There were some abandoned buildings not far from here, probably some strays that they could pick off. But as the two leave, a battering is thrown before them, and Shimmer looks up to see Robin, aka Damian Wayne Robin, stating that sometimes the world has a way of delivering exactly what you need. Mammoth lunges at Robin, telling him that he's going to be coming with them. Did he really think that he could take them on alone? Robin jumps out of the way, telling them, of course not. And a split second later, Roundhouse rockets in, slamming Mammoth into one of the nearby containers. Robin then opens up the container that Mammoth made the deposit in and tells the people inside, It's all right now. You're safe. While the other Teen Titans keep Mammoth and Shimmer busy, Robin throws another battering at the locks on the rest of the container, stating, There's more here! Crush picks up Roundhouse, telling him to turn into something useful. But as Roundhouse begins to make a joke about how she sounds like his mom, Crush throws him at Mammoth's head. Crush tells him that he thinks about kidnapping girls again. Remember us hitting you so hard that your sister felt it. As Jin puts Shimmer to sleep, Roundhouse then shouts, All right, teamwork making the dream work. However, for Robin, the mission isn't over. There's still something bothering him. There's only one person that he can really talk about it to, Red Arrow. So as the two are walking through Central Park, Robin tells her that there's something bothering him from when they fought Deathstroke. If you're curious about that video, I'll link it down below. But Deathstroke gains superpowers. The night the prisoners escaped, Deathstroke said that there was a traitor among them. One of the team members was the one who released them. Red Arrow then asks if he thinks it is her, because she helped build the prison that was keeping Deathstroke. So of course it wasn't her. Robin then says that there might be something that he missed that she may have noticed, some clue that he's missing. She tells him okay. How about they go through everyone to try and find a motive as to why someone would have betrayed them. When Jin found out about the prison, she was pretty upset, and her genie powers are through the roof. Robin says that they can't forget about Kid Flash. He wasn't comfortable with the prison either, and Deathstroke has convinced him to join him before. Red Arrow tells him that she doesn't see it. He's got too much to prove to himself these days, and she'd put him last in the list personally. So then Robin asks, What about Roundhouse? We don't know much about him. But then again, it'd be hard to believe that Roundhouse would be able to keep a secret that big. Red Arrow says that that only leaves Crush. Her father was hired by the other to fight them. She could be working with the other. Robin tells her, maybe, but again, our mothers have tried to kill us before. Mine actually succeeded. We should return to Mercy Hall so that we can. But Red Arrow stops him, stating, she told him before. She's done with the Teen Titans. She wasn't there for a reason. She had to leave. She killed Deathstroke. She crossed the line that she said she would never cross again. The team hates her more than him. They can't just pretend like none of that happened. Robin says they have found a new way to do things now. They have solved the problem. So later that day, Robin heads back to Mercy Hall to try and interrogate Mammoth and Shimmer and ask them, how could two low-rank metahumans with no previous international crime suddenly become players on a global human trafficking ring? How did they get so organized? Was it the other? Was he the one who hired them? Shimmer tells him that she has no idea what he's even talking about. He can torture them all he wants, but there's nothing to tell. Jin then floats in, stating that they will see about that. You may leave us, Robin. So as Robin leaves, Shimmer then asks, where is he going? And what is she doing? Get her away from me. Robin steps into the elevator, and as the doors shut, all he can hear are screams. Robin watches a video feed of Sebastian Brown over at Bed Stuve Neighborhood Garden while he waters his plants. Sebastian then picks up a rose, and when he does, he pricks himself on the thorn, lifting his glasses to reveal himself to actually be Brother Blood. The screen then changes to Gizmo, Atomic Skull, Onomatopoeia, and Swerve, all former prisoners of Robin and Red Arrow's prison, all converted into civilian lifestyles. The screen then pops up with Mammoth and Shimmer. While their stasis shows yellow, Jin used her powers to give them brand new lives. That night, Mammoth goes to work at the carnival. But not as the supervillain Mammoth, but instead, Bobby Myers. Kid Flash asks, 
Guys, isn't this wrong? And Robin tells him that it may be unorthodox, but the results are undeniable. Kid Flash watches, telling him, I'll give you that. They all seem so happy, and they're not hurting anyone. All it took was a prison blowing up, Deathstroke being killed, Lobo almost killing us, Red Arrow quitting, and Jin hating you. Robin doesn't respond, and Kid Flash tells him to not act like it doesn't bother him. So Robin leans back, stating that regarding the prison, he's actually been wanting to discuss something important with him. But before he could finish, an ear-piercing scream from Jin can be heard, and she appears shouting, SOMEONE HAS STOLEN MY RING! Everyone rushes in to see what's the matter, and Crush then asks, How could that even happen? She never takes it off her finger unless someone was so fast, you couldn't feel it, Jin. As Crush grabs Kid Flash by the throat, slamming him into the wall, everyone piles onto Crush, telling her to stop. Jin then asks her to please stop, and as Crush lets go, she says, there's no taking it easy. We gotta figure this crap out now. Robin takes out his phone and says, oh, I completely agree. But that's why as of this moment, we're in full lockdown. In the back of Robin's mind though, he thinks that this is it. This is what Deathstroke was talking about. Before he could state who the traitor was, an arrow was put through his head. Jin's missing ring is all the proof he needs. Who could have stolen it? And worst of all, what are they waiting for now? Later, as Jin returns to her room, Crush states that she can't believe it. How could she have let something like this happen? How was she not more careful? If someone has the ring, they have her. Jin asks if she truly thinks that they both don't know that. What is happening? This attitude is unlike you, Crush. Crush scoffs. What do you even care? Since that kiss, you haven't said a damn thing about it. Maybe it wasn't a big deal to you, but it was to me. Jin pauses for a moment and then says, How dare you? I do care but I've spent my entire existence under the control of others. And only now have I been able to experience life, my own life for the first time. I joined this team not only to make up for my past, but to also learn about myself. And now, of all days, you choose to confront me with this and then blame me for my own worst nightmare? That speaks a lot of oneself. Crush storms out of her room, throwing her jacket onto the ground, yelling at herself, good freaking going. But before she could break anything, there's a knock at the door, and Robin asks if he can come in for a moment. Crush tells him that he can, and once inside, Robin asks, where was she the night that the prisoners escaped? Crush tells him not that this has anything to do with Jin's ring, but she was right here sleeping. But he should know that, as he has cameras watching all of them. Robin then says, that's the thing. My cameras were disabled. Crush then asks, why didn't you say that the breakout was an inside job? And Robin stops her. I was waiting for the right moment, like I did when you confessed your feelings for Jin. As Crush gets ready to swing at him, Robin goes on telling her, I have cameras everywhere. I know about your kiss and the argument that you just had. Maybe, maybe you took the ring to force Jin to like you back. Crush drops her weights, grabbing Robin by the collar, but her eyes go full red, the same as Lobo's. She catches herself letting go, telling Robin to get out. She didn't steal the ring, because unlike you, I'd never hurt Jin. Robin continues to investigate the remaining team members, all with their own possible motives. But nothing comes up. However, one thing that Kid Flash mentions is that the one person who would be capable of doing this isn't exactly on the team anymore. So later, at Red Arrow's apartment, she calls Green Arrow and records a message that she's still in Manhattan trying to figure out what she's going to do. She's been having trouble with the whole hero thing. Something happens and it makes her doubt herself. Maybe she can't fight nature. Maybe she is her mother's child. Red Arrow then looks at her phone, and when it asks to send the voicemail, she taps no, and the phone tells her, message deleted. After letting out a sigh, she hears the sound of a closing door. Red Arrow grabs her telescope and throws it, stating, whoever you are, I am not in the mood. Jin grabs the telescope out of the air, and Red Arrow then throws a potted plant, stating, I guess we're doing this. The plant misses, but as Jin holds up her hand, an arrow shoots through it. Red Arrow then grabs another arrow, lunging and shouting, Of course you're the traitor! I knew I shouldn't have trusted! Jin looks up, telling her to stop. And as Red Arrow's body freezes in place, she blasts her out of the apartment window. And at that moment, a voice tells Jin, Nice work! Roundhouse steps out of the shadows, wearing Jin's ring, telling her, That's one down, three more to go. Rain pours down on Mercy Hall as Damien sits at his computer compiling data on his team. He stares at the screen when there's a knock at the door and he quickly puts his mask on. Opening it, Jin floats there asking him if they can talk for a moment. She says that she has been thinking about what happened, about them, how she knows that he would never intend on hurting her. And after thinking about his secret prison, she now knows that he only wished to make things better. It was for the greater good. She has come here tonight to tell him that she loves him. Jin then takes Damien by the hand and tells him to close his eyes, and he does, and she uses her powers to knock him out. Later, 
as the lights come back on in Damien's prison. Red Arrow, Kid Flash, Crush, and Damien all sit in chains with Roundhouse wielding Jin's ring, telling them, All right, so we need to talk. Kid Flash says, The last thing that I remember was that you stole Jin's ring so that you could take down the Teen Titans. And Roundhouse tells him, Yeah, sorry, I really didn't want to do it this way, but I couldn't risk another backfire like at the prison. Red Arrow shifts in her chains, asking, You're the one who released everyone from the secret prison? And Roundhouse tells her, Yeah, I know, my bad. Everything went down differently when I pictured it all in my head. Kid Flash yells, asking, So you're working for our arch nemesis, the other? And Roundhouse scoffs, Psst, that guy's a murderer. Come on, buddy, have some faith. Crush shouts at him, You want us to have faith? Jin trusted you, and now you're using her against us. Roundhouse tells her, I know, trust me, I know. But I'm doing this to save you all, to save us from Robin. Growing up, my sister Claire was everything to me. She was my best friend. We were inseparable. That was until a year ago. We were all on our way to the opening of a new clothing store and passed through an alleyway when the warehouse next to us exploded. I was splashed with some chemical and Claire was trapped under the rocks as the building fell. I tried to run to her, but my body turned into this goop and Claire died asking, where was I? I didn't know how this could have happened. And then I saw it. Robin. He was the one who blew up the building. Damien stops him. I remember. I was stopping Scarecrow from releasing his fear toxin all over the city. The perimeter appeared to be clear and... And Roundhouse interrupts him. And it wasn't! And Claire died because of you! All because of you! When I was asked to be a part of the superhero team, I didn't know the person running it would be you. After finding out about the secret prison, I knew exactly the type of person that Robin was. You have been locking up people forever and playing God by using Jin to rewrite their brains. That's not what heroes do. That's what bad guys do, Robin. Damien stops him. You have to listen. We tried everything, imprisoning them and worse. What we do works. And Roundhouse tells him, no, you were trained to kill, not save lives. Waiting for Damien to respond, Crush speaks up. You know, Roundhouse has a point. My pops deserved what he got, but there's got to be a better way than this. But for us to do that, Roundhouse, you have to make things right by giving Jin her ring back. Please. Kid Flash tells him, just look at you. This isn't you. You're one of the good guys, you remember? We can do it together. Roundhouse hesitates for a moment as he looks at Jin's ring. And just as he goes to say something, Damien tells him, we can find a solution together and I can forgive you. Roundhouse glares at him. What? What did you just say? Damien tells him, You're obviously under a lot of stress and you're reacting from an emotional place. Let's work this out and I can forgive you for doing this. Roundhouse screams at him, No! You don't get to forgive! You're the one who destroyed everything! Everyone else might be fooled, but I'm not. Claire was a good person. She could have cured cancer if given the chance. So now, I'm gonna take someone away from you. Jin, get back in your ring. Forever! Jin screams as her body is absorbed into the ring, and then there's nothing. Roundhouse looks at the ring quietly. Oh, oh God. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mean to. I was, I was mad. I didn't mean. As rage takes over, Crush stands up, ripping the chains out of the wall, shouting, I'm gonna kill you for what you did. Roundhouse falls to his knees. I, I can get her back. Just, just give me a second. Crush swings her chain with the part of the wall still attached to it at Roundhouse, asking, do you think you're a hero? And Roundhouse tries to tell her, I'm sorry. And Crush punches him in the face, breaking his goggles. Kid Flash and Red Arrow try to grab a hold of Crush, but she rips apart Roundhouse's costume, shouting, I'm gonna kill you all! And then Crush stops. Crush begins to hear a faint sound as she turns to walk away. And as everyone rushes to check on Roundhouse, Red Arrow follows Crush, telling her to wait. Once they get to the top of Mercy Hall, Crush jumps halfway across the city. And that's when everyone sees it. The Doom Sigil lighting up the sky with its green glow. Crush lands asking what happened to her. Why is she kneeling? And Lobo tells her, Luther said there'd be some kind of weird mind control going on here. But what do you know, kid? It worked. It's you and me now, girly. And we're about to have a blast. Soon everything fades to black as Crush falls into a dark abyss. She asks if anyone's there, and Lobo leans back in his recliner, stating, Oh, your friends ain't here. We're in your mind, and right now, you're playing for the main man's team, and they better get used to it. Crush struggles, telling him, You must be out of your mind! There's no way that I'd work for you! And Lobo laughs, You're fragging growing on me, kid. Keep it up, and I might not kill you. Crush lunges, shouting, 
We've already wiped the floor with you once, and I sure as hell could do it again. Lobo dodges the attack, telling her, You don't really have a choice in the matter. Lex made sure of that with his gift. The DNA that we share makes it so that I can control you. You know, the way it should be. So sit back and enjoy the show, kid. He takes a puff from his cigar and then blows the smoke in Crush's face, knocking her out again. As time passes, she finds herself on the throgs of Neckbridge asking to please stop this. Crush punches into a person, launching them across the highway and into a nearby truck. She then looks at the aqua-colored blood on her hand, and Lobo asks, Do you see it now? The human mask falls off as the alien gets up, stating that his people are here on a peaceful mission. There is no need for violence. Lobo walks up laughing. This guy's a real snooze fest, huh? Hard to believe someone paid money to see this loser dead. Speaking of that, take him out, Crush! Crush tells him that she can't. There's no way that she'd... She'd never... Lobo pushes her forward, telling her, There's a first time for everything. Now go on, you can do it! She reaches down to drag the alien closer, and as she lifts her foot up, it's a loud crunch. <laughs> you become a girl after my own heart! Gonna make me cry. Now, let's get those little pals of yours. Back over at Mercy Hall, the home of the Teen Titans, Roundhouse lays chained up, stating that he wishes he could take it all back. He really does. And Kid Flash stares at him, telling him, Well, you can't. And we haven't had any luck of getting her back out. Either she's trapped in there or she doesn't want to come back out. What were you thinking, man? Roundhouse yells, I wasn't thinking. I was just so angry at Robin. I just wanted to hurt him. At that moment, Red Arrow comes in and Kid Flash tells her how she's late. She asks him how he's doing. And Kid Flash says, Well, some spooky symbol appeared in the sky. Crush is still missing. And we can't get Jin out of her ring. And my powers are freaking out. Oh, and my best friend betrayed us. Yeah, I'm doing fine. As Red Arrow leans on the wall and sharpens her arrowheads, Roundhouse says that they don't have to babysit him. It's not like he can really go anywhere with his suit all torn up. Is she even going to respond? Red Arrow passes her arrow on the whetstone again, stating that she's not sure what to say. He used Jin to throw her out of a window. Roundhouse says that he's still sorry about that. Taking her out early was super important to the plan. Even though she doesn't have any powers, she's the most dangerous member of the team. Just ask Deathstroke. Several minutes of silence pass and Roundhouse asks, Do you still think about it? Red Arrow stares for a moment and then tells him, No. Just then a notification goes off on Red Arrow's phone and she says that it looks like they found Crush. Roundhouse yells that he can help, please. So Red Arrow walks out telling him that he's not going anywhere. He's already done enough damage for one day. Later, back at Coney Island, Crush terrorizes the amusement park while Lobo kicks back and enjoys a few beers. She mentally yells for him to get out of her head, but Lobo tells her, Nah, you still need to drop the hammer on your friends. Just then, Damien, Kid Flash, and Red Arrow appear and shout for her to stop. They all know that she is upset about what happened to Jin. Crush lifts up a bumper car above her head, and as she screams in her mind not to make her do it, Lobo tells her, Take him out. She throws the car, struggling to tell them to run. Kid Flash grabs Damien a red arrow, stating that he can't do this again. His powers are out of control. It's not safe. As Crush goes to grab another bumper car, Red Arrow takes aim, releasing an explosive arrow, dropping the car on Crush. The team slowly moves in, but as they get close, Crush bursts out, knocking everyone to the ground. Red Arrow reaches for her bow, but before she can grab it, Crush steps on her hand and knees her in the face. Damien leaps in, stating that she's going to pay for that. However, Crush spins back, catching him by his neck. She squeezes down on Damien's throat, and he gasps for air, asking, Why? And then Lobo walks in, explaining, It's because I need to get paid and I owe you for last time. Crush lightly releases her grip and then pulls Damien in, headbutting him. And as he blacks out, they all awaken later in an unknown location with Lobo and Crush walking through a castle and a voice telling them that they're late. Lobo says, yeah, unexpected complications. The main man always delivers. Speaking of, what's the deal with them? The voice asks, what's the deal? Before there was light, there was only darkness, and in the darkness there were things that went bump in the night. Things that fed on the fears of men and haunted their dreams. Some said it was the devil, others said the boogeyman, but rest assured, it was the other. Deep below in the prison of Mercy Hall, Roundhouse lays on the ground, hardly able to keep his form with his suit damaged. He sighs, stating that it's been hours. He just needs to reach. But as he pops open a small control compartment in his shoe, he presses a button and turns into a ball, bursting out of his chains. 
Once he gets to the upper levels, he grabs a roll of duct tape, wrapping himself up, stating that he needs to fix this. He just needs to stop by the house first. Meanwhile, in the other's lair, the other steps out before the tied up Teen Titans, stating, Teen Titans, the splinter in my mighty paw. And Lobo, you are worth every penny. Lobo laughs, telling him, yeah, had a little help from the squirt here, but the main man always finishes his job. As Lobo kicks Damien's body forward, the other asks, what of the ring? Lobo takes out Jin's ring, handing it over, stating, I tried wishing for a stacked blonde, nada. The other takes the ring that now contains the genie Jin, one of the Teen Titans, and slides it onto his finger, stating that King Solomon once had such a ring, but even he never quite knew how to use it. But now, Lobo waves his arm, walking off, telling him, I don't really care. It's happy hour somewhere and I'm missing it. Let's go, she me. The other asks, aren't you forgetting something? The deal was all of the Teen Titans, including Crush. Roundhouse is not important to the plan, but Crush, she is. And make sure to leave her compliant. Lobo turns back to Crush and he tells her, Heal! And without being able to resist, Crush falls to her knees with a loud whoomp. Kid Flash begins to stand up, stating, It's still three to one! You are so good to get your butt handed to you! The other begins to laugh, telling him, <laughs> You have so much to learn. First lesson is the other is never alone. Dozens of ninjas begin to jump out, and the others are taken away, with the others speaking directly to Damian Wayne. I have been waiting for this day. All the clues left behind. I knew that you would see them. The patterns connecting the dots. Seeing what I have built. Damien tells him, You speak as if we know each other. And the other asks, Don't you remember? The other is your executioner. I'm what you should have been. Mother's favorite. As the other removes his mask, he leans in with a stitched together neck in Damien's face telling him, You used to call me the heretic. But you can call me brother. Damien sits back. You're my clone, the one that killed me. But that's impossible, mother killed you. Heretic tells him it's true, but a rogue assassin did not want to see the holy blood of Ra's al Ghul spilled without a purpose. The assassin returns me to my rightful place, grandfather's home, the Lazarus Pit. And after I recovered, I read all the books. I learned all of the ancient evil that had plagued this earthly plane. It was at that moment that I found my way back and I became the other. I spent months tracking his location. The other hid his movements like a true master. But once I found him, he was easily killed. With the other out of the way, I took the mantle and I used his shadow to loom over all. I grew the existing empire into what it is now. I played the part. Damien asks, what part? The heretic raises his sword telling him, our parents' misguided attempts to save the world got us both killed, brother. There needed to be a new way to deliver justice to the wicked, to become the greatest hero that ever lived. But meanwhile, down in the sewers, Red Era looks around at the rising water stating that they need to do something before this place is completely submerged. Kid Flash yells in frustration, yelling, I should be able to vibrate out of these chains, but my powers are too unpredictable right now. Red Arrow then spits out a small arrowhead from her mouth, stating, We can't give up. And she begins to pick the cuff. Kid Flash looks at Crush, stating, I don't know what's wrong with her lately, but would you be so kind as to break us out of here? You know, unless you want to keep beating on us, Crush. Red Arrow tells him to stop. She can't. Lobo did something to her. He was controlling her. That's why she attacked. Crush quietly says, This is all my fault. But Red Arrow tells her, no, it's not. You are not your father, Crush. Crush shouts, I wasn't strong enough to stop him. The things he made me do. He made me kill someone. I fought as hard as I could. Part of me thinks the reason I couldn't break free was because I liked having him around. Red Arrow says that they're all not proud of the things their parents have done. And Kid Flash tells her that they're not their parents. Besides, she held up an entire building to save them. Crush laughs, I just didn't want my favorite jacket to get wrecked. Red Arrow goes on stating, I care about you. Heck, I even care about Kid Flash. So Kid Flash fist bumps her, and when he does, it creates a shock. Red Arrow looks at Kid Flash, who explains that his powers are still going crazy from everything going on in the Flash comic right now. But Red Arrow tells him, actually, 
It gives her an idea. Back up top, Damien asks, A hero? You're the head of a criminal empire! And Heretic says, Yes, my networks allow me unimaginable access to manipulate others as I see fit under the guide of one of my own. Think of the possibilities, brother. Damien yells, You're an abomination! And Heretic tells him, I wouldn't say such things. And Damien asks, Or what, you're gonna kill me again? Heretic stops him. Look, I did not do all of this so that we'd fight. I don't have much time. Damien tells him, You're dying. And Heretic looks at him, Yes. I have brought you here so that we could finish what has been started. We both want the same thing, to make our mark, to rewrite our past, to reshape the world. And I have what you lack, the mantle of the other, the means and the manpower to make your dream a reality. That is why you must become me. Take over the mantle. You will have everything that you ever wanted. You may not be able to beat crime, but you can control it, Damien. Damien asks, and what if I refuse? And the heretic says, You will have another use then, and your team will drown. Heretic holds out his hand, stating, It has to be you. This is your destiny. Down below in the flooded sewer, Red Arrow asks Crush if she's ready, and Crush yells, Just do it! Kid Flash reaches out, touching Crush and shocking her, and with that, she passes out. Red Arrow asks how much power did he use. She said to not knock out Crush, and Kid Flash says, Yep, we're gonna die. And Red Arrow says, Kid Flash? But as he goes to respond, she holds out her hand, Kid Flash grabs a hold of it, and at that moment, there's a loud explosion, and suddenly all of the water begins to drain out. Kid Flash is stunned, asking what happened, with Roundhouse stepping through the hole that he created, asking, What happened? Your boy happened! Up top, Heretic turns to Damien. It is time for you to choose! Accept your destiny! Take the mantle! Become the other! Or reject me and die with the rest of the Teen Titans! Damien asks, If I join, what happens to my team? Heretic holds out Jin's ring, stating, I can control them, make them understand. As Jin's ring swirls with power, Damien asks him, How? I spent days trying to get it to work. And Heretic says, It's all thanks to the Book of the Damned. Within its pages, it held forbidden secrets. It can free your beloved Jin. All you have to do is say yes! Damien tells him, I need proof. Heretic scoffs, Fine! Call for her. Damien stares at the ring and calls out Jin, and moments later, he begins to wake up in a room filled with dead bodies. He gets up asking, where am I? And up on her throne, Jin says, hello. Welcome to my prison, Damien. Damien walks forward asking, is it really you? And Jin says, yes, yes, it is. He looks around, stating, this is the place you told me about, where your brother Elias held you. Are we inside your ring? Jin sighs, telling him, Yes, my ring is connected to another realm. Your world has a name for it. Purgatory. This palace and what happened here is my deepest shame. Thus, it became my personal prison. But what are you doing here? Damien tells her that he is here to rescue her. Whatever happened out there, it doesn't matter! Jin says that she heard everything Roundhouse said. What they were doing, changing the personalities of those that they deemed evil. It is wrong. You should leave this place and forget that we ever met. Damien runs over, grabbing her hand, stating, This isn't about saving you! It's about me and... and you and... Jin takes her hand back, telling him, I know, but how did you get here, Damien? Damien tells her, I found the other. It turned out to be my clone, the heretic. He wants me to replace him. He has your ring, and his knowledge brought me here, Jin. Jin asks, how did he get that knowledge? Damien goes on. He mentioned an ancient book. He called it the Book of the Damned. Jin snaps. That book needs to be destroyed. The Book of the Damned will lead to nothing but pain for you and for everyone. Damien asks, what am I supposed to do then? Just leave you here? In your prison? Your hell? Jin begins to cry, stating that that is exactly what he needs to do. Damien tells her, no! And Jin reaches out, touching the sides of his head, stating, that she will show him what happens if he becomes the other. As a few moments pass, Damien's eyes gloss over and she asks, what does he see? He begins to cry, stating that it's everything he ever wanted. Back in the real world, the heretic asks him, well? And Damien gets up saying, Jin showed me my future. It's exactly what I pictured. It's exactly why I can't have this. 
The heretic raises his staff, shouting, You fool! Your genie will never be free now! But as the staff comes down, Damien takes both of his fists, cracking them into the heretic's mask, stating, I will find a way without you! As Damien crawls on top, the heretic asks, Do you think brute force will win this, brother? Suddenly, Damien screams in pain as another heretic pulls the blade out of Damien's back, and he says, We could have had! But at that moment, there's an explosion with a giant fireball slamming into the heretic's back, throwing him off. Roundhouse, along with the others, call out, Hey! You're welcome! And you may have dropped this. Roundhouse begins to hand Jin to Damien. Heretic gets up creating more copies of himself, stating, You have no idea what you're doing! Looks like you're going to die together, Teen Titans! Kid Flash runs in hitting, asking, Uh, who's this? And why does he have Damien's face? Damien begins to explain, but he stops himself, stating, Ah! We don't have time! Just take him down! Crush cracks her knuckles, stating, It feels good to be myself again. And beside that, I always wanted a chance to beat your assassin. Heretic gets up, stating, I have had enough! And he casts a spell, freezing everyone in place. He shouts, I have built an empire, and my own brother spat in my face. I will just have to harness your collective power and make it my own. As he prepares the spell, the ice around Crush begins to crack, and suddenly she breaks free, shattering the ice prison. She lunges forward, punching the heretic down, shouting, Bring her back! And Heretic tells her, It is impossible! How did you? Suddenly the roof begins to give, and Red Arrow tells everyone, We gotta leave and forget Heretic! Damien shouts, We can't leave him! He's the only one who knows how to free Jin! But before Damien can grab a hold, a hole opens up beneath Heretic with him falling through! A short while later, outside of the lair, Roundhouse asks if they think he's really gone, and Crush reaches into her jacket stating that she doesn't know. But she did manage to swipe a stupid book. Roundhouse begins to state that he knows that he messed up, so before they throw him into the sun, can they just let him say... Damien stops him, stating that he doesn't have to apologize. They all made mistakes that led them here. They could have worked together better, and they will, starting now. The book that Crush has is the key to bringing back Jin. So Crush asks, what's the plan? And Damien tells her that they're going to take the fight to the devil himself and end Elias once and for all. In Korok, the Teen Titans fight off a swarm of creatures with Damien telling everyone to stay sharp. They came here to free Jin. She's currently locked in the ring after all the stupidity of Roundhouse trying to betray them. Red Arrow kicks one of the creatures asking if they're sure that this is the only way, and Damien subdues a creature telling her that what matters right now is that they have something that makes Elias a vulnerable. Just up ahead, they will use the Book of the Damned to end all of this once and for all. And Crush says, yeah. Once we make that D-bag spring Jin from her jail, Elias gets two tickets to a beatdown. Once everything is set, Red Arrow says, okay, perfect. Once we place the Cup of Sorrows in the middle, we will need a blood offering. Roundhouse calls out that he would like to mention that he cannot stand the sight of blood. But just then, there's an explosion and a voice that says, Ah, Teen Titans, at last we meet! As you can see, I've been expecting you. As the doors open up without Red Hood performing the ritual, Elias stands inside of a casino filled with demons and he smiles. And continuing to not say a word, he throws a lightning bolt at the team, knocking them back, and then he snaps his fingers. Jin's ring flies out of Damien's pouch, and Elias says that he would like to thank them for bringing him exactly what he was missing, his old pet. It's good to see you again, finally back where you belong. As Crush helps Damien up, Damien tells Red Arrow to hurry and get on that spell. Everyone else, kick his ass! Elias begins to laugh as he snaps his fingers again, telling them, We outnumber you! Hardly a fair fight! How about we even the odds a bit? Soon, all of the demons in the casino turn their attention towards our heroes, and they begin to attack. Red Arrow kneels down to go through the Book of the Damned, telling Kid Flash that she is a bit new to the whole magic thing. He's gonna have to keep an eye on things so that she doesn't turn them into unicorns or some other Harry Potter nonsense. Kid Flash runs circles around her, telling her that she can take all the time that she needs. As Red Arrow prepares the spell, Elias says that he'd love to catch up with them. But now that he has all of the rings, it's time to summon all of his brothers and sisters and kick down the gates of heaven and take what belonged to them. Elias grows in size as the demons are absorbed into him, and then he punches down on Crush, burying her into the ground. 
Kid Flash yells to Red Arrow that it's now or never, and as Red Arrow finishes the final chance, she says that that's it. The spell has been cast. Elias should work for them now. Elias stomps down as he shrinks, stating, Well, that was a powerful spell, and it would have worked. But with the tenth and final ring, nothing can stop me. It's time for the devil to be in charge. All that is missing is the Stone of Souls, and with that, suddenly Elias disappears and reappears inside of Purgatory, telling Jin, it's nice to see you again. Jin attacks, telling him, you can go to hell! And Elias dodges, stating, oh, I've been there! And while it's lovely this time of year, what I seek is not there. A hand lunges out, grabbing Jin by the neck, stating, you know where the Stone of Souls is. Where is it? Jin struggles, telling him that he knows the rules. Every Jin is allowed to disobey one command, even from him. And Elias says, yes, but I'm not going to force you. If you don't tell me, then your friends will die. And it will only get worse from there. Back in the real world, Elias returns with Jin and Jin tells them, you all shouldn't have come here. Crush gets ready to attack, but before she can, Elias begins choking everyone with his magic, telling her, You're wasting my time! Give me the stone! Jin prepares her spell, telling him, I cannot allow all of you to die because of me. And as she finishes, a small explosion goes off, and a voice from inside the smoke says, Yo, this is totally not cool! I was talking with my cousin, who's probably freaking out right now. As the young man stands there, Elias asks, Who is this child? And the boy says, My name is Jaquim Thunder. And who are you supposed to be? Elias looks at Jin, telling him, I said no games! But Jin says, Do you not recognize your magical incantation? Elias pauses, turning back, stating, My, my, you gave the Stone of Sorrow to use. Of course you hid it in some form of the fifth dimension. All this power in the hands of a child. Jaquim clicks a pen, telling him, I was letting you get away with saying child once, but twice? Time to bring the thunder, bro! So not cool. As Jakim summons Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt gets ready to attack and then stops. Elias laughs. It's been so long, little brother. And Jakim asks, what's wrong? Are you scared? Why? Elias punches Thunderbolt before transforming into his devil form, stating, because I am Elias, the first of my kind made by the very hand of our great father above. Some call me Jin, others call me the devil, and Thunderbolt knows when his time grows too close. Elias begins to absorb Thunderbolt, with Jaquim yelling, I'm not going down without a fight! And Elias turns back telling him, You wish. He fires a blast at Jaquim, but Kid Flash runs through grabbing him, asking him if he's okay. And Jaquim tells him, Yo, thanks for the safe. Kid Flash looks back telling him, you can thank me if we survive whatever this is. Elias extracts the stone from within Thunderbolt, telling him, Finally, the last piece. It is time to strike with the speed of a serpent and claim my rightful place on my father's throne in the heaven above, right after I tie up some loose ends. Jin then uses all of her power, telling Elias that he has destroyed many things, but her friends won't be one of them. As the Teen Titans are pulled away, everyone calls out for her to wait, but Jin says, please, do not try to save me again. Elias calls Jin back into her ring, telling her that he promises her that that won't happen. I need you when I attack the gate of heaven. Seconds later, back in Mercy Hall, there's a flash of purple light, and Jakim asks, so where exactly are we now? And Roundhouse says that this is their humble headquarters abode. Jakim tells them, cool, right, who are you? And Damien tells him that they are the Teen Titans, and he is Jakeem Thunder, Master of Thunderbolt. Jakeem tells him, I don't really like the word master. How about we just say that we work together, or at least we did. Anyway, what the heck happened back there? Red Arrow says that it was a poorly planned mission to save a teammate, which they executed even worse than intended. Damien tells her that all she had to do was read the spell quicker, but as they begin to argue, Roundhouse duct tapes his suit back together and creates a blinding light telling everyone to listen up. Them fighting is not going to save Jin. Damien says that there is one way. If she's in purgatory, then they can go to hell and sneak in through the back door to save her. Shakim asks, and how exactly are we going to hell? Damien tells him, we're gonna have to die. Jakim asks him, Did you just say we have to die? Because it sounded like you said we have to die. I want my genie back, but dying is not one of the things I want to do. Damien tells him, Good, because you aren't coming with us. Without powers, you're a liability. Besides, we need someone to monitor our bodies and keep them safe. As Damien opens up a hidden safe, 
Crush then asks, how is them going to hell going to do anything? Damien says, Hell has a back door to purgatory. Jin's ring has her trapped in purgatory. Red Arrow then asks, how do you know this? And Damien tells it because of the Book of the Damned. He read it cover to cover. Just then a small tray appears with six vials and Damien goes on to explain that each of these contains a compound designed to kill each of them. But first they will put themselves into a state of paralysis before eventually drowning their lungs with their own fluids. Jaquim will administer the antidote before they die for good. Everyone goes quiet and stares, and Damien asks, What? I assume you all have a plan to stop me if I go rogue, right? Either way, we don't have time. Once we're down, we have 30 minutes. After that, Jakeem will hit us with the antidote, and we'll be back. As Damien begins to take his vial, he then asks, So who's with me? Crush looks at hers and says, Ah, oh, what the hell? Let's get our girl back. Just as everyone takes their vials, they all start to pass out one by one. And a few moments later, Roundhouse slowly wakes up asking, Did it work? Are we dead? And Roundhouse tells him to look around. Does this place look like hell? As everyone gets up, they walk towards the giant gate with Kid Flash stating that it seems a little too easy. No guards, no nothing. Meanwhile, up at the gates of hell, Elias tells the gatekeeper that there must be a misunderstanding. Gatekeeper tells him that his name is Peter. And Elias tells him, right. Okay, so Peter, it's been a few millennia. I didn't recognize you. Peter asks as they know each other and Elias says, we were brothers before, you know, I fell. Peter's eyes widen and Elias says, now you remember. So as I was saying, there seems to be a misunderstanding. I wasn't asking for your permission. As angels begin to fly down, Peter says, oh, you're going to regret this. And Elias holds up his rings telling him, actually, I was going to say the same thing. Back down below, Damien guides the team through a maze stating that they're almost there. This is the Labyrinth of Regret. On the other side is the River Styx, but if they hurry, Kid Flash stops him going, whoa, 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 whoa. How do you know your way around hell so easily? You didn't learn all of this from a book. There's something else going on. Damien pauses for a moment and then says that he died at the hands of the heretic. And this is where he was sent when he was dead. He went to hell. Kid Flash stops there and he just says, okay, I'm just going to say I'm so sorry. Just then everyone's bodies begin to fade and Damien yells, listen closely. The labyrinth shows us our deepest regrets and fears. Stand fast. None of it is real. We can't. Before they could finish, everyone is taken away and Raz al Ghul steps forward stating, at long last, the prodigal grandson returns. Do you think yourself a hero? Who are you trying to convince yourself? Damien charges in shouting, do not claim to know me. You know nothing, grandfather. Raz swings and Damien jumps over telling him, I have found my own way, a better way, one better than my father and one better than my grandfather. Raz asks if he's speaking of the prison, half measures, compromises. You seek to change things, but you lack commitment to do what you must do. Raz then snatches Damien by the face, pulling him in close, telling him, this is why your plans fail. You are better than Wayne, better than Talia, but do you have what it takes to be better than me, grandson? As Raz lets go, Damien stands up. You're not real. You're just my fears and my own doubts. I'm done fighting who I really am. As Raz rushes in, his sword swings through Damien without a scratch. Damien begins running, telling himself that nothing here is real. Find the light if it's still. While everything is chasing him, Damien sees a blue lantern and he quickly grabs it, vanquishing the shades that are following him. Damien then takes that lantern, running back, yelling to everyone that they need to remember. What they are seeing isn't real. Fight! It's time to fight or die! As everyone slowly returns, all they say is that what they saw was so real, and Damien tells them that they don't have time. Maybe minutes. Stay close. After a bit of walking, Roundhouse looks up, saying to please tell him that whatever they have to do next does not involve going through that giant, scary-looking door. Damien holds up the lantern, telling them, straight through here is purgatory. Straight through here, too. But as the door opens up, Jin shouts, I told you not to come! Before they could argue, there's a loud, prolonged beep. Roundhouse then asks if anyone else heard that, and Jin tells them, because we're already out of time. You're dead. Crush begins to yell, no, I can fight him. And Jin asks, how? Elias has my ring. He's more powerful than ever before. There is no stopping him. And Damien tells her, no, you've beaten him before. Has any Jin ever beaten Elias before? So what you're saying is that you can't take him down for good. Jin sighs, telling him, it's because I'm trapped here, a slave to his commands. And Crush shouts, Elias is a liar, a con, a fake god. Damien asks, what is the power that's been within you this whole time? 
Jin tells him that it's impossible. She can't do it, but Damien asks, have you even tried? Leave your ring. Jin asks, without being commanded? And Crush says, you'd never have to be a slave to anyone again. Stop complaining and get the hell out of here. Jin begins to gather her strength, telling them, you're right. And out in the real world, Jakim says, I could really use Thunderbolt right about now. Suddenly he screams in pain as magic flows through him and Jin rips herself out of purgatory. With Jakim asking, what, what just happened? Jin tells him that it seems that the magic has always been inside of both of them. As everyone gets back up, Crush says they don't have time for the Kumbaya crap. They've got people to see and asses to kick. Roundhouse runs over to Jin, telling her that he is just so, so sorry. He didn't mean for any of this to happen. He was only trying to do what he thought was right. He'll spend the rest of his life trying to make it up to her if she lets him. She smiles and tells him that she knows. And he has her forgiveness, but right now, they have to focus on the task at hand. So a short while later, standing outside of Heaven's Gate, Roundhouse looks at the scattered angel bodies and he says, Oh boy, I think we're a little late. Jin flies up stating that if Elias is already in, then it is too late. And Crush says, yeah, we've heard that before, but we got you. Inside, Elias sits on the throne, stating that the Jin are the chosen ones and not the angels. So they finally have come home. And is their father here to greet them? No, that's because their father has not been here for a while, has he? What was your name again, brother? It's been a while. The angel on the ground tells him that his name is Gabriel. And Elias tells him, that's right. Anyway, Gabriel, tell me where the big man is or those pretty wings are about to be ripped off. Gabriel begins to tell him that he doesn't know, but Elias rips his wings off, telling him, let's try that one again. But at that moment, Jin shoots in, punching him, asking, why don't you stop picking on an angel? Crush asks, why don't you get a load of us instead? Elias begins to laugh, telling him, Haha, I really like your mucks. That's when Jin calls out to the others, telling them that they've been lied to from the beginning of time. She escaped her ring and they can too. Elias bursts out laughing. Do you really think that they can hear you? I am their god. They kneel to me just as you will. Jin flies in, telling him, it is time for you to die. And Elias lunges forward, stabbing into her, telling her, not while I wield Moses' staff, I won't be dying. As Jin falls to the ground, Kid Flash runs in and Elias says, Do you think they go faster than a guard? Please! Elias chokes Kid Flash and he manages to state that for a genie, You don't seem to know much about magic, Elias! The first step is misdirection. As Red Arrow shoots Elias in the back, Crush punches him, telling him, After that comes sleight of hand! While everyone else joins in on the fight, Elias snaps his finger, stating, That is enough! Show's over! But at that moment, Jin's voice tells him, and it's time for the big reveal. Ta-da! She jumps down, stabbing Moses' staff into Elias as he screams in pain. And Elias asks, how? And Jin scoffs, telling him it was all an illusion. He was so blinded by rage that what he stabbed wasn't the real her. Then again, he never really saw her, did he? Or what she was capable of. As Jin takes all of the Jin rings from Elias, the other Jin all begin to kneel before her. She tells them no. I am not like them. Rise, my brothers, rise! Using Moses' staff, Jin breaks the rings of Elias' influence, and slowly the Jin begin to return to normal. They all bow and thank her, and then they ask, what are they to do with Elias? Now that this is all over, Jin says they will try to teach him what he needs to do in order to atone. And if he listens, maybe someday. As Elias is trapped inside of his ring, Jin finishes by stating that he will be free, like all of them. Jin looks at Jakim, telling him that there's one more thing, and with a loud thunder, Krakoom! Thunderbolt appears yelling, I'm back! Jakim laughs, telling him that he's so glad to see him. They have a lot of catching up to do. And Jin says yes. They both need answers, and the three of them will find them together. Damien asks her, Jin, are you leaving the Teen Titans? She casts a spell and teleports everyone away, stating that she is free for the first time ever. But none of them are truly free from this. Everyone looks around at the cell and the prison beneath Mercy Hall. The prison that Damien created, that Red Arrow knew about. And Jin tells Damien that he used her. Damien tries to explain that what they did wasn't wrong. What they did wasn't too far. They didn't go far enough. And Jakim asks, is that what you think justice is? Crush asks Jin if she's really going. What about the Teen Titans? And Jin says that she has love for them all. All of them. 
But when she was under Elias's control, the magic that she was using on their prisoners was undone. She shall never force anyone to do anything against their will again. Her part in this, in the Teen Titans, it's over. Crush begins to run after her, begging her not to go. And as everyone hugs her, Jin tells them all that she'll miss them. But she cannot squander this freedom that she has been given. What comes next for the Teen Titans is up to them. Whatever they decide, she hopes to set them free. One by one, the team leave the cell and they leave Damien all by himself. As the sun sets on Gotham, the sound of punches and kicks can be heard from a small warehouse on the shores of the city. But with each hit that finds its mark, Damien thinks to himself that Batman was right. Well, partly. Fear is his biggest weapon, believing it's enough to keep criminals in the line. It is a powerful weapon, but not when it is only used halfway. As one of the thugs is knocked across the room, Damien pauses, asking, Why are you here? And the voice tells him that first, he is welcome, and second, it's because he is worried. Superboy floats up above, and Damien says that he should really be focusing on what's happening in the 31st century, not on him. He's busy with the Legion of Superheroes right now. But before Damien could attack him again, Superboy rounds up all the thugs, telling him, I'm worried about your future. The records for this era are Swiss cheese, rumors, glimpses, but they're all making me anxious. After Damien finishes tying everyone up, Superboy pulls him aside, telling him, I'm worried, like, really worried. Is everything okay, Damien? Damien looks Superboy in the eyes and then turns, telling him, I'm fine. I am not afraid of the future or the past. Meanwhile, over at Mercy Hall, Red Era finishes examining some of the dirt left behind by the killer in Brother Blood's lair, stating that it would seem that the person who killed Brother Blood wanted to be caught. When Kid Flash questions how she knew that, Red Arrow tells him that there's been some evidence left behind. And after calling everyone to Mercy Hall, Roundhouse says that this just seems personal. Crush says, Personally, I'm glad that Brother Blood never got the chance. I just wish that I was the one who punched his ticket. Kid Flash tells her that actually, based on the evidence, it was them. And Red Arrow specifies that it seems that it was Robin. Everyone stands in silence for a moment. The leader that they had formerly, the one that they kicked out. And Roundhouse says, no, that's not Robin. He wouldn't. But speaking of potential actions from Damien, it did catch the eye of the world's greatest detective and his father. Batman quickly picks up a clue at Wayne Manor and quietly says, Damien, what are you planning, son? Later that night at the docks in New York, Damien sits atop of another warehouse, watching a group of men getting off a ship, preparing to make a trade. He tells himself that this city will become one where the crime has consequences, where criminals will live in fear, not the people. A world without crime, no more hiding. No more hiding from who I am or what needs to be done. Damien watches KG Beast in the middle of a deal stating that this man gave Nightwing amnesia from a near fatal headshot, which we covered in our Batman storyline in which Nightwing was shot in the head. In return, Batman broke KG's back, and yet here he stands, alive. But tonight, that ends. Damien begins to get himself in position, but as he draws his sword, a voice says for him to stop. He turns back, and Damien sees the rest of the Teen Titans, and Red Arrow tells him that it's over. He crossed the line. Murder isn't the answer. She learned that the hard way. But Damien stops them. It wasn't murder. It was a message. Fear is the message. Until they fear what can be done to them, they'll never stop. None of it stops until... But before Damien could finish, Roundhouse punches him, yelling, You monster! All I wanted was to be a hero, a Teen Titan, and you, you corrupted it! You ruined it! You ruined everything! As everyone else joins into the attack, Damien dodges, telling them all, I ruined nothing. I only offer the truth. He jumps down into the alleyway, and KG Beast sees him and begins to open fire. All good. Now I hurt all of Bat's boys. Damien pulls out his sword, slashing into KG Beast's chest, telling him, Your hurting days are over! But while Damien is engaging him, the rest of the Teen Titans quickly jump in to intervene. However, while fighting KG Beast, Damien manages to outmaneuver his team and he makes one slice. As Damien's sword cuts through KG Beast's machine gun arm, he tells everyone, This isn't over until they all fear me! Damien then grabs the fallen gun, pointing it at KG Beast, with KG Beast telling him, You aren't going for justice. You're doing this for your bat comrade. Damien tells him, I'm doing this for 
But before he could pull the trigger, Kid Flash runs in, grabbing KGBs, telling him, You're not doing anything! Damien yells for Kid Flash, You cannot run from this! You cannot run from me! But at that moment, Crush punches Damien in the back of the head, telling him, We ain't running! As Red Arrow attacks, Damien leaps out of the way, telling them, What are you doing?! And Roundhouse tells him that he needs help. They all need help, to be honest. Damien charges in, headbutting Roundhouse, telling him, I need you to see the truth! As the fight goes on, Damien seems to be winning, with Red Arrow managing to get one good crack in and Crush grabbing him, telling him, It's time to run the bulls. As Roundhouse picks himself back up, he tells Damien, I'm sorry for this. And then he runs straight into him, launching him into the wall. Damien's confused, disoriented, and he begins to cough. I see how it is. I have my answer. You're not ready. He throws a flash bomb to the ground, and as Red Arrow yells for him not to get away, they quickly realize it is too late and Robin has left. Meanwhile, over at the remains of Janus Cosmetics, the prisoners that were once held by Damien gather. Gizmo, Mammoth, Swerve, Joystick, Black Mask all sit in a room, and Joystick says that this is personal. Why don't they just do this themselves? And Gizmo tells him that this job isn't really any of their expertise, and Black Mask adds that that's true. They want the job done right. So who better to kill the Teen Titans than Deathstroke? Back in the city, the team breaks off into pairs looking for Damien, but when they come up with nothing, they all begin to head back to Mercy Hall. Except when they get back, they find Damien standing outside. Damien tries to explain what he was doing, giving his motives, that he just wanted them all to fear him. But Red Arrow, Crush, and Roundhouse all take their turns hitting Robin, and in the end, Kid Flash tells him that they're here to help him. And that help starts with bringing him in. As Damien gets back up, a voice calls out, telling them all, It's over! Batman looms over them, telling them, The Teen Titans are finished! But then his gaze turns to Damien and he tells him, You're the one who killed Brother Blood. And you would have killed KG Beast if your teammates hadn't stopped you. It started with holding criminals against their will, wiping their minds, and all of them followed blindly. Damien tells him that they were doing what he was taught to do, that which Batman fails to do himself. The criminals, they no longer fear you, father. They fear the Teen Titans now. Batman looks at the team and sees their obvious unease with Damien's recent decisions, but then the Red Arrow steps forward and tells him that the only ones who fear him is them. They've gone too far. She's gone too far. She killed Deathstroke. There's no running from this, no running from the truth. The Teen Titans, they're finished. Damien scoffs as he turns his back. You're all just like him. You're all too afraid. Batman stands in Damien's way. You are right. I am afraid. Afraid of losing. But before he could finish, the explosion goes off, knocking everyone back. And on top of the building, Deathstroke smiles. Now the fun begins. He jumps down, pulling Damien's cape from the rubble, telling him, You can run all you want, but there's no running for me. Red Arrow pulls us up out of the debris, asking, Deathstroke, how are you alive? Where is everyone? Where's Kid Flash? As Kid Flash gets up, Red Arrow runs over, hugging him, telling him, Thank... Wait, how is Deathstroke alive? Crush asks, Right, how can we kill him again? Red Arrow stops her, telling her, No, that's Robin's way. The Teen Titans don't kill. And then Batman tells them, Correct, because there's no Teen Titans. Go home. I'm gonna handle Deathstroke. A few streets over, Damien runs into an abandoned warehouse, yelling, Show yourself! It's the two of us! Deathstroke leaps out of the shadows with his swords, telling them, It's just us. So it's time to finish things, boy. As Deathstroke swings, Damien dodges, but is kicked in the back onto a set of stairs. Damien catches himself as a hidden blade pops out of his boot, stating, Red Arrow thought she killed you, but I'm gonna make sure you stay dead this time. Damien launches himself back, digging the blade into Deathstroke's stomach, kicking him out the window and into the alleyway. He laughs, telling him, You were always my favorite, Robin, because you weren't afraid of getting your hands dirty. As Damien jumps down, Deathstroke quickly gets up, punching into Damien over and over again, knocking him to the ground. He then pulls out his sword, telling him, You've had a good run, but we both know how it always ends for Robins. But before he could bring that sword down, a voice calls out to him and Kid Flash tells him, You may have won the first round, but how about we go round two, Deathstroke? Crush crashes into the ground, narrowly missing Deathstroke, and Damien yells for them all to fall back. Leave them. This fight is not for the weak. Crush gets back up, telling him, a simple thanks for saving my ass wouldn't hurt. Damien runs back fighting Deathstroke and Red Arrow yells that they have a chance to fix this. And it starts by bringing them both in. With Deathstroke's attention focused on Damien, Crush runs in tackling into him. But as she gets ready to finish things, Deathstroke grabs the dumpster that he was thrown into, bashing Crush with it. Deathstroke then gets up charging into Red Arrow telling her, It's time we end this game. And as he does, Damien tells him, I couldn't agree more. And he slashes into Deathstroke's back with his own sword. 
Damien swings again, making cut after cut, telling him, Tonight you die! We can put you away and it'll end nothing. You'll break free and kill again and again and again. Damien jumps up to land the finishing blow, but Red Arrow jumps in to block it with her bow, telling him, No! But the force from the sword pushes through, cutting into Red Arrow's shoulder. Kid Flash quickly runs through grabbing her, but Red Arrow tells him that she's fine. Deathstroke and Crush scoffs, telling them, Great! He already vanished! Roundhouse then says that now they have blood on their hands and a target on their backs. Thanks to you, Robin! Damien stands there with a bloody sword, but before he could speak, Batman jumps down telling him, I don't know why this is happening, but it needs to stop. This isn't you. Put the blade down before this goes too far. Damien looks at Batman, thinking back to the times with Alfred. He begins to walk forward, walking the same steps he did when he went to Alfred. And as he gets close, he punches Batman in the mouth. He keeps swinging, but as Batman deflects the attacks, he tells him, Please, it's time to come home, Damien. Damien breaks through the defenses, asking him, Home? What home? Wayne Manor? It's a coffin! There's nothing in that tomb that'll change my mind! If you just open up your eyes, you would see that there's nothing for you either. There will not be another lecture in those empty halls. I will not stop! This is the only logical conclusion to the path that I set on so many years ago. We've sent criminals to these jails and asylums to do what? To get the same results over and over! Why can't you see that? Why aren't you fighting back? Why?! Because... I love you. And you're right, I have failed. I failed to you. Damien thinks back to Alfred's final moments and how he watched Bane end his life. Everything led to this. Damien grabs the Robin badge from his costume, ripping it off in one hard pull. He hands the badge to Batman and he tells him, You'll never truly see me as long as I remain in the shadows. And now, now I am finally free. It's been some time without Damien leading the Teen Titans, but that hasn't stopped the remaining members from cleaning up the mistakes they all contributed to. All of the brainwashed villains regained their memories and are back on the streets, so it's time to put them away for good. But it also helps when you have a future Superboy making sure things are done the right way. As the team closes in on Mammoth, Crush makes it very clear that they do not need Jonathan's help. And Jonathan flies in, punching Mammoth, telling her that so long as they're chasing down leads to Damien, he's going to be there. He wants to know what happened to his friend. Mammoth groans, attacking, stating that they are out of control. The only thing dirty around here is them. And it's about time they heard from his sister. Shimmer powers herself up, stating that they had no right to do that thing where they wiped their minds and made them think there was someone else. And Crush quickly cracks Shimmer, telling her that that thing is a person, a friend, and you're gonna say you're sorry! But before Crush could swing again, Jonathan tells her that it's over. If these two were really dealing in human trafficking, then they need to take care of that first. Across the warehouse, Jonathan sees a vault door and he rips it open, but what he sees shocks even him. Inside the sealed vault is nothing. Nothing but a note addressed to Jonathan. As he picks it up, he reads it and everyone asks, what did it say? Was it from Damien? John burns the note with his heat vision and he picks up Mammoth and Shimmer and states that he will take care of these two. They should all. But Red Arrow stops him, asking, what did Damien's note say? Superboy! And as he flies off, he says that they all should have known all along. They are never finding Damien. Later, the team steps back to take a much needed break and without Mercy Hall, everyone has to find a way to live again. With nowhere else to really even go, Crush bunks up with Roundhouse at Mama Woo's. The two play video games, but when Roundhouse finds himself on a losing streak, Crush asks what's wrong. He sighs and he says that it's been fun now that they're all back together and that they're doing the right thing. But they aren't really friends, are they? Not after what he did, not after his betrayal. Everything that happened with Jin, it was his fault. And they all cared about her and he ruined that. Crush tells him that she isn't really good with this whole emotions thing. But she can see that he made a mistake and that he's trying to make up for it. As for Jin, well, Jin made her own decision. And they have to respect that. Unlike them, Jin was actually an adult. Well, sort of anyway. All they can do now is hope that she is happy, wherever she is. Meanwhile, over at the fair, Red Arrow says that he's gotta be kidding. And Kid Flash says, why not? It's fun. Also, I really want the giant bear. But if you're too afraid that you're not as good with a BB gun as a bow, she snatches the airsoft gun and proceeds to knock down every target. And as the two leave, Kid Flash carries his new giant panda plush. Red Arrow asks, So this is what teens do? Is this what they would call a date? 
Kid Flash nervously laughs it off. Uh, yeah, kind of. Usually you ask someone out to make it official, and Red Arrow laughs, so? Make it official. Kid Flash begins to ask if she would like to go out with him, and as he opens up his eyes, he finds himself alone. He looks around asking if that's a no, and a Red Arrow whizzes by, followed by several more. But before Kid Flash could ask what's going on, one of the arrows manages to strike him from behind, and then he gets cracked in the head with a bow. A voice through Red Arrow says, Ah, young love! Sorry to say, you'll never know her answer, but don't worry, I have plans for you and Red Arrow. A hand reaches out, touching Kid Flash, and he blinks and his eyes turn red, and a voice continues to state, These idiots sent Deathstroke after you, but he took the money and ran. From what I've seen, the only way to tear apart the Teen Titans is with the Teen Titans! And as Joystick finishes, he begins to laugh as Red Arrow and Kid Flash fall in line behind him. A short while later, back in New York, Crush and Roundhouse sneak into a building looking for the others when they see Red Arrow and Kid Flash snarling at them. Before Crush could react, Kid Flash begins running, hitting her, and Joystick asks if she knows what Kid Flash really thinks of her. She's strong but unstable and it makes her weak. And Roundhouse? Well, Red Arrow has some pretty strong feelings about him. She felt that he wasn't ready for any of this. Red Arrow fires an electric arrow, shocking Roundhouse, but as his suit fails, she then springs a net, capturing him, and Joystick says, And I gotta say, I agree. Joystick runs in, kicking Crush in the stomach, asking, You thought it was a joke? This is my castle! I own this building now, and soon, I'll be king. Crush starts to pick herself back up, and she looks at Red Arrow, stating that she knows that this isn't her. We've stopped Joystick before! Red Arrow pulls back on her bow, points the arrow at Crush's head, and Crush stops. Please! The arrow is really shooting by Crush's head and into Kid Flash, sending a massive shockwave throughout the entire building. As he falls, Joystick scratches his head. Wow, I actually felt that. And Red Arrow tells everyone to be ready. She's switching to explosive arrows. She begins to fire, but as the arrows miss Kid Flash, Joystick says that she should be careful. You had your shot and you missed. Red Arrow says that he should know her by now. She doesn't miss. Soon the arrows explode, taking out the support beams and the entire building begins to come crashing down. As the dust settles, Red Arrow quickly crawls out of the debris over to see Kid Flash and check on him. And she notices that his heart isn't beating. In a panic, she screams out, what do we do? And Kid Flash begins to cough, stating that they can't hear his heartbeat because he breathes so fast. It also beats extra fast when she's... But before he could finish, she pulls him in by the costume, giving him a kiss. Crush and Roundhouse laugh and then point. Finally! They should probably... Yeah. Leaving the two lovebirds behind, Crush and Roundhouse look through the building and find another vault. Crush tears the door off to find an empty room for another note, but this one is addressed Titans. As the sun comes up, the police come to take Joystick away, and Crush asks, What now? Every criminal that has had its mind wipe has been brought to justice. And Roundhouse asks, Did we really fix things? Without Damien, how can we really know that this is all over? What's with the random cryptic numbers in that piece of paper? Red Arrow tells him that they aren't random. They're coordinates. One last location from Damien Wayne. He may have given up on being a titan, but he's not given up on toying with them. Roundhouse asks if she thinks that he's here. And Red Arrow says there's only one way to find out, so the Teen Titans follow the last coordinates left by their leader, Robin. What they find isn't Damien Robin, but Nightwing. Roundhouse asks if it's really him, and Nightwing gives a normal Nightwing Dick Grayson smirk as he says, Looks like we both got a note from Damien. The League didn't approve of you guys, the Titans that is. You were forced to shut down, but Damien had an idea, a suggestion, for both of us. As for goodbyes, well, this actually gives him some hope. Red Arrow says, hope for who? And Nightwing shrugs, maybe Damien, but definitely the Teen Titans. As for this, maybe we can work together? I can certainly offer you guys a home, and there's a chance that we can make things right for you, but only if you guys want it. I'm not Damien. I'm not gonna force you to do anything. And if you don't want to, then I simply will wish you the best. So how about it? The Teen Titans all look at each other, and they smile as they look back at Nightwing. And Nightwing motions back, revealing the rest of the Titans, stating, All right, Teen Titans, I'd like to welcome you all to Titans Tower.
And there you have it, all of Teen Titans Rebirth. Now the next storyline is Robin, and I'll link you that playlist down below because it goes into Robin and then Shadow War, and then you're caught up to the current situation with Dark Crisis. But yeah, that's everything going on right now in the world of Teen Titans. I hope you guys enjoy this, and I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.